Chapter 15 Dangerous Beauty In the 1960s, while studying the volcanic history of Yellowstone National Park, Bob Christensen of the United States Geological Survey became puzzled about something that oddly had not troubled anyone before. He couldn't find the park's volcano. It had been known for a long time that Yellowstone was volcanic in nature. That's what accounted for all its geysers and other steamy features. And the one thing about volcanoes is that they are generally pretty conspicuous. But Christensen couldn't find the Yellowstone volcano anywhere. In particular, what he couldn't find was a structure known as a caldera. Most of us, when we think of volcanoes, think of the classic cone shape of a Fuji or a Kilimanjaro, which is created when erupting magma accumulates in a symmetrical mound. These can form remarkably quickly. In 1943, at Paricutin in Mexico, a farmer was startled to see smoke rising from a patch on his land. In one week, he was the bemused owner of a cone 152 meters high. Within two years, it had topped out at almost 430 meters and was more than 800 meters across. Altogether, there are some 10,000 of these intrusively visible volcanoes on Earth, all but a few hundred of them extinct. But there is a second, less celebrated type of volcano that doesn't involve mountain building. These are volcanoes so explosive that they burst open in a single mighty rupture, leaving behind a vast subsided pit, the caldera, from a Latin word for cauldron. Yellowstone obviously was of this second type, but Christensen couldn't find the caldera anywhere. By coincidence, just at this time, NASA decided to test some new high-altitude cameras by taking photographs of Yellowstone, copies of which a thoughtful official passed on to the park authorities on the assumption that they might make a nice display for one of the visitor centers. As soon as Christensen saw the photos, he realized why he had failed to spot the caldera. Virtually the whole park, 9,000 square kilometers, was caldera. The explosion had left a crater nearly 65 kilometers across, much too huge to be perceived from anywhere at ground level. At some time in the past, Yellowstone must have blown up with a violence far beyond the scale of anything known to humans. Yellowstone, it turns out, is a super volcano. It sits on top of an enormous hot spot, a reservoir of molten rock that begins at least 200 kilometers down in the earth and rises to near the surface, forming what is known as a super plume. The heat from the hot spot is what powers all of Yellowstone's vents, geysers, hot springs, and popping mud pots. Beneath the surface is a magma chamber that is about 72 kilometers across, roughly the same dimensions as the park, and about 13 kilometers thick at its thickest point. Imagine a pile of TNT about the size of an English county and reaching 13 kilometers into the sky to about the height of the highest cirrus clouds, and you have some idea of what visitors to Yellowstone are shuffling around on top of. The pressure that such a pool of magma exerts on the crust above has lifted Yellowstone and its surrounding territory about half a kilometer higher than they would otherwise be. If it blew, the cataclysm is pretty well beyond imagining. According to Professor Bill McGuire of University College London, you wouldn't be able to get within a thousand kilometers of it while it was erupting. The consequences that followed would be even worse. Superplumes of the type on which Yellowstone sits are rather like martini glasses, thin on the way up, but spreading out as they near the surface to create vast bowls of unstable magma. Some of these bowls can be up to 1,900 kilometers across. According to current theories, they don't always erupt explosively, but sometimes burst forth in a vast continuous outpouring, a flood of molten rock, as happened with the Deccan Traps in India 65 million years ago. These covered an area of over 500,000 square kilometers and probably contributed to the demise of the dinosaurs. They certainly didn't help. 
with their noxious outpourings of gases. Superplumes may also be responsible for the rifts that cause continents to break up. Such plumes are not all that rare. There are about 30 active ones on the Earth at the moment, and they are responsible for many of the world's best-known islands and island chains. Iceland, Hawaii, the Azores, Canaries, and Galapagos archipelagos, Little Pitcairn in the middle of the South Pacific, and many others. But apart from Yellowstone, they are all oceanic. No one has the faintest idea how or why Yellowstone's ended up beneath the continental plate. Only two things are certain, that the crust at Yellowstone is thin, and that the world beneath it is hot. But whether the crust is thin because of the hot spot, or whether the hot spot is there because the crust is thin, is a matter of heated, as it were, debate. The continental nature of the crust makes a huge difference to its eruptions, whereas the other supervolcanoes tend to bubble away steadily and in a comparatively benign fashion, Yellowstone blows explosively. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, you want to stand well back. Since its first known eruption 16.5 million years ago, it has blown up about a hundred times. But the most recent three eruptions are the ones that get written about. The last eruption was a thousand times as big as that of Mount St. Helens. The one before that was 280 times as big. And the one before that was so big nobody knows exactly how big it was. It was at least 2,500 times as big as St. Helens, but perhaps 8,000 times as monstrous. We have absolutely nothing to compare it to. The biggest blast in recent times was that of Krakatau in Indonesia in August 1883, which made a bang that reverberated around the world for nine days and made water slosh as far away as the English Channel. But if you imagine the volume of ejected material from Krakatau as being about the size of a golf ball, then that from the biggest of the Yellowstone blasts would be the size of a sphere you could just about hide behind. On this scale, the Mount St. Helens eruption would be no more than a pea. The Yellowstone eruption of two million years ago put out enough ash to bury New York State to a depth of 20 meters, or California to a depth of 6 meters. This was the ash that made Mike Vorey's fossil beds in eastern Nebraska. That blast occurred in what is now Idaho, but over millions of years, at a rate of about 2.5 centimeters a year, the Earth's crust has traveled over it, so that today it is directly under northwest Wyoming. The hot spot itself stays in one place, like an acetylene torch aimed at a ceiling. In its wake, it leaves the sort of rich volcanic plains that are ideal for growing potatoes, as Idaho's farmers long ago discovered. In another two million years, geologists like to joke, Yellowstone will be producing French fries for McDonald's, and the people of Billings, Montana, will be stepping around geysers. The ash fall from the last Yellowstone eruption covered all or parts of 19 western states, plus parts of Canada and Mexico, nearly the whole of the United States west of the Mississippi. This, bear in mind, is the breadbasket of America, an area that produces roughly half the world's cereals. And ash, it is worth remembering, is not like a big snowfall that will melt in the spring. If you wanted to grow crops again, you would have to find some place to put all the ash. It took thousands of workers eight months to clear 1.8 billion tons of debris from the 6.5 hectares of the World Trade Center site in New York. Imagine what it would take to clear Kansas. And that's not even to consider the climatic consequences. The last supervolcano eruption on Earth was at Toba, in northern Sumatra, 74,000 years ago. No one knows quite how big it was, but it was a whopper. Greenland ice cores show that the Toba blast was followed by at least six years of volcanic winter, and goodness knows how many poor growing seasons after that. The event, it is thought, may have carried humans right to the brink of extinction, reducing the global population to no more than a few thousand individuals. That would mean that all modern humans arose from a very small population base, which would explain our lack of genetic diversity.
At all events, there is some evidence to suggest that for the next twenty thousand years, the total number of people on earth was never more than a few thousand at any time. That is, needless to say, a long time to spend recovering from a single volcanic blast. All this was hypothetically interesting, until 1973, when an odd occurrence made it suddenly momentous. Water in Yellowstone Lake, in the heart of the park, began to run over the banks at the lake's southern end, flooding a meadow, while at the opposite end of the lake the water mysteriously flowed away. Geologists did a hasty survey and discovered that a large area of the park had developed an ominous bulge. This was lifting up one end of the lake and causing the water to run out at the other, as would happen if you lifted one side of a child's paddling pool. By 1984, the whole central region of the park, over 100 square kilometers, was more than a meter higher than it had been in 1924, when the park was last formally surveyed. Then, in 1985, the central part of the park subsided by 20 centimeters, about 8 inches. It now seems to be swelling again. The geologists realized that only one thing could cause this. A restless magma chamber. Yellowstone wasn't the site of an ancient supervolcano. It was the site of an active one. It was also at about this time that they were able to work out that the cycle of Yellowstone's eruptions averaged one massive blow every 600,000 years. The last one was 630,000 years ago. Yellowstone, it appears, is due. It may not feel like it, but you're standing on the largest active volcano in the world. Paul Doss, Yellowstone National Park geologist, told me, soon after climbing off an enormous Harley-Davidson motorcycle and shaking hands when we met at the park headquarters at Mammoth Hot Springs early on a lovely morning in June. A native of Indiana, Doss is an amiable, soft-spoken, extremely thoughtful man who looks nothing like a National Park Service employee. He has a graying beard and hair tied back in a long ponytail. A small sapphire stud graces one ear. A slight paunch strains against his crisp Park Service uniform. He looks more like a blues musician than a government employee. In fact, he is a blues musician, harmonica. But he sure knows and loves geology. And I've got the best place in the world to do it, he says, as we set off in a bouncy, battered four-wheel drive vehicle in the general direction of Old Faithful. He has agreed to let me accompany him for a day as he goes about doing whatever it is a park geologist does. The first assignment today is to give an introductory talk to a new crop of tour guides. Yellowstone, I hardly need point out, is sensationally beautiful, with plump, stately mountains, bison-specked meadows, tumbling streams, a sky-blue lake, wildlife beyond counting. It really doesn't get any better than this if you're a geologist, Doss says. You've got rocks up at Beartooth Gap that are nearly three billion years old, three-quarters of the way back to the Earth's beginning. And then you've got mineral springs here, he points at the sulfurous hot springs from which Mammoth takes its title, where you can see rocks as they are being born. And in between there's everything you could possibly imagine. I've never been any place where geology is more evident or prettier. So you like it, I say. Oh, no, I love it, he answers with profound sincerity. I mean, I really love it here. The winters are tough and the pay's not too hot, but when it's good, it's just... He interrupted himself to point out a distant gap in a range of mountains to the west, which had just come into view over a rise. The mountains, he told me, were known as the Gallatins. That gap is sixty or maybe seventy miles across. For a long time, nobody could understand why that gap was there. And then Bob Christensen realized that it had to be because the mountains were just blown away. When you've got 60 miles of mountains just obliterated, you know you're dealing with something pretty potent. It took Christensen six years to figure it all out. I asked him what caused Yellowstone to blow when it did. Don't know. Nobody knows. Volcanoes are strange things. We really don't understand them at all. Vesuvius in Italy was active for 300 years until an eruption in 1944, and then it just stopped. It's been silent ever since. 
Some volcanologists think that it is recharging in a big way, which is a little worrying because two million people live on or around it, but nobody knows. And how much warning would you get if Yellowstone was going to go? He shrugged. Nobody was around the last time it blew, so nobody knows what the warning signs are. Probably you would have swarms of earthquakes and some surface uplift, and possibly some changes in the patterns of behavior of the geysers and steam vents, but nobody really knows. So it could just blow without warning? He nodded thoughtfully. The trouble, he explained, is that nearly all the things that would constitute warning signs already exist in some measure at Yellowstone. Earthquakes are generally a precursor of volcanic eruptions, but the park already has lots of earthquakes, 1,260 of them last year. Most of them are too small to be felt, but they are earthquakes nonetheless. A change in the pattern of geyser eruptions might also be taken as a clue, he said, but these too vary unpredictably. Once the most famous geyser in the park was Excelsior Geyser. It used to erupt regularly and spectacularly to heights of 100 meters. But in 1888 it just stopped. Then in 1985 it erupted again, though only to a height of 25 meters. Steamboat Geyser is the biggest geyser in the world when it blows, shooting water 120 meters into the air, but the intervals between its eruptions have ranged from as little as four days to almost fifty years. If it blew today and again next week, that wouldn't tell us anything at all about what it might do the following week, or the week after, or twenty years from now, Doss says. The whole park is so volatile that it's essentially impossible to draw conclusions from almost anything that happens. Evacuating Yellowstone would never be easy. The park gets some three million visitors a year, mostly in the three peak months of summer. The park's roads are comparatively few, and they are kept intentionally narrow, partly to slow traffic, partly to preserve an air of picturesqueness, and partly because of topographical constraints. At the height of summer, it can easily take half a day to cross the park and hours to get anywhere within it. Whenever people see animals, they just stop wherever they are, Doss says. We get bear jams, we get bison jams, we get wolf jams. In the autumn of 2000, representatives from the U.S. Geological Survey and National Park Service, along with some academics, met and formed something called the Yellowstone Volcanic Observatory. Four of these bodies were in existence already, in Hawaii, California, Alaska, and Washington, but oddly there was none in the largest volcanic zone in the world. The YVO was not actually a thing so much as an idea an agreement to coordinate efforts at studying and analyzing the park's diverse geology. One of its first tasks, Doss told me, was to draw up an earthquake and volcano hazards plan, a plan of action in the event of a crisis. There isn't one already, I said. Nope, afraid not, but there will be soon. Isn't that just a little tardy? He smiled. Well, let's just say that it's not any too soon. Once it is in place, the idea is that three people, Christensen in Menlo Park, California, Professor Robert B. Smith at the University of Utah, and Doss in the park, would assess the degree of danger of any potential cataclysm and advise the park superintendent. The superintendent would take the decision whether to evacuate the park. As for surrounding areas, there are no plans. You would be on your own once you left the park gates. Not much help if Yellowstone were going to blow in a really big way. Of course, it may be tens of thousands of years before that day comes. Doss thinks such a day may not come at all. Just because there was a pattern in the past doesn't mean that it still holds true, he says. There is some evidence to suggest that the pattern may be a series of catastrophic explosions, then a long period of quiet. We may be in that now. The evidence now is that most of the magma chamber is cooling and crystallizing. It is releasing its volatiles. You need to trap volatiles for an explosive eruption. In the meantime, there are plenty of other dangers in and around Yellowstone, as was made devastatingly evident on the night of the 17th of August, 1959, at a place called Hebgen Lake, just outside the park. 
At 20 minutes to midnight on that date, Hebgen Lake suffered a catastrophic quake. It was magnitude 7.5, not vast as earthquakes go, but so abrupt and wrenching that it collapsed an entire mountainside. It was the height of the summer season, though fortunately not so many people went to Yellowstone in those days as now. Eighty million tons of rock, moving at more than 160 kilometers an hour, just fell off the mountain, traveling with such force and momentum that the leading edge of the landslide ran 120 meters up a mountain on the other side of the valley. Along its path lay part of the Rock Creek campground. Twenty-eight campers were killed. Nineteen of them buried too deep, ever to be found again. The devastation was swift, but heartbreakingly fickle. Three brothers, sleeping in one tent, were spared. Their parents, sleeping in another tent beside them, were swept away and never seen again. A big earthquake, and I mean big, will happen sometime, Doss told me. You can count on that. This is a big fault zone for earthquakes. Despite the Hebgen Lake quake and the other known risks, Yellowstone didn't get permanent seismometers until the 1970s. If you needed a way to appreciate the grandeur and inexorability of geological processes, you could do worse than to consider the Tetons, the sumptuously jagged range that stands just to the south of Yellowstone National Park. Nine million years ago, the Tetons didn't exist. The land around Jackson Hole was just a high, grassy plain. But then a 64-kilometer-long fault opened within the earth, and since then, about once every 900 years, the Tetons experience a really big earthquake, enough to jerk them another two meters higher. It is these repeated jerks over eons that have raised them to their present majestic heights of 2,000 meters. That 900 years is an average, and a somewhat misleading one. According to Robert B. Smith and Lee J. Siegel in Windows into the Earth, a geological history of the region, the last major Teton quake was somewhere between about 5,000 and 7,000 years ago. The Tetons, in short, are about the most overdue earthquake zone on the planet. Hydrothermal explosions are also a significant risk. They can happen any time, pretty much anywhere, and without any predictability. You know, by design, we funnel visitors into thermal basins, Doss told me after we had watched Old Faithful Blow. It's what they come to see. Did you know there are more geysers and hot springs at Yellowstone than in all the rest of the world combined? I didn't know that. He nodded. Ten thousand of them, and nobody knows when a new vent might open. We drove to a place called Duck Lake, a body of water a couple of hundred meters across. It looks completely innocuous, he said. It's just a big pond. But this big hole didn't used to be here. At some time in the last 15,000 years, this blew in a really big way. You'd have had several tens of millions of tons of earth and rock and superheated water blowing out at supersonic speeds. You can imagine what it would be like if this happened under say, the parking lot at Old Faithful, or one of the visitor centers? He made an unhappy face. Would there be any warning? Probably not. The last significant explosion in the park was at a place called Pork Chop Geyser in 1989. That left a crater about five meters across. Not huge by any means, but big enough if you happened to be standing there at the time. Fortunately, nobody was around, so nobody was hurt, but that happened without warning. In the very ancient past, there have been explosions that have made holes a mile across. And nobody can tell you where or when that might happen next. You just have to hope that you're not standing there when it does. Big rock falls are also a danger. There was a big one at Gardner Canyon in 1999, but again, fortunately, no one was hurt. Late in the afternoon, Doss and I stopped at a place where there was a rock overhang poised above a busy park road, cracks were clearly visible. It could go at any time, Doss said thoughtfully. You're kidding, I said. There wasn't a moment when there weren't two cars passing beneath it, all filled with, in the most literal sense, happy campers. Oh, it's not likely, he added. I'm just saying it could. 
Equally, it could stay like that for decades. There's just no telling. People have to accept that there is risk in coming here. That's all there is to it. As we walked back to his vehicle to head back to Mammoth Hot Springs, Doss added, But the thing is, most of the time bad things don't happen. Rocks don't fall. Earthquakes don't occur. New vents don't suddenly open up. For all the instability, it's mostly remarkably and amazingly tranquil. Like the Earth itself, I remarked. Precisely, he agreed. The risks at Yellowstone apply to park employees as much as to visitors. Doss had got a horrific sense of that in his first week on the job five years earlier. Late one night, three young summer employees were engaging in an illicit activity known as hot-potting, swimming or basking in warm pools. Though the park, for obvious reasons, doesn't publicize it, not all the pools at Yellowstone are dangerously hot. Some are extremely agreeable to lie in, and it was the habit of some of the summer employees to have a dip late at night, even though it was against the rules to do so. Foolishly, the threesome had failed to take a torch, which was extremely dangerous because much of the soil around the warm pools is crusty and thin, and one can easily fall through into a scalding vent below. In any case, as they made their way back to their dorm, they came across a stream that they had had to leap over earlier. They backed up a few paces, linked arms, and on the count of three took a running jump. In fact, it wasn't the stream at all, it was a boiling pool. In the dark they had lost their bearings. None of the three survived. I thought about this the next morning as I made a brief call on my way out of the park at a place called Emerald Pool in the Upper Geyser Basin. Doss hadn't had time to take me there the day before, but I thought I ought at least to have a look at it, for Emerald Pool is a historic site. In 1965, a husband and wife team of biologists named Thomas and Louise Brock, while on a summer study trip, had done a crazy thing. They had scooped up some of the yellowy-brown scum that rimmed the pool and examined it for life. To their, and eventually the wider world's, deep surprise, it was full of living microbes. They had found the world's first extremophiles, organisms that could live in water that had previously been assumed to be much too hot or acid or choked with sulfur to bear life. Emerald Pool, remarkably, was all these things, yet at least two types of living things, Sulfolobus acidocaldarius and Thermophilus aquaticus, as they became known, found it congenial. It had always been supposed that nothing could survive above temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius. But here were organisms basking in rank, acidic waters nearly twice that hot. For almost twenty years, one of the Brock's two new bacteria, Thermophilus aquaticus, remained a laboratory curiosity. Until a scientist in California named Carrie B. Mullis realized that heat-resistant enzymes within it could be used to create a bit of chemical wizardry, known as a polymerase chain reaction which allows scientists to generate lots of DNA from very small amounts, as little as a single molecule in ideal conditions. It's a kind of genetic photocopying, and it became the basis for all subsequent genetic science, from academic studies to police forensic work. It won Mullis the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1993. Meanwhile, scientists were finding even hardier microbes, now known as hyperthermophiles, which demand temperatures of 80 degrees Celsius or more. The warmest organism found so far, according to Francis Ashcroft in Life at the Extremes, is Pyrolobus fumarii, which dwells in the walls of ocean vents, where the temperature can reach 113 degrees Celsius. The upper limit for life is thought to be about 120 degrees Celsius, though no one actually knows. At all events, the Brock's findings completely changed our perception of the living world. As NASA scientist J. Bergstrahl has put it, wherever we go on Earth, even into what seemed like the most hostile possible environments for life, as long as there is liquid water and some source of chemical energy, we find life. Life, it turns out, is infinitely more clever and adaptable than anyone had ever supposed. 
this is a very good thing. For as we are about to see, we live in a world that doesn't altogether seem to want us here. Part 5. Life Itself The more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. Freeman Dyson Chapter 16. Lonely Planet It isn't easy being an organism. In the whole universe, as far as we yet know, there is only one place an inconspicuous outpost of the Milky Way called the Earth that will sustain you, and even it can be pretty grudging. From the bottom of the deepest ocean trench to the top of the highest mountain, the zone that covers nearly the whole of known life is only around twenty kilometers thick, not much when set against the roominess of the cosmos at large. For humans, it is even worse, because we happen to belong to the portion of living things that took the rash but venturesome decision four hundred million years ago to crawl out of the seas and become land-based and oxygen-breathing. In consequence, no less than 99.5% of the world's habitable space by volume, according to one estimate, is fundamentally, in practical terms completely, off-limits to us. It isn't simply that we can't breathe in water, but that we couldn't bear the pressures. Because water is about 1,300 times heavier than air, pressures rise swiftly as you descend, by the equivalent of one atmosphere for every ten meters of depth. On land, if you rose to the top of a 150-meter eminence, Cologne Cathedral or the Washington Monument, say, the change in pressure would be so slight as to be indiscernible. At the same depth under water, however, your veins would collapse and your lungs would compress to the approximate dimensions of a Coke can. Amazingly, people do voluntarily dive to such depths without breathing apparatus for the fun of it, in a sport known as free diving. Apparently, the experience of having your internal organs rudely deformed is thought exhilarating, though not presumably as exhilarating as having them return to their former dimensions upon resurfacing. To reach such depths, however, divers must be dragged down, and quite briskly, by weights. Without assistance, the deepest anyone has gone and lived to talk about it afterwards is 72 meters, a feat performed by an Italian named Umberto Pellizzari, who in 1992 dived to that depth, lingered for a nanosecond, and then shot back to the surface. In terrestrial terms, 72 meters is a good bit shorter than a football pitch. So even in our most exuberant stunts, we can hardly claim to be masters of the abyss. Other organisms do, of course, manage to deal with the pressures at depth, though quite how some of them do so is a mystery. The deepest point in the ocean is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific. There, some 11.3 kilometers down, the pressures rise to over 16,000 pounds per square inch. We have managed just once, briefly, to send humans to that depth in a sturdy diving vessel, yet it is home to colonies of amphipods, a type of crustacean similar to shrimp but transparent, which survive without any protection at all. Most oceans are, of course, much shallower, but even at the average ocean depth of four kilometers, the pressure is equivalent to being squashed beneath a stack of fourteen loaded cement trucks. Nearly everyone, including the authors of some popular books on oceanography, assumes that the human body would crumple under the immense pressures of the deep ocean. In fact, this appears not to be the case. Because we are made largely of water ourselves, and water is virtually incompressible, in the words of Francis Ashcroft of Oxford University, the body remains at the same pressure as the surrounding water and is not crushed at depth. It is the gases inside your body, particularly in the lungs, that cause the trouble. These do compress, though at what point the compression becomes fatal is not known. Until quite recently, it was thought that anyone diving to 100 meters or so would die painfully, 
as his or her lungs imploded or chest wall collapsed, but the free divers have repeatedly proved otherwise. It appears, according to Ashcroft, that humans may be more like whales and dolphins than had been expected. Plenty else can go wrong, however. In the days of diving suits, the sort that were connected to the surface by long hoses, divers sometimes experienced a dreaded phenomenon known as the squeeze. This occurred when the surface pumps failed, leading to a catastrophic loss of pressure in the suit. The air would leave the suit with such violence that the hapless diver would be, all too literally, sucked up into the helmet and hosepipe. When hauled to the surface, all that is left in the suit are his bones and some rags of flesh, the biologist J.B.S. Haldane wrote in 1947, adding for the benefit of doubters, this has happened. Incidentally, the original diving helmet, designed in 1823 by an Englishman named Charles Dean, was intended not for diving, but for firefighting. It was called a smoke helmet, but being made of metal, it was hot and cumbersome. As Dean soon discovered, firefighters had no particular eagerness to enter burning structures in any form of attire, but most especially not in something that heated up like a kettle and made them clumsy into the bargain. In an attempt to save his investment, Dean tried it under water and found it was ideal for salvage work. The real terror of the deep, however, is the bends. Not so much because they are unpleasant, though of course they are, as because they are so much more likely. The air we breathe is 80% nitrogen. Put the human body under pressure, and that nitrogen is transformed into tiny bubbles that migrate into the blood and tissues. If the pressure is changed too rapidly, as with a too quick ascent by a diver, the bubbles trapped within the body will begin to fizz in exactly the manner of a freshly opened bottle of champagne, clogging tiny blood vessels, depriving cells of oxygen, and causing pain so excruciating that sufferers are prone to bend double in agony, hence the bends. The bends have been an occupational hazard for sponge and pearl divers since time immemorial but didn't attract much attention in the Western world until the 19th century, and then it was among people who didn't get wet at all, or at least not very wet, and not generally much above the ankles. They were caisson workers. Caissons were enclosed dry chambers built on riverbeds to facilitate the construction of bridge piers. They were filled with compressed air, and often... When the workers emerged after an extended period of working under this artificial pressure, they experienced mild symptoms like tingling or itchy skin. But an unpredictable few felt more insistent pain in the joints and occasionally collapsed in agony, sometimes never to get up again. It was all most puzzling. Sometimes the workers would go to bed feeling fine, but wake up paralyzed. Sometimes they wouldn't wake up at all. Ashcroft relates a story concerning the directors of a new tunnel under the Thames, who held a celebratory banquet as the tunnel neared completion. To their consternation, their champagne failed to fizz when uncorked in the compressed air of the tunnel. However, when at length they emerged into the fresh air of a London evening, the bubbles sprang instantly to fizziness, memorably enlivening the digestive process. Apart from avoiding high-pressure environments altogether, only two strategies are reliably successful against the bends. The first is to suffer only a very short exposure to the changes in pressure. That is why the free divers I mentioned earlier can descend to depths of 150 meters without ill effect. They don't stay down long enough for the nitrogen in their system to dissolve into their tissues. The other solution is to ascend by careful stages. This allows the little bubbles of nitrogen to dissipate harmlessly. A great deal of what we know about surviving at extremes is owed to the extraordinary father and son team of John Scott and J.B.S. Haldane. Even by the demanding standards of British intellectuals, the Haldanes were outstandingly eccentric. The senior Haldane was born in 1860. To an aristocratic Scottish family, his brother was Viscount Haldane, but spent most of his career in comparative modesty as a professor of physiology at Oxford. 
he was famously absent-minded. Once, after his wife had sent him upstairs to change for a dinner party, he failed to return, and was discovered asleep in bed in his pajamas. When roused, Haldane explained that he had found himself disrobing and assumed it was bedtime. His idea of a holiday was to travel to Cornwall to study hookworm in miners. Aldous Huxley, the novelist grandson of T.H. Huxley, who lived with the Haldanes for a time, parodied him a touch mercilessly as the scientist Edward Tantamount in the novel Point Counterpoint. Haldane's gift to diving was to work out the rest intervals necessary to manage an ascent from the depths without getting the bends. But his interests ranged across the whole of physiology, from studying altitude sickness to the problems of heat stroke in desert regions. He had a particular interest in the effects of toxic gases on the human body. To understand more exactly how carbon monoxide leaks killed miners, he methodically poisoned himself, carefully taking and measuring his own blood samples the while. He quit only when he was on the verge of losing all muscle control, and his blood saturation level had reached 56 percent, a level, as Trevor Norton notes in his entertaining history of diving stars beneath the sea, only fractionally removed from nearly certain lethality. Haldane's son Jack, known to posterity as J.B.S., was a remarkable prodigy who took an interest in his father's work almost from infancy. At the age of three, he was overheard demanding peevishly of his father, but is it oxyhemoglobin or carboxyhemoglobin? Throughout his youth, the young Haldane helped his father with experiments. By the time he was a teenager, the two often tested gases and gas masks together, taking it in turns to see how long it took them to pass out. Though J.B.S. Haldane never took a degree in science, he studied classics at Oxford. He became a brilliant scientist in his own right, mostly working for the government at Cambridge. The biologist Peter Medawar, who spent his life around mental Olympians, called him the cleverest man I ever knew. Huxley parodied the younger Haldane, too, in his novel Antic Hay, but also used his ideas on genetic manipulation of humans as the basis for the plot of Brave New World. Among many other achievements, Haldane played a central role in marrying Darwinian principles of evolution to the genetic work of Gregor Mendel to produce what is known to geneticists as the modern synthesis. Perhaps uniquely among human beings, the younger Haldane found the First World War a very enjoyable experience, and freely admitted that he enjoyed the opportunity of killing people. He was himself wounded twice. After the war, he became a successful popularizer of science and wrote 23 books, as well as over 400 scientific papers. His books are still thoroughly readable and instructive, though not always easy to find. He also became an enthusiastic Marxist. It has been suggested, not altogether cynically, that this was out of a purely contrarian instinct, and that if he had been born in the Soviet Union, he would have been a passionate monarchist. At all events, most of his articles first appeared in the Communist Daily Worker. Whereas his father's principal interests concerned miners and poisoning, the younger Haldane became obsessed with saving submariners and divers from the unpleasant consequences of their work. With admiralty funding, he acquired a decompression chamber that he called the pressure pot. This was a metal cylinder into which three people at a time could be sealed and subjected to tests of various types, all painful and nearly all dangerous. Volunteers might be required to sit in ice water while breathing aberrant atmosphere, or subjected to rapid changes of pressurization. In one experiment, Haldane himself simulated a dangerously hasty ascent to see what would happen. What happened was that the dental fillings in his teeth exploded. Almost every experiment, Norton writes, ended with someone having a seizure, bleeding, or vomiting. The chamber was virtually soundproof, so the only way for occupants to signal unhappiness or distress was to tap insistently on the chamber wall or to hold up notes to a small window. On another occasion, while poisoning himself with elevated levels of oxygen, Haldane had a fit 
so severe that he crushed several vertebrae. Collapsed lungs were a routine hazard. Perforated eardrums were quite common, too. But as Haldane reassuringly noted in one of his essays, the drum generally heals up, and if a hole remains in it, although one is somewhat deaf, one can blow tobacco smoke out of the ear in question, which is a social accomplishment. What was extraordinary about this was not that Haldane was willing to subject himself to such risk and discomfort in the pursuit of science, but that he had no trouble talking colleagues and loved ones into climbing into the chamber, too. Sent on a simulated descent, his wife once had a fit that lasted thirteen minutes. When at last she stopped bouncing across the floor, she was helped to her feet and sent home to cook dinner. Haldane happily employed whoever happened to be around, including on one memorable occasion a former Prime Minister of Spain, Juan Negrin. Dr. Negrin complained afterwards of minor tingling and a curious velvety sensation on the lips, but otherwise seems to have escaped unharmed. He may have considered himself very lucky. A similar experiment with oxygen deprivation left Haldane without feeling in his buttocks and lower spine for six years. Among Haldane's many specific preoccupations was nitrogen intoxication. For reasons that are still poorly understood, at depths beyond about 30 meters, nitrogen becomes a powerful intoxicant. Under its influence, divers had been known to offer their air hoses to passing fish, or to decide to try to have a smoke break. It also produced wild mood swings. In one test, Haldane noted, the subject alternated between depression and elation, at one moment begging to be decompressed because he felt bloody awful, and the next minute laughing and attempting to interfere with his colleague's dexterity test. In order to measure the rate of deterioration in the subject, a scientist had to go into the chamber with the volunteer to conduct simple mathematical tests. But after a few minutes, as Haldane later recalled, the tester was usually as intoxicated as the testee and often forgot to press the spindle of his stopwatch or to take proper notes. The cause of the inebriation is even now a mystery. It is thought that it may be the same thing that causes alcohol intoxication, but as no one knows for certain what causes that, we are none the wiser. At all events, without the greatest care, it is easy to get in trouble once you leave the surface world. Which brings us back, well, nearly, to our earlier observation that the Earth is not the easiest place to be an organism, even if it is the only place. Of the small portion of the planet's surface that is dry enough to stand on, a surprisingly large amount is too hot, or cold, or dry, or steep, or lofty, to be of much use to us. Partly, it must be conceded, this is our fault. In terms of adaptability, humans are pretty amazingly useless. Like most animals, we don't much like really hot places, but because we sweat so freely and easily succumb to strokes, we are especially vulnerable. In the worst circumstances, on foot without water in a hot desert, most people will grow delirious and keel over, possibly never to rise again, in no more than seven or eight hours. We are no less helpless in the face of cold. Like all mammals, humans are good at generating heat, but because we are so nearly hairless, we are not good at keeping it. Even in quite mild weather, half the calories you burn go to keep your body warm. Of course, we can counter these frailties to a large extent by employing clothing and shelter, but even so, the portions of the earth on which we are prepared or able to live are modest indeed. Just 12% of the total land area and only 4% of the whole surface, if you include the seas. Yet when you consider conditions elsewhere in the known universe, the wonder is not that we use so little of our planet, but that we have managed to find a planet of which we can use even a bit. You have only to look at our own solar system, or come to that the Earth at certain periods in its own history, to appreciate that most places are much harsher and much less amenable to life than our mild, blue, watery globe. So far, space scientists have discovered about 70 planets outside the solar system, out of the 10 billion trillion or so that are thought to be out there, 
so humans can hardly claim to speak with authority on the matter, but it appears that if you wish to have a planet suitable for life, you have to be just awfully lucky. And the more advanced the life, the luckier you have to be. Various observers have identified about two dozen particularly fortunate breaks we have had on the Earth, but this is a flying survey, so we'll distill them down to the principal four. Excellent location. We are, to an almost uncanny degree, the right distance from the right sort of star, one that is big enough to radiate lots of energy, but not so big as to burn itself out swiftly. It is a curiosity of physics that the larger a star is, the more rapidly it burns. Had our sun been ten times as massive, it would have exhausted itself after ten million years, instead of ten billion, and we wouldn't be here now. We are also fortunate to orbit where we do. Too much nearer, and everything on Earth would have boiled away. Much further away, and everything would have frozen. In 1978, an astrophysicist named Michael Hart made some calculations and concluded that the Earth would have been uninhabitable had it been just 1% further from or 5% closer to the Sun. That's not much. The figures have since been refined and made a little more generous. 5% nearer and 15% further are thought to be more accurate assessments for our zone of habitability, but that is still a narrow belt. To appreciate just how narrow, you have only to look at Venus. Venus is only 25 million miles closer to the sun than we are. The sun's warmth reaches it just two minutes before it touches us. In size and composition, Venus is very like the Earth but the small difference in orbital distance made all the difference to how it turned out. It appears that during the early years of the solar system, Venus was only slightly warmer than the Earth and probably had oceans. But those few degrees of extra warmth meant that Venus could not hold on to its surface water with disastrous consequences for its climate. As its water evaporated, the hydrogen atoms escaped into space and the oxygen atoms combined with carbon to form a dense atmosphere of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. Venus became stifling. Although people of my age will recall a time when astronomers hoped that Venus might harbor life beneath its padded clouds, possibly even a kind of tropical verdure, we now know that it is much too fierce an environment for any kind of life that we can reasonably conceive of. Its surface temperature is a roasting 470 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to melt lead. And the atmospheric pressure at the surface is 90 times that of Earth, more than any human body could withstand. We lack the technology to make suits or even spaceships that would allow us to visit. Our knowledge of Venus's surface is based on distant radar imagery and some startled squawks from an unmanned Soviet probe that was dropped hopefully into the clouds in 1972 and functioned for barely an hour before permanently shutting down. So that's what happens when you move two light minutes closer to the sun. Travel further out, and the problem becomes not heat, but cold, as Mars frigidly attests. It, too, was once a much more congenial place, but couldn't retain a usable atmosphere and turned into a frozen waste. But just being the right distance from the sun cannot be the whole story, for otherwise the moon would be forested and fair, which patently it is not. For that you need to have the right kind of planet. I don't imagine even many geophysicists, when asked to count their blessings, would include living on a planet with a molten interior but it's a pretty near certainty that without all that magma swirling around beneath us, we wouldn't be here now. Apart from much else, our lively interior created the outpourings of gas that helped to build an atmosphere and provided us with a magnetic field that shields us from cosmic radiation. It also gave us plate tectonics, which continually renews and rumples the surface. If the Earth were perfectly smooth, it would be covered everywhere with water to a depth of four kilometers. There might be life in that lonesome ocean, but there certainly wouldn't be football. In addition to having a beneficial interior, we also have the right elements in the correct proportions. 
In the most literal way, we are made of the right stuff. This is so crucial to our well-being that we are going to discuss it more fully in a minute. But first, we need to consider the two remaining factors, beginning with another one that is often overlooked. We're a twin planet. Not many of us normally think of the moon as a companion planet, but that is, in effect, what it is. Most moons are tiny in relation to their master planet. The Martian satellites of Phobos and Deimos, for instance, are only about ten kilometers in diameter. Our moon, however, is more than a quarter the diameter of the Earth, which makes ours the only planet in the solar system with a sizable moon in comparison to itself. Except Pluto, which doesn't really count, because Pluto is itself so small. And what a difference that makes to us! Without the moon's steadying influence, the Earth would wobble like a dying top, with goodness knows what consequences for climate and weather. The moon's steady gravitational influence keeps the Earth spinning at the right speed and angle to provide the sort of stability necessary for the long and successful development of life. This won't go on forever. The moon is slipping from our grasp at a rate of about four centimeters a year. In another two billion years, it will have receded so far that it won't keep us steady, and we will have to come up with some other solution. But in the meantime, you should think of it as much more than just a pleasant feature in the night sky. For a long time, astronomers assumed that either the moon and the earth formed together, or that the earth captured the moon as it drifted by. We now believe, as you will recall from an earlier chapter, that about 4.4 billion years ago, a Mars-sized object slammed into Earth, blowing out enough material to create the moon from the debris. This was obviously a very good thing for us, but especially so as it happened such a long time ago. If it had happened in 1896, or last Wednesday, clearly we wouldn't be nearly so pleased about it. Which brings us to our fourth, and in many ways most crucial, consideration. Timing. The universe is an amazingly fickle and eventful place, and our existence within it is a wonder. If a long and unimaginably complex sequence of events stretching back 4.6 billion years or so hadn't played out in a particular manner at particular times, if, to take just one obvious instance, the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out by a meteor when they were, you might well be a few centimeters long, with whiskers and a tail, and listening to this in a burrow. We don't really know, because we have nothing else to which we can compare our own existence. But it seems evident that if you wish to end up as a moderately advanced thinking society, you need to be at the right end of a very long chain of outcomes involving reasonable periods of stability, interspersed with just the right amount of stress and challenge. Ice ages appear to be especially helpful in this regard— and marked by a total absence of real cataclysm. As we shall see in the pages that remain to us, we are very lucky to find ourselves in that position. And on that note, let us now turn briefly to the elements that made us. There are 92 naturally occurring elements on the earth, plus a further 20 or so that have been created in labs, but some of these we can immediately put to one side as, in fact, chemists themselves tend to do. Not a few of our earthly chemicals are surprisingly little known. Astatine, for instance, is practically unstudied. It has a name and a place on the periodic table next door to Marie Curie's polonium, but almost nothing else. The problem isn't scientific indifference, but rarity. There just isn't much astatine out there. The most elusive element of all, however, appears to be francium, which is so rare that it is thought that our entire planet may contain, at any given moment, fewer than twenty francium atoms. Altogether, only about thirty of the naturally occurring elements are widespread on Earth, and barely half a dozen are of central importance to life. As you might expect, oxygen is our most abundant element, accounting for just under fifty percent of the Earth's crust, but after that, the relative abundances are often surprising. Who would guess, for instance, that silicon is the second most common element on the Earth, or that titanium is tenth? 
Abundance has little to do with their familiarity or utility to us. Many of the more obscure elements are actually more common than the better known ones. There is more cerium on earth than copper, more neodymium and lanthanum than cobalt or nitrogen. Tin barely makes it into the top 50, eclipsed by such relative obscurities as praseodymium, samarium, gadolinium, and dysprosium. Abundance also has little to do with ease of detection. Aluminium is the fourth most common element on Earth, accounting for nearly a tenth of everything that's underneath your feet. But its existence wasn't even suspected until it was discovered in the 19th century by Humphrey Davy. And for a long time after that, it was treated as rare and precious. Congress nearly put a shiny lining of aluminium foil atop the Washington Monument to show what a classy and prosperous nation we had become. And the French imperial family in the same period discarded the state silver dinner service and replaced it with an aluminium one. The fashion was cutting edge, even if the knives weren't. Nor does abundance necessarily relate to importance. Carbon is only the fifteenth most common element accounting for a very modest 0.048% of the Earth's crust. But we would be lost without it. What sets the carbon atom apart is that it is shamelessly promiscuous. It is the party animal of the atomic world, latching on to many other atoms, including itself, and holding tight, forming molecular conga lines of hearty robustness, the very trick of nature necessary to build proteins and DNA. As Paul Davies has written, if it wasn't for carbon, life as we know it would be impossible. Probably any sort of life would be impossible. Yet carbon is not all that plentiful, even in us who so vitally depend on it. Of every 200 atoms in your body, 126 are hydrogen, 51 are oxygen, and just 19 are carbon. Other elements are critical not for creating life, but for sustaining it. We need iron to manufacture hemoglobin, and without it we would die. Cobalt is necessary for the creation of vitamin B12. Potassium and a very little sodium are literally good for your nerves. Molybdenum, manganese, and vanadium help to keep your enzymes purring. Zinc, bless it, oxidizes alcohol. We have evolved to utilize or tolerate these things. We could hardly be here otherwise. But even then, we live within narrow ranges of acceptance. Selenium is vital to all of us. But take in just a little too much, and it will be the last thing you ever do. The degree to which organisms require or tolerate certain elements is a relic of their evolution. Sheep and cattle now graze side by side, but actually have very different mineral requirements. Modern cattle need quite a lot of copper, because they evolved in parts of Europe and Africa where copper was abundant. Sheep, on the other hand, evolved in copper-poor areas of Asia Minor. As a rule, and not surprisingly, our tolerance for elements is directly proportionate to their abundance in the Earth's crust. We have evolved to expect, and in some cases actually need, the tiny amounts of rare elements that accumulate in the flesh or fiber that we eat, but step up the doses, in some cases by only a tiny amount, and we can soon cross a threshold. Much of this is only imperfectly understood, no one knows, for example, whether a tiny amount of arsenic is necessary for our well-being or not. Some authorities say it is, some not. All that is certain is that too much of it will kill you. The properties of the elements can become more curious still when they are combined. Oxygen and hydrogen, for instance, are two of the most combustion-friendly elements around, but put them together and they make incombustible water. Odder still, in combination, are sodium, one of the most unstable of all elements, and chlorine, one of the most toxic. Drop a small lump of pure sodium into ordinary water, and it will explode with enough force to kill. Chlorine is even more notoriously hazardous. Though useful in small concentrations for killing microorganisms, it's chlorine you smell in bleach, in larger volumes it is lethal. Chlorine was the element of choice for many of the poison gases of the First World War. 
And as many a sore-eyed swimmer will attest, even an exceedingly dilute form, the human body doesn't appreciate it. Yet put these two nasty elements together, and what do you get? Sodium chloride, common table salt. By and large, if an element doesn't naturally find its way into our systems, if it isn't soluble in water, say, we tend to be intolerant of it. Lead poisons us because we were never exposed to it until we began to fashion it into food vessels and pipes for plumbing. Note, incidentally, lead's symbol is PB for the Latin plumbum, the source word for our modern plumbing. The Romans also flavored their wine with lead, which may be part of the reason they are not the force they used to be. As we have seen elsewhere, our own performance with lead, not to mention mercury, cadmium, and all the other industrial pollutants with which we routinely dose ourselves, does not leave us a great deal of room for smirking. When elements don't occur naturally on Earth, we have evolved no tolerance for them, and so they tend to be extremely toxic to us, as with plutonium. Our tolerance for plutonium is zero. There is no level at which it is not going to make you want to lie down. I have brought you a long way to make a small point. A big part of the reason that Earth seems so miraculously accommodating is that we evolved to suit its conditions. What we marvel at is not that it is suitable to life, but that it is suitable to our life. And hardly surprising, really. It may be that many of the things that make it so splendid to us, well-proportioned sun, doting moon, sociable carbon, more molten magma than you can shake a stick at, and all the rest, seem splendid simply because they are what we were born to count on. No one can altogether say. Other worlds may harbor beings thankful for their silvery lakes of mercury and drifting clouds of ammonia, they may be delighted that their planet doesn't shake them silly with its grinding plates or spew messy gobs of lava over the landscape, but rather exists in a permanent non-tectonic tranquility. Any visitors to the earth from afar would almost certainly, at the very least, be amused to find us living in an atmosphere composed of nitrogen, a gas sulkily disinclined to react with anything, and oxygen which is so partial to combustion that we must place fire stations throughout our cities to protect ourselves from its livelier effects. But even if our visitors were oxygen-breathing bipeds with shopping malls and a fondness for action movies, it is unlikely that they would find the Earth ideal. We couldn't even give them lunch because all our foods contain traces of manganese, selenium, zinc, and other elemental particles, at least some of which would be poisonous to them. To them, the earth might not seem a wondrously congenial place at all. The physicist Richard Feynman used to make a joke about a posteriori conclusions, reasoning from known facts back to possible causes. You know, the most amazing thing happened to me tonight, he would say. I saw a car with a license plate ARW357. Can you imagine? Of all the millions of license plates in the state, what was the chance that I would see that particular one tonight? Amazing! His point, of course, is that it is easy to make any banal situation seem extraordinary if you treat it as fateful. So it is possible that the events and conditions that led to the rise of life on Earth are not quite as extraordinary as we like to think. Still, they were extraordinary enough. And one thing is certain, they will have to do until we find some better. Till 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 we find some better. Chapter 17 Into the Troposphere Thank goodness for the atmosphere. It keeps us warm. Without it... Earth would be a lifeless ball of ice with an average temperature of minus 50 degrees Celsius. In addition, the atmosphere absorbs or deflects incoming swarms of cosmic rays, charged particles, ultraviolet rays, and the like. Altogether, the gaseous padding of the atmosphere is equivalent to a 4.5-meter thickness of protective concrete. 
and without it, these invisible visitors from space would slice through us like tiny daggers. Even raindrops would pound us senseless if it weren't for the atmosphere's slowing drag. The most striking thing about our atmosphere is that there isn't very much of it. It extends upwards for about 190 kilometers, which might seem reasonably bounteous when viewed from ground level, but if you shrank the Earth to the size of a standard desktop globe, it would only be about the thickness of a couple of coats of varnish. For scientific convenience, the atmosphere is divided into four unequal layers, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and ionosphere, now often called the thermosphere. The troposphere is the part that's dear to us. It alone contains enough warmth and oxygen to allow us to function, though even it swiftly becomes uncongenial to life as you climb up through it. From ground level to its highest point, the troposphere, or turning sphere, is about 16 kilometers thick at the equator and no more than 10 or 11 kilometers high in the temperate latitudes where most of us live. Eighty percent of the atmosphere's mass, virtually all the water and thus virtually all the weather, are contained within this thin and wispy layer. There really isn't much between you and oblivion. Beyond the troposphere is the stratosphere. When you see the top of a storm cloud flattening out into the classic anvil shape, you are looking at the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere. This invisible ceiling is known as the tropopause and was discovered in 1902 by a Frenchman in a balloon, Léon Philippe Tesseron de Bord. Pause in this sense doesn't mean to stop momentarily, but to cease altogether. It's from the same Greek root as menopause. Even at the troposphere's greatest extent, the tropopause is not very distant. A fast lift of the sort used in modern skyscrapers would get you there in about twenty minutes, though you would be well advised not to make the trip. Such a rapid ascent without pressurization would, at the very least, result in severe cerebral and pulmonary edemas, a dangerous excess of fluids in the body's tissues. When the doors opened at the viewing platform, anyone inside would almost certainly be dead, or dying. Even a more measured ascent would be accompanied by a great deal of discomfort. The temperature ten kilometers up can be minus fifty-seven degrees Celsius, and you would need or at least very much appreciate, supplementary oxygen. After you have left the troposphere, the temperature soon warms up again, to about 4 degrees Celsius, thanks to the absorptive effects of ozone, something else de Boer discovered on his daring 1902 ascent. It then plunges to as low as minus 90 degrees Celsius in the mesosphere, before skyrocketing to 1,500 degrees Celsius or more in the aptly named but very erratic thermosphere, where temperatures can vary by over 500 degrees from day to night. Though it must be said that temperature at such a height becomes a somewhat notional concept. Temperature is really just a measure of the activity of molecules. At sea level, air molecules are so thick that one molecule can move only the tiniest distance, about eight millionths of a centimeter, to be precise, before banging into another. Because trillions of molecules are constantly colliding, a lot of heat gets exchanged. But at the height of the thermosphere, at 80 kilometers or more, the air is so thin that any two molecules will be miles apart and hardly ever come into contact. So, although each molecule is very warm, there are very few interactions between them, and thus little heat transference. This is good news for satellites and spaceships, because if the exchange of heat were more efficient, any man-made object orbiting at that level would burst into flame. Even so, spaceships have to take care in the outer atmosphere, particularly on return trips to Earth, as the Space Shuttle Columbia demonstrated all too tragically in February 2003. Although the atmosphere is very thin, if a craft comes in at too steep an angle, more than about six degrees, or too swiftly, it can strike enough molecules to generate drag of an exceedingly combustible nature. Conversely, if an incoming vehicle hit the thermosphere at too shallow an angle, it could well bounce back into space like a pebble skipped across water. 
But you needn't venture to the edge of the atmosphere to be reminded of what hopelessly ground-hugging beings we are. As anyone who has spent time in a lofty city will know, you don't have to rise too many hundreds of meters from sea level before your body begins to protest. Even experienced mountaineers with the benefits of fitness, training, and bottled oxygen quickly become vulnerable at height to confusion, nausea, exhaustion, frostbite, hypothermia, migraine, loss of appetite, and a great many other stumbling dysfunctions. In a hundred emphatic ways, the human body reminds its owner that it wasn't designed to operate so far above sea level. Even under the most favorable circumstances, the climber Peter Habler has written of conditions atop Everest, every step at that altitude demands a colossal effort of will. You must force yourself to make every movement, reach for every handhold. You are perpetually threatened by a leaden, deadly fatigue. In The Other Side of Everest, the British mountaineer and filmmaker Matt Dickinson records how Howard Somerville, on a 1924 British expedition up Everest, found himself choking to death after a piece of infected flesh came loose and blocked his windpipe. With a supreme effort, Somerville managed to cough up the obstruction. It turned out to be the entire mucus lining of his larynx. Bodily distress is notorious above 7,500 meters, the area known to climbers as the death zone. But many people become severely debilitated, even dangerously ill, at heights of no more than 4,500 meters or so. Susceptibility has little to do with fitness. Grannies sometimes caper about in lofty situations while their fitter offspring are reduced to helpless groaning heaps until conveyed to lower altitudes. The absolute limit of human tolerance for continuous living appears to be about 5,500 meters. But even people conditioned to living at altitude could not tolerate such heights for long. Francis Ashcroft, in Life at the Extremes, notes that there are Andean sulfur mines at 5,800 meters, but that the miners prefer to descend 460 meters each evening and climb back up the following day, rather than live continuously at that elevation. People who habitually live at altitude have often spent thousands of years developing disproportionately large chests and lungs and increasing their density of oxygen-bearing red blood cells by almost a third, though there are limits to how much thickening with red cells the blood supply can stand before it becomes too thick to flow smoothly. Moreover, above 5,500 meters, even the most well-adapted women cannot provide a growing fetus with enough oxygen to bring it to its full term. In the 1780s, when people began to make experimental balloon ascents in Europe, something that surprised them was how chilly it got as they rose. The temperature drops about 1.6 degrees Celsius with every 1,000 meters you climb. Logic would seem to indicate that the closer you get to a source of heat, the warmer you should feel. Part of the explanation is that you are not really getting nearer the sun in any meaningful sense. The sun is 93 million miles away. To move a few hundred meters closer to it is like taking one step closer to a bushfire in Australia and expecting to smell smoke when you are standing in Ohio. The answer again takes us back to the question of the density of molecules in the atmosphere. Sunlight energizes atoms. It increases the rate at which they jiggle and jounce, and in their enlivened state, they crash into one another, releasing heat. When you feel the sun warm on your back on a summer's day, it's really excited atoms you feel. The higher you climb, the fewer molecules there are, and so the fewer collisions between them. Air is deceptive stuff. Even at sea level, we tend to think of the air as being ethereal and all but weightless. In fact, it has plenty of bulk, and that bulk often exerts itself. As a marine scientist named Wyville Thompson wrote more than a century ago, we sometimes find when we get up in the morning by a rise of an inch in the barometer that nearly half a ton has been quietly piled upon us during the night. But we experience no inconvenience, rather a feeling of exhilaration and buoyancy. 
since it requires a little less exertion to move our bodies in the denser medium. The reason you don't feel crushed under that extra half ton of pressure is the same reason your body would not be crushed deep beneath the sea. It is made mostly of incompressible fluids, which push back, equalizing the pressures within and without. But get air in motion, as with a hurricane or even a stiff breeze, and you will quickly be reminded that it has very considerable mass. Altogether, there are about 5,200 million million tons of air around us, 25 million tons for every square mile of the planet, a not inconsequential volume. When you get millions of tons of atmosphere rushing past at 50 or 60 kilometers an hour, it's hardly a surprise that tree limbs snap and roof tiles go flying. As Anthony Smith notes, a typical weather front may consist of 750 million tons of cold air pinned beneath a billion tons of warmer air. Hardly a wonder that the result is at times meteorologically exciting. Certainly there is no shortage of energy in the world above our heads. One thunderstorm, it has been calculated, can contain an amount of energy equivalent to four days' use of electricity for the whole United States. In the right conditions, storm clouds can rise to heights of 10 to 15 kilometers and contain updrafts and downdrafts of over 150 kilometers an hour. These are often side by side, which is why pilots don't want to fly through them. In all the internal turmoil, particles within the cloud pick up electrical charges. For reasons not entirely understood, the lighter particles tend to become positively charged and to be wafted by air currents to the top of the cloud. The heavier particles linger at the base, accumulating negative charges. These negatively charged particles have a powerful urge to rush to the positively charged Earth, and good luck to anything that gets in their way. A bolt of lightning travels at 435,000 kilometers an hour and can heat the air around it to a decidedly crisp 28,000 degrees Celsius, several times hotter than the surface of the sun. At any one moment, 1,800 thunderstorms are in progress around the globe, some 40,000 a day. Day and night across the planet, every second, about a hundred lightning bolts hit the ground. The sky is a lively place. Much of our knowledge of what goes on up there is surprisingly recent. Jet streams, usually located about 9,000 to 10,000 meters up, can bowl along at up to nearly 300 kilometers an hour and vastly influence weather systems over whole continents. Yet their existence wasn't suspected until pilots began to fly into them during the Second World War. Even now, a great deal of atmospheric phenomena is barely understood. A form of wave motion, popularly known as clear air turbulence, occasionally enlivens airplane flights. About 20 such incidents a year are serious enough to need reporting. They are not associated with cloud structures or anything else that can be detected visually or by radar. They are just pockets of startling turbulence in the middle of tranquil skies. In a typical incident, a plane en route from Singapore to Sydney was flying over central Australia in calm conditions when it suddenly fell 90 meters, enough to fling unsecured people against the ceiling. Twelve people were injured, one seriously. No one knows what causes such disruptive cells of air. The process that moves air around in the atmosphere is the same process that drives the internal engine of the planet, namely convection. Moist, warm air from the equatorial regions rises until it hits the barrier of the tropopause and spreads out. As it travels away from the equator and cools, it sinks. When it hits bottom, some of the sinking air looks for an area of low pressure to fill and heads back for the equator, completing the circuit. At the equator, the convection process is generally stable and the weather predictably fair, but in temperate zones, the patterns are far more seasonal, localized and random, which results in an endless battle between systems of high-pressure and low-pressure air. 
Low-pressure systems are created by rising air, which conveys water molecules into the sky, forming clouds, and eventually rain. Warm air can hold more moisture than cool air, which is why tropical and summer storms tend to be the heaviest. Thus, low areas tend to be associated with cloud and rain, and highs generally spell sunshine and fair weather. When two such systems meet, it often becomes manifest in the clouds. For instance, stratus clouds, those unlovable, featureless sprawls that give us our overcast skies, happen when moisture-bearing updrafts lack the oomph to break through a level of more stable air above, and instead spread out like smoke hitting a ceiling. Indeed, if you watch a smoker sometime, you can get a very good idea of how things work by watching how smoke rises from a cigarette in a still room. At first it goes straight up. This is called a laminar flow, if you need to impress anyone. And then it spreads out in a diffused, wavy layer. The greatest supercomputer in the world, taking measurements in the most carefully controlled environment, cannot accurately predict what forms these ripplings will take. So you can imagine the difficulties that confront meteorologists when they try to forecast such motions in a spinning, windy, large-scale world. What we do know is that because heat from the sun is unevenly distributed, differences in air pressure arise on the planet. Air can't abide this, so it rushes around trying to equalize things everywhere. Wind is simply the air's way of trying to keep things in balance. Air always flows from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, as you would expect. Think of anything with air under pressure, a balloon, or an air tank, or an airplane with a missing window, and think how insistently that pressurized air wants to go somewhere else. And the greater the discrepancy in pressures, the faster the wind blows. Incidentally, wind speeds, like most things that accumulate, grow exponentially. So a wind blowing at 300 kilometers an hour is not simply 10 times stronger than a wind blowing at 30 kilometers an hour, but a hundred times stronger. And hence, that much more destructive. Introduce several million tons of air to this accelerator effect, and the result can be exceedingly energetic. A tropical hurricane can release in 24 hours as much energy as a rich, medium-sized nation like Britain or France uses in a year. The impulse of the atmosphere to seek equilibrium was first suspected by Edmund Halley, the man who was everywhere, and elaborated upon in the 18th century by his fellow Briton George Hadley, who saw that rising and falling columns of air tended to produce cells, known ever since as Hadley cells. Though a lawyer by profession, Halley had a keen interest in the weather, he was, after all, English, and also suggested a link between his cells, the Earth's spin, and the apparent deflections of air that give us our trade winds. However, it was an engineering professor at the École Polytechnique in Paris, Gustave Gaspard de Coriolis, who worked out the details of these interactions in 1835, and thus we call it the Coriolis effect. Coriolis's other distinction at the school was to introduce water coolers, which are still known there as Corios, apparently. The Earth revolves at a brisk 1,675 kilometers an hour at the equator, though as you move towards the poles, the speed slopes off considerably, to about 900 kilometers an hour in London or Paris, for instance. The reason for this is self-evident when you think about it. If you are on the equator, the spinning Earth has to carry you quite a distance, about 40,000 kilometers, to get you back to the same spot. Whereas if you stand beside the North Pole, you may need to travel only a few meters to complete a revolution. Yet in both cases, it takes 24 hours to get you back to where you began. Therefore, it follows that the closer you get to the equator, the faster you must be spinning. The Coriolis effect explains why anything moving through the air in a straight line laterally to the Earth's spin will, given enough distance, seem to curve to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern, as the Earth revolves beneath it. 
The standard way to envision this is to imagine yourself at the center of a large carousel and tossing a ball to someone positioned on the edge. By the time the ball gets to the perimeter, the target person has moved on, and the ball passes behind him. From his perspective, it looks as if it is curved away from him. That is the Coriolis effect, and it is what gives weather systems their curl and sends hurricanes spinning off like tops. The Coriolis effect is also why naval guns firing artillery shells have to adjust to left or right. A shell fired 15 miles would otherwise deviate by about 100 yards and plop harmlessly into the sea. Considering the practical and psychological importance of the weather to nearly everyone, meteorology didn't really get going as a science until shortly before the beginning of the 19th century, though the term meteorology itself had been around since 1626, when it was coined by a T. Granger in a book of logic. Part of the problem was that successful meteorology requires the precise measurements of temperatures, and thermometers for a long time proved more difficult to make than you might expect. An accurate reading was dependent on getting a very even bore in a glass tube, and that wasn't easy to do. The first person to solve the problem was Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit, a Dutch maker of instruments, who produced an accurate thermometer in 1717. However, for reasons unknown, he calibrated the instrument in a way that put freezing at 32 degrees and boiling at 212 degrees. From the outset, this numeric eccentricity bothered some people, and in 1742, Anders Celsius, a Swedish astronomer, came up with a competing scale. In proof of the proposition that inventors seldom get matters entirely right, Celsius made boiling point zero and freezing point one hundred on his scale, but that was soon reversed. The person most frequently identified as the father of modern meteorology was an English pharmacist named Luke Howard, who came to prominence at the beginning of the 19th century. Howard is chiefly remembered now for giving cloud types their names in 1803. Although he was an active and respected member of the Linnaean Society and employed Linnaean principles in his new scheme, Howard chose the rather more obscure Askesian Society as the forum in which to announce his new scheme of classification. The Askesian Society, you may just recall from an earlier chapter, was the body whose members were unusually devoted to the pleasures of nitrous oxide, so we can only hope they treated Howard's presentation with the sober attention it deserved. It is a point on which Howard scholars are curiously silent. Howard divided clouds into three groups, stratus for the layered clouds, cumulus for the fluffy ones, the word means heaped in Latin, and cirrus, meaning curled, for the high, thin, feathery formations that generally presage colder weather. To these he subsequently added a fourth term, nimbus, from the Latin for cloud, for a rain cloud. The beauty of Howard's system was that the basic components could be freely recombined to describe every shape and size of passing cloud. Stratocumulus, cirrostratus, cumulonimbus, and so on. It was an immediate hit, and not just in England. Goethe was so taken with the system that he dedicated four poems to Howard. Howard's system has been much added to over the years, so much so that the encyclopedic, if little read, International Cloud Atlas runs to two volumes. But interestingly, virtually all the post-Howard cloud types, Mametus, Peleus, Nebulosus, Pisatus, Flocus, and Mediocris are a sampling, have never caught on with anyone outside meteorology, and not terribly much within it, I'm told. Incidentally, the first much thinner edition of that atlas, produced in 1896, divided clouds into ten basic types, of which the plumpest and most cushiony-looking was number nine, cumulonimbus. That seems to have been the source of the expression to be on cloud nine. For all the heft and fury of the occasional anvil-headed storm cloud, the average cloud is actually a benign and surprisingly insubstantial thing. 
A fluffy summer cumulus, several hundred meters to a side, may contain no more than 100 to 150 liters of water, about enough to fill a bathtub, as James Treffle has noted. You can get some sense of the immaterial quality of clouds by strolling through fog, which is, after all, nothing more than a cloud that lacks the will to fly. To quote Treffle again, if you walk 100 yards through a typical fog, you will come into contact with only about half a cubic inch of water, not enough to give you a decent drink. In consequence, clouds are not great reservoirs of water. Only about 0.035% of the Earth's fresh water is floating around above us at any moment. Depending on where it falls, the prognosis for a water molecule varies widely. If it lands in fertile soil, it'll be soaked up by plants or re-evaporated directly within hours or days. If it finds its way down to the groundwater, however, it may not see sunlight again for many years, thousands if it gets really deep. When you look at a lake, you are looking at a collection of molecules that have been there on average for about a decade. In the ocean, the residence time is thought to be more like a hundred years. Altogether, about 60% of water molecules in a rainfall are returned to the atmosphere within a day or two. Once evaporated, they spend no more than a week or so, Drury says 12 days, in the sky before falling again as rain. Evaporation is a swift process, as you can easily gauge by the fate of a puddle on a summer's day. Even something as large as the Mediterranean would dry out in a thousand years if it were not continually replenished. Such an event occurred a little under six million years ago and provoked what is known to science as the Messinian salinity crisis. What happened was that continental movement closed the Strait of Gibraltar. As the Mediterranean dried, its evaporated contents fell as freshwater rain into other seas, mildly diluting their saltiness, indeed making them just dilute enough to freeze over larger areas than normal. The enlarged area of ice bounced back more of the sun's heat and pushed Earth into an ice age. So at least the theory goes. What is certainly true, as far as we can tell, is that a little change in the Earth's dynamics can have repercussions beyond our imagining. Such an event, as we shall see a little further on, may even have created us. The real powerhouse of the planet's surface behavior are the oceans. Indeed, meteorologists increasingly treat oceans and atmosphere as a single system, which is why we must give them a little of our attention here. Water is marvelous at holding and transporting heat, unimaginably vast quantities of it. Every day, the Gulf Stream carries an amount of heat to Europe equivalent to the world's output of coal for ten years, which is why Britain and Ireland have such mild winters compared with Canada and Russia. But water also warms slowly, which is why lakes and swimming pools are cold even on the hottest days. For that reason, there tends to be a lag in the official astronomical start of a season and the actual feeling that that season has started. So spring may officially start in the Northern Hemisphere in March, but it doesn't feel like it in most places until April at the very earliest. The oceans are not one uniform mass of water. Their differences in temperature, salinity, depth, density, and so on have huge effects on how they move heat around, which in turn affects climate. The Atlantic, for instance, is saltier than the Pacific, and a good thing, too. The saltier a water is, the denser it is, and dense water sinks. Without its extra burden of salt, the Atlantic currents would proceed up to the Arctic, warming the North Pole, but depriving Europe of all that kindly warmth. The main agent of heat transfer on Earth is what is known as thermohaline circulation, which originates in slow, deep currents far below the surface, a process first detected by the scientist adventurer Count von Rumford in 1797. What happens is that surface waters, as they get to the vicinity of Europe, grow dense and sink to great depths and begin a slow trip back to the southern hemisphere. 
When they reach Antarctica, they are caught up in the Antarctic circumpolar current, where they are driven onward into the Pacific. The process is very slow. It can take 1,500 years for water to travel from the North Atlantic to the Mid-Pacific. But the volumes of heat and water they move are very considerable, and the influence on the climate is enormous. As for the question of how anyone could possibly figure out how long it takes a drop of water to get from one ocean to another, the answer is that scientists can measure compounds in the water, like chlorofluorocarbons, and work out how long it has been since they were last in the air. By comparing a lot of measurements from different depths and locations, they can reasonably chart the water's movement. Thermohaline circulation not only moves heat around, but also helps to stir up nutrients as the currents rise and fall, making greater volumes of the ocean habitable for fish and other marine creatures. Unfortunately, it appears the circulation may also be very sensitive to change. According to computer simulations, even a modest dilution of the ocean salt content, from increased melting of the Greenland ice sheet, for instance, could disrupt the cycle disastrously. The seas do one other great favor for us. They soak up tremendous volumes of carbon and provide a means for it to be safely locked away. One of the oddities of our solar system is that the sun burns about 25% more brightly now than when the solar system was young. This should have resulted in a much warmer Earth. Indeed, as the English geologist Aubrey Manning has put it, this colossal change should have had an absolutely catastrophic effect on the Earth, and yet it appears that our world has hardly been affected. So what keeps the planet stable and cool? Life does. Trillions upon trillions of tiny marine organisms that most of us have never heard of, foraminiferans and coccoliths and calcareous algae, capture atmospheric carbon in the form of carbon dioxide when it falls as rain and use it in combination with other things to make their tiny shells. By locking the carbon up in their shells, they keep it from being re-evaporated into the atmosphere, where it would build up dangerously as a greenhouse gas. Eventually, all the tiny foraminiferans and coccoliths and so on die and fall to the bottom of the sea, where they are compressed into limestone. It is remarkable when you behold an extraordinary natural feature like the White Cliffs of Dover in England, to reflect that it is made up almost entirely of tiny deceased marine organisms, but even more remarkable when you realize how much carbon they cumulatively sequester. A six-inch cube of Dover chalk will contain well over a thousand liters of compressed carbon dioxide that would otherwise be doing us no good at all. Altogether, there is about 20,000 times as much carbon locked away in the Earth's rocks as in the atmosphere. Eventually, much of that limestone will end up feeding volcanoes, and the carbon will return to the atmosphere and fall to the Earth in rain, which is why the whole is called the long-term carbon cycle. The process takes a very long time, about half a million years for a typical carbon atom, but in the absence of any other disturbance, it works remarkably well at keeping the climate stable. Unfortunately, human beings have a careless predilection for disrupting this cycle by putting lots of extra carbon into the atmosphere, whether the foraminiferans are ready for it or not. Since 1850, it has been estimated, we have lofted about 100 billion tons of extra carbon into the air, a total that increases by about 7 billion tons each year. Overall, that's not actually all that much. Nature, mostly through the belchings of volcanoes and the decay of plants, sends about 200 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year, nearly 30 times as much as we do with our cars and factories. But you have only to look at the haze that hangs over our cities, or the Grand Canyon, or even sometimes the White Cliffs of Dover, to see what a difference our contribution makes. We know from samples of very old ice that the natural level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that is, before we started inflating it with industrial activity, is about 280 parts per million. By 1958, when people in lab coats started to pay attention to it, it had risen to 315 parts per million. 
Today it is over 360 parts per million and rising by roughly one quarter of one percent a year. By the end of the 21st century, it is forecast to rise to about 560 parts per million. So far, the Earth's oceans and forests, which also pack away a lot of carbon, have managed to save us from ourselves. But as Peter Cox of the British Meteorological Office puts it, there is a critical threshold where the natural biosphere stops buffering us from the effects of our emissions and actually starts to amplify them. The fear is that there will be a very rapid increase in the Earth's warming. Unable to adapt, many trees and other plants would die, releasing their stores of carbon and adding to the problem. Such cycles have occasionally happened in the distant past, even without a human contribution. The good news is that even here, nature is quite wonderful. It is almost certain that eventually the carbon cycle would reassert itself and return the Earth to a situation of stability and happiness. The last time this happened... It took a mere 60,000 years. 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 Chapter 18. The Bounding Main. Imagine trying to live in a world dominated by dihydrogen oxide, a compound that has no taste or smell, and is so variable in its properties that it is generally benign, but at other times swiftly lethal. Depending on its state, it can scald you or freeze you. In the presence of certain organic molecules, it can form carbonic acid so nasty that they can strip the leaves from trees and eat the faces off statuary. In bulk, when agitated, it can strike with a fury that no human edifice could withstand. Even for those who have learned to live with it, it is an often murderous substance. We call it water. Water is everywhere. A potato is 80% water, a cow 74%, a bacterium 75%. A tomato at 95% is little but water. Even humans are 65% water, making us more liquid than solid by a margin of almost 2 to 1. Water is strange stuff. It is formless and transparent, and yet we long to be beside it. It has no taste, and yet we love the taste of it. We will travel great distances and pay small fortunes to see it in sunshine. And even though we know it is dangerous and drowns tens of thousands of people every year, we can't wait to frolic in it. Because water is so ubiquitous, we tend to overlook... What an extraordinary substance it is. Almost nothing about it can be used to make reliable predictions about the properties of other liquids, and vice versa. If you knew nothing of water and based your assumptions on the behavior of compounds most chemically akin to it, hydrogen selenide or hydrogen sulfide notably, you would expect it to boil at minus 93 degrees Celsius and to be a gas at room temperature. Most liquids, when chilled, contract by about 10%. Water does, too, but only down to a point. Once it is within whispering distance of freezing, it begins, perversely, beguilingly, extremely improbably, to expand. By the time it is a solid, it is almost a tenth more voluminous than it was before. Because it expands, ice floats on water an utterly bizarre property, according to John Gribben. If it lacked this splendid waywardness, ice would sink, and lakes and oceans would freeze from the bottom up. Without surface ice to hold heat in, the water's warmth would radiate away, leaving it even chillier and creating yet more ice. Soon even the oceans would freeze, and almost certainly stay that way for a very long time, probably forever. Hardly the conditions to nurture life. Thankfully for us, water seems unaware of the rules of chemistry or the laws of physics. Everyone knows that water's chemical formula is H2O, which means that it consists of one largish oxygen atom with two smaller hydrogen atoms attached to it. The hydrogen atoms cling fiercely to their oxygen host, 
but also make casual bonds with other water molecules. The nature of a water molecule means that it engages in a kind of dance with other water molecules, briefly pairing and then moving on, like the ever-changing partners in a quadrille, to use Robert Kunzig's nice phrase. A glass of water may not appear terribly lively, but every molecule in it is changing partners billions of times a second. That's why water molecules stick together, to form bodies like puddles and lakes, but not so tightly that they can't be easily separated, as when, for instance, you dive into a pool of them. At any given moment, only 15% of them are actually touching. In one sense, the bond is very strong. It is why water molecules can flow uphill when siphoned, and why water droplets on a car bonnet show such a singular determination to bead with their partners. It is also why water has surface tension. The molecules at the surface are attracted more powerfully to the like molecules beneath and beside them than to the air molecules above. This creates a sort of membrane, strong enough to support insects and skipping stones. It is what gives the sting to a belly flop. I hardly need to point out that we would be lost without it. Deprived of water, the human body rapidly falls apart. Within days, the lips vanish, as if amputated. The gums blacken, the nose withers to half its length, and the skin so contracts around the eyes as to prevent blinking, according to one account. Water is so vital to us that it is easy to overlook that all but the smallest fraction of the water on earth is poisonous to us, deadly poisonous, because of the salts within it. We need salt to live, but only in very small amounts, and sea water contains way more, about 70 times more salt, than we can safely metabolize. A typical liter of seawater will contain only about 2.5 teaspoons of common salt, the kind we sprinkle on food, but much larger amounts of other elements, compounds and other dissolved solids, which are collectively known as salts. The proportions of these salts and minerals in our tissues are uncannily similar to those in seawater. We sweat and cry seawater, as Margulis and Sagan have put it, but curiously, we cannot tolerate them as an input. Take a lot of salt into your body, and your metabolism very quickly goes into crisis. From every cell, water molecules rush off like so many volunteer firemen to try to dilute and carry off the sudden intake of salt. This leaves the cells dangerously short of the water they need to carry out their normal functions. They become, in a word, dehydrated. In extreme situations, Dehydration will lead to seizures, unconsciousness, and brain damage. Meanwhile, the overworked blood cells carry the salt to the kidneys, which eventually become overwhelmed and shut down. Without functioning kidneys, you die. That is why we don't drink seawater. There are 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water on Earth, and that is all we're ever going to get. The system is closed, practically speaking, Nothing can be added or subtracted. The water you drink has been around doing its job since the earth was young. By 3.8 billion years ago, the oceans had, at least more or less, achieved their present volumes. The water realm is known as the hydrosphere, and it is overwhelmingly oceanic. Ninety-seven percent of all the water on earth is in the seas the greater part of it in the Pacific, which is bigger than all the land masses put together. Altogether, the Pacific holds just over half of all the ocean water, 51.6%. The Atlantic has 23.6%, and the Indian Ocean 21.2%, leaving just 3.6% to be accounted for by all the other seas. The average depth of the ocean is 3.86 kilometers, with the Pacific on average about 300 meters deeper than the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Sixty percent of the planet's surface is ocean more than 1.6 kilometers deep. As Philip Ball notes, we would better call our planet not Earth, but water. Of the three percent of Earth's water that is fresh, most exists as ice sheets. Only the tiniest amount, 0.036 percent, is found in lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. 
and an even smaller part, just 0.001%, exists in clouds or as vapor. Nearly 90% of the planet's ice is in Antarctica, and most of the rest is in Greenland. Go to the South Pole, and you will be standing on over two miles of ice. At the North Pole, just 15 feet of it. Antarctica alone has six million cubic miles of ice, enough to raise the oceans by a height of 200 feet, if it all melted. But if all the water in the atmosphere fell as rain, evenly, everywhere, the oceans would deepen by only a couple of centimeters. Sea level, incidentally, is an almost entirely notional concept. Seas are not level at all. Tides, winds, the Coriolis force, and other effects alter water levels considerably from one ocean to another, and even within oceans. The Pacific is about a foot and a half higher along its western edge, a consequence of the centrifugal force created by the Earth's spin. Just as when you pull on a tub of water, the water tends to flow towards the other end, as if reluctant to come with you, so the eastward spin of Earth piles water up against the ocean's western margins. Considering the age-old importance of the seas to us, it is striking how long it took the world to take a scientific interest in them. Until well into the 19th century, most of what was known about the oceans was based on what washed ashore or came up in fishing nets, and nearly all that was written was based more on anecdote and supposition than on physical evidence. In the 1830s, the British naturalist Edward Forbes surveyed ocean beds throughout the Atlantic and Mediterranean and declared that there was no life at all in the seas below 600 meters. It seemed a reasonable assumption. There was no light at that depth, so no plant life, and the pressures of water at such depths were known to be extreme. So it came as something of a surprise when, in 1860, one of the first transatlantic telegraph cables was hauled up for repairs from more than three kilometers down and found to be thickly encrusted with corals, clams, and other living detritus. The first really organized investigation of the seas didn't come until 1872, when a joint expedition set up by the British Museum, the Royal Society, and the British government set forth from Portsmouth on a former warship called HMS Challenger. For three and a half years they sailed the world, sampling waters, netting fish, and hauling a dredge through sediments. It was evidently dreary work. Out of a complement of 240 scientists and crew, one in four jumped ship, and eight more died or went mad, driven to distraction by the mind-numbing routine of years of dredging in the words of the historian Samantha Weinberg. But they sailed across almost 70,000 nautical miles of sea, collected over 4,700 new species of marine organisms, gathered enough information to create a 50-volume report, which took 19 years to put together, and gave the world the name of a new scientific discipline, oceanography. They also discovered, by means of depth measurements, that there appeared to be submerged mountains in mid-Atlantic, prompting some excited observers to speculate that they had found the lost continent of Atlantis. Because the institutional world mostly ignored the seas, it fell to devoted and very occasional amateurs to tell us what was down there. Modern deep-water exploration begins with Charles William Beebe and Otis Barton in 1930. Although they were equal partners, the more colorful Beebe has always received far more written attention. Born in 1877 into a well-to-do family in New York City, Beebe studied zoology at Columbia University, then took a job as a bird keeper at the New York Zoological Society. Tiring of that, he decided to adopt the life of an adventurer, and for the next quarter century traveled extensively through Asia and South America with a succession of attractive female assistants whose jobs were inventively described as historian and technicist, or assistant in fish problems. He supported these endeavors with a succession of popular books with titles like Edge of the Jungle and Jungle Days, though he also produced some respectable books on wildlife and ornithology. In the mid-1920s, on a trip to the Galapagos Islands, he discovered the delights of dangling, 
as he described deep-sea diving. Soon afterwards, he teamed up with Barton, who came from an even wealthier family, had also attended Columbia and also longed for adventure. Although Beebe nearly always gets the credit, it was in fact Barton who designed the first bathysphere, from the Greek word for deep, and funded the $12,000 cost of its construction. It was a tiny and necessarily robust chamber, made of cast iron, 1.5 inches thick, and with two small portholes containing quartz blocks three inches thick. It held two men, but only if they were prepared to become extremely well acquainted. Even by the standards of the age, the technology was unsophisticated. The sphere had no maneuverability. It simply hung on the end of a long cable. And only the most primitive breathing system, to neutralize their own carbon dioxide, they set out open cans of soda lime. And to absorb moisture, they opened a small tub of calcium chloride, over which they sometimes waved palm fronds to encourage chemical reactions. But the nameless little bathysphere did the job it was intended to do. On the first dive in June 1930 in the Bahamas, Barton and Beebe set a world record by descending to 183 meters. By 1934, they had pushed the record to over 900 meters, where it would stay until after the Second World War. Barton was confident the device was safe to a depth of about 1,400 meters, though the strain on every bolt and rivet was audibly evident with every fathom they descended. At any depth, it was brave and risky work. At 900 meters, their little porthole was subjected to 19 tons of pressure per square inch. Should they pass the structure's limits of tolerance, death at such a depth would have been instantaneous, as Beebe never failed to observe in his many books, articles, and radio broadcasts. Their main concern, however, was that the shipboard winch, straining to hold on to a metal ball and two tons of steel cable, would snap and send the two men plunging to the sea floor. In such an event, nothing could have saved them. The one thing their descents didn't produce was a great deal of worthwhile science. Although they encountered many creatures that had not been seen before, the limits of visibility and the fact that neither of the intrepid aquanauts was a trained oceanographer meant they weren't often able to describe their findings in the kind of detail that real scientists craved. The sphere didn't carry an external light, merely a 250-watt bulb they could hold up to the window, but the water below 150 meters was practically impenetrable anyway, and they were peering into it through three inches of quartz, so anything they hoped to view would have to be nearly as interested in them as they were in it. About all they could report, in consequence, was that there were a lot of strange things down there. On one dive in 1934, Beebe was startled to spy a giant serpent, more than twenty feet long and very wide. It passed too swiftly to be more than a shadow. Whatever it was, nothing like it has been seen by anyone since. Because of such vagueness, their reports were generally ignored by academics. After their record-breaking descent of 1934, Beebe lost interest in diving and moved on to other adventures, but Barton persevered. To his credit, Beebe always told anyone who asked that Barton was the real brains behind the enterprise, but Barton seemed unable to step from the shadows. He, too, wrote thrilling accounts of their underwater adventures, and even starred in a Hollywood movie called Titans of the Deep, featuring a bathysphere and many exciting and largely fictionalized encounters with aggressive giant squid and the like. He even advertised camel cigarettes. They don't give me jittery nerves. In 1948, he increased the depth record by 50 percent, with a dive to 1,370 meters in the Pacific Ocean near California. But the world seemed determined to overlook him. One newspaper reviewer of Titans of the Deep actually thought the star of the film was Beebe. Nowadays, Barton is lucky to get a mention. At all events, he was about to be comprehensively eclipsed by a father and son team from Switzerland, Auguste and Jacques Picard, who were designing a new type of probe called a bathyscaphe, meaning deep boat. Christened Trieste, after the Italian city in which it was built, the new device maneuvered independently, though it did little more than just go up and down. 
On one of its early dives in early 1954, it descended to below 4,000 meters, nearly three times Barton's record-breaking dive of six years earlier. But deep-sea dives required a great deal of costly support, and the P-cars were gradually going broke. In 1958, they did a deal with the U.S. Navy, which gave the Navy ownership but left them in control. Now flush with funds, the Picars rebuilt the vessel, giving it walls nearly 13 centimeters thick and shrinking the windows to just 5 centimeters in diameter, little more than peepholes. But it was now strong enough to withstand truly enormous pressures. And in January 1960, Jacques Picard and Lieutenant Don Walsh of the U.S. Navy sank slowly to the bottom of the ocean's deepest canyon, the Mariana Trench some 400 kilometers off Guam in the western Pacific, and discovered not incidentally by Harry Hess with his fathometer. It took just under four hours to fall 10,918 meters, or almost seven miles. Although the pressure at that depth was nearly 17,000 pounds per square inch, they noticed with surprise that they disturbed a bottom-dwelling flatfish just as they touched down. They had no facilities for taking photographs, so there is no visual record of the event. After just twenty minutes, at the world's deepest point, they returned to the surface. It was the only occasion in which human beings have gone so deep. Forty years later, the question that naturally occurs is, why has no one gone back since? To begin with, further dives were vigorously opposed by Vice Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, a man with a lively temperament, forceful views, and, most pertinently, control of the departmental checkbook. He thought underwater exploration a waste of resources, and pointed out that the Navy was not a research institute. The nation, moreover, was about to become fully preoccupied with space travel, and the quest to send a man to the moon, which made deep-sea investigations seem unimportant and rather old-fashioned. But the decisive consideration is that the Trieste descent didn't actually achieve much. As a Navy official explained years later, we didn't learn a hell of a lot from it, other than that we could do it. Why do it again? It was, in short, a long way to go to find a flatfish, and expensive, too. Repeating the exercise today, it has been estimated, would cost at least $100 million. When underwater researchers realized that the Navy had no intention of pursuing a promised exploration program, there was a pained outcry. Partly to placate its critics, the Navy provided funding for a more advanced submersible to be operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution of Massachusetts. Called Alvin, in somewhat contracted honor of the oceanographer Alan C. Vine, it would be a fully maneuverable mini-submarine though it wouldn't go anywhere near as deep as Trieste. There was just one problem. The designers couldn't find anyone willing to build it. According to William J. Broad in The Universe Below, no big company like General Dynamics, which made submarines for the Navy, wanted to take on a project disparaged by both the Bureau of Ships and Admiral Rickover, the gods of naval patronage. Eventually, not to say improbably, Alvin was constructed by General Mills, the food company, at a factory where it made the machines to produce breakfast cereals. As for what else was down there, people really had very little idea. Well into the 1950s, the best maps available to oceanographers were overwhelmingly based on a little detail from scattered surveys going back to 1929, grafted onto, essentially, an ocean of guesswork. The U.S. Navy had excellent charts with which to guide submarines through canyons and around guillots, but it didn't wish such information to fall into Soviet hands, so it kept its knowledge classified. Academics, therefore, had to make do with sketchy and antiquated surveys or rely on hopeful surmise. Even today, our knowledge of the ocean floors remains remarkably low resolution. If you look at the moon with a standard backyard telescope, you will see substantial craters, Fracastorius, Blancanus, Zach, Planck, and many others familiar to any lunar scientist that would be unknown if they were on our own ocean floors. 
We have better maps of Mars than we do of our own seabeds. At the surface level, investigative techniques have also been a trifle ad hoc. In 1994, 34,000 ice hockey gloves were swept overboard from a Korean cargo ship during a storm in the Pacific. The gloves washed up all over, from Vancouver to Vietnam, helping oceanographers to trace currents more accurately than they ever had before. Today, Alvin is nearly 40 years old, but it remains the world's premier research vessel. There are still no submersibles that can go anywhere near the depth of the Mariana Trench, and only five, including Alvin, that can reach the depths of the abyssal plain, the deep ocean floor, which covers more than half the planet's surface. A typical submersible costs about $25,000 a day to operate, so they are hardly dropped into the water on a whim, still less put to sea in the hope that they will randomly stumble on something of interest. It's rather as if our first-hand experience of the surface world were based on the work of five guys exploring on garden tractors after dark. According to Robert Kunzig, humans may have scrutinized perhaps a millionth or a billionth of the sea's darkness, maybe less, maybe much less. But oceanographers are nothing if not industrious, and they have made several important discoveries with their limited resources including, in 1977, one of the most important and startling biological discoveries of the 20th century. In that year, Alvin found teeming colonies of large organisms living on and around deep sea vents off the Galapagos Islands, tube worms over three meters long, clams 30 centimeters wide, shrimps and mussels in profusion, wriggling spaghetti worms. They all owed their existence to vast colonies of bacteria that were deriving their energy and sustenance from hydrogen sulfides, compounds profoundly toxic to surface creatures, that were pouring steadily from the vents. It was a world independent of sunlight, oxygen, or anything else normally associated with life. This was a living system based not on photosynthesis, but on chemosynthesis, an arrangement that biologists would have dismissed as preposterous had anyone been imaginative enough to suggest it. Huge amounts of heat and energy are released by these vents. Two dozen of them together will produce as much energy as a large power station, and the range of temperatures around them is enormous. The temperature at the point of outflow can be as much as 400 degrees Celsius, while a couple of meters away the water may be only two or three degrees above freezing. A type of worm called alvinolids were found living right on the margins, with a water temperature 78 degrees Celsius warmer at their heads than at their tails. Before this, it had been thought that no complex organisms could survive in water warmer than about 54 degrees Celsius, and here was one that was surviving warmer temperatures than that and extreme cold to boot. The discovery transformed our understanding of the requirements for life. It also answered one of the great puzzles of oceanography, something that many of us didn't realize was a puzzle, namely, why the oceans don't grow saltier with time. At the risk of stating the obvious, there is a lot of salt in the sea, enough to bury every bit of land on the planet to a depth of about 150 meters. It had been known for centuries that rivers carry minerals to the sea, and that these minerals combine with ions in the ocean water to form salts. So far, no problem. But what was puzzling was that the salinity levels of the sea were stable. Millions of gallons of fresh water evaporate from the ocean daily, leaving all their salts behind, so, logically... The seas ought to grow more salty with the passing years, but they don't. Something takes an amount of salt out of the water equivalent to the amount being put in. For a very long time, no one could figure out what could be responsible for this. Alvin's discovery of the deep sea vents provided the answer. Geophysicists realized that the vents were acting much like the filters in a fish tank. As water is taken down into the Earth's crust, salts are stripped from it, and eventually clean water is blown out again through the chimney stacks. The process is not swift, 
It can take up to ten million years to clean an ocean. But if you're not in a hurry, it is marvelously efficient. Perhaps nothing speaks more clearly of our psychological remoteness from the ocean depths than that the main expressed goal for oceanographers during International Geophysical Year 1957-8 to was to study the use of ocean depths for the dumping of radioactive wastes. This wasn't a secret assignment, you understand, but a proud public boast. In fact, though it wasn't much publicized, by 1957-8 to the dumping of radioactive wastes had already been going on with a certain appalling vigor for over a decade. Since 1946, the United States had been ferrying 55-gallon drums of radioactive gunk out to the Falerone Islands, some 50 kilometers off the California coast near San Francisco, where it simply threw them overboard. It was all quite extraordinarily sloppy. Most of the drums were exactly the sort you see rusting behind petrol stations or standing outside factories, with no protective linings of any type. When they failed to sink, which was usually, Navy gunners riddled them with bullets to let water in, and, of course, plutonium, uranium, and strontium out. Before this dumping was halted in the 1990s, the United States had dumped many hundreds of thousands of drums into about 50 ocean sites, almost 50,000 of them in the Falerones alone. But the United States was by no means alone. Among the other enthusiastic dumpers were Russia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and nearly all the nations of Europe. And what effect might all this have had on life beneath the seas? Well, little, we hope, but we actually have no idea. We are astoundingly, sumptuously, radiantly ignorant of life beneath the seas. Even the most substantial ocean creatures are often remarkably little known to us, including the most mighty of them all, the great blue whale, a creature of such leviathan proportions that, to quote David Attenborough, its tongue weighs as much as an elephant, its heart is the size of a car, and some of its blood vessels are so wide that you could swim down them. It is the most gargantuan beast the earth has yet produced, bigger even than the most cumbrous dinosaurs. Yet the lives of blue whales are largely a mystery to us. Much of the time we have no idea where they are, where they go to breed, for instance, or what routes they follow to get there. What little we know of them comes almost entirely from eavesdropping on their songs, but even these are a mystery. Blue whales will sometimes break off a song, then pick it up again at exactly the same spot six months later. Sometimes they strike up with a new song, which no member can have heard before, but which each already knows. How they do this, and why, are not remotely understood. And these are animals that must routinely come to the surface to breathe. For animals that need never surface, obscurity can be even more tantalizing. Consider our knowledge of the fabled giant squid. Though nothing on the scale of the blue whale, it is a decidedly substantial animal, with eyes the size of soccer balls and trailing tentacles that can reach lengths of 18 meters. It weighs nearly a ton and is Earth's largest invertebrate. If you dumped one in a small swimming pool, there wouldn't be much room for anything else. Yet no scientist, no person, as far as we know, has ever seen a giant squid alive. Zoologists have devoted careers to trying to capture or just glimpse living giant squid, and have always failed. They are known mostly from being washed up on beaches, particularly for unknown reasons, the beaches of the South Island of New Zealand. They must exist in large numbers because they form a central part of the sperm whale's diet, and sperm whales take a lot of feeding. According to one estimate, there could be as many as 30 million species of animals living in the sea, most still undiscovered. The first hint of how truly abundant life is in the deep seas didn't come until as recently as the 1960s, with the invention of the epibenthic sled, a dredging device that captures organisms not just on and near the sea floor, but also buried in the sediments beneath. In a single one-hour trawl along the continental shelf at a depth of about 1.5 kilometers, 
Woods Hole oceanographers Howard Sandler and Robert Hessler netted over 25,000 creatures, worms, starfish, sea cucumbers and the like, representing 365 species. Even at a depth of nearly five kilometers, they found some 3,700 creatures representing almost 200 species of organism. But the dredge could capture only those things that were too slow or stupid to get out of the way. In the late 1960s, a marine biologist named John Isaacs had the idea of lowering a camera with bait attached to it, and found still more, in particular dense swarms of writhing hagfish, a primitive eel-like creature, as well as darting shoals of grenadier fish. Where a good food source is suddenly available, for instance when a whale dies and sinks to the bottom, as many as 390 species of marine creature have been found dining off it. Intriguingly, many of these creatures were found to have come from vents up to 1,600 kilometers away. These included such types as mussels and clams, which are hardly known as great travelers. It is now thought that the larvae of certain organisms may drift through the water until, by some unknown chemical means, they detect that they have arrived at a food opportunity and fall onto it. So why, if the seas are so vast, do we so easily overtax them? Well, to begin with, the world's seas are not uniformly bounteous. Altogether, less than a tenth of the ocean is considered naturally productive. Most aquatic species like to be in shallow waters, where there are warmth and light and an abundance of organic matter to prime the food chain. Coral reefs, for instance, constitute well under 1% of the ocean's space, but are home to about 25% of its fish. Elsewhere, the oceans aren't nearly so rich. Take Australia. With 36,735 kilometers of coastline, and over 23 million square kilometers of territorial waters, it has more sea lapping its shores than any other country. Yet, as Tim Flannery notes, it doesn't even make it into the top 50 among fishing nations. Indeed, Australia is a large net importer of seafood. This is because much of Australia's water is, like much of Australia itself, essentially desert. A notable exception is the Great Barrier Reef off Queensland, which is sumptuously fecund. Because the soil is poor, it produces practically no nutrients in its runoffs. Even where life thrives, it is often extremely sensitive to disturbance. In the 1970s, fishermen from Australia, and to a lesser extent New Zealand, discovered shoals of a little-known fish living at a depth of about 800 meters on their continental shelves. They were known as Orange Ruffy. They were delicious, and they existed in huge numbers. In no time at all, fishing fleets were hauling in 40,000 tons of Ruffy a year. Then, marine biologists made some alarming discoveries. Ruffy are extremely long-lived and slow-maturing. Some may be 150 years old. Any Ruffy you have eaten may well have been born when Victoria was queen. Ruffy have adopted this exceedingly unhurried lifestyle because the waters they live in are so resource poor. In such waters, some fish spawn just once in a lifetime. Clearly, these are populations that cannot stand a great deal of disturbance. Unfortunately, by the time this was realized, the stocks had been severely depleted. Even with good management, it will be decades before the populations recover, if they ever do. Elsewhere, however, the misuse of the oceans has been more wanton than inadvertent. Many fishermen fin sharks, that is, slice their fins off, then dump them back into the water to die. In 1998, shark fins sold in the Far East for over $110 a kilo, and a bowl of shark fin soup retailed in Tokyo for $100. The World Wildlife Fund estimated in 1994 that the number of sharks killed each year was between 40 million and 70 million. As of 1995, some 37,000 industrial-sized fishing ships, plus about a million smaller boats, were between them taking twice as many fish from the sea as they had just 25 years earlier. Trawlers are sometimes now as big as cruise ships, 
and haul behind them nets big enough to hold a dozen jumbo jets. Some even use spotter planes to locate shoals of fish from the air. It is estimated that about a quarter of every fishing net hauled up contains bycatch, fish that can't be landed because they are too small or of the wrong type or caught in the wrong season. As one observer told The Economist, we're still in the dark ages. We just drop a net down and see what comes up. Perhaps as much as 22 million tons of such unwanted fish are dumped back in the sea each year, mostly in the form of corpses. For every kilogram of shrimp harvested, about four kilograms of fish and other marine creatures are destroyed. Large areas of the North Sea floor are dragged clean by beam trawlers as many as seven times a year, a degree of disturbance that no ecosystem can withstand. At least two-thirds of species in the North Sea, by many estimates, are being overfished. Across the Atlantic, things are no better. Halibut once abounded in such numbers off New England that individual boats could land 20,000 pounds of it in a day. Now halibut is all but extinct off the northeast coast of America. Nothing, however, compares with the fate of cod. In the late 15th century, the explorer John Cabot found cod in incredible numbers on North America's eastern banks, shallow areas of water popular with bottom-feeding fish like cod. The fish existed in such numbers, an astonished Cabot reported, that sailors scooped them up in baskets. Some of the banks were vast. George's banks off Massachusetts is bigger than the state it abuts. The Grand Banks off Newfoundland is bigger still, and for centuries was always dense with cod. They were thought to be inexhaustible. Of course, they were anything but. By 1960, the number of spawning cod in the North Atlantic had fallen to an estimated 1.6 million tons. By 1990, this had sunk to 22,000 tons. In commercial terms, the cod were extinct. Fisherman, wrote Mark Kurlansky in his fascinating history, Cod had caught them all. The cod may have lost the Western Atlantic forever. In 1992, cod fishing was stopped altogether on the Grand Banks. But as of autumn 2002, according to a report in Nature, stocks had still not staged a comeback. Kurlansky notes that the fish of fish fillets or fish fingers was originally cod, but then was replaced by haddock, then by redfish, and lately by Pacific pollock. These days, he notes dryly, fish is whatever is left. Much the same can be said of many other seafoods. In the New England fisheries off Rhode Island, it was once routine to haul in lobsters weighing nine kilograms. Sometimes they reached over 13 kilos. Left unmolested, lobsters can live for decades, as much as 70 years, it is thought. But they never stop growing. Nowadays, few lobsters weigh more than one kilogram on capture. Biologists, according to the New York Times, estimate that 90% of lobsters are caught within a year after they reach the legal minimum size at about age six. Despite declining catches, New England fishermen continue to receive state and federal tax incentives that encourage them, in some cases all but compel them, to acquire bigger boats and to harvest the seas more intensively. Today, the fishermen of Massachusetts are reduced to fishing the hideous hagfish, for which there is a slight market in the Far East, but even their numbers are now falling. We are remarkably ignorant of the dynamics that rule life in the sea. While marine life is poorer than it ought to be in areas that have been overfished, in some naturally impoverished waters there is far more life than there ought to be. The southern oceans around Antarctica produce only about 3% of the world's phytoplankton, far too little, it would seem, to support a complex ecosystem, and yet they do. Crab-eater seals are not a species of animal that most of us have heard of, but they may actually be the second most numerous large species of animal on Earth after humans. As many as 15 million of them may live on the pack ice around Antarctica. There are also perhaps two million Weddell seals, at least half a million emperor penguins, and maybe as many as four million Adelie penguins. The food chain is thus hopelessly top-heavy, but somehow it works. 
Remarkably, no one knows how. All this is a very roundabout way of making the point that we know very little about Earth's biggest system. But then, as we shall see, once you start talking about life, there is a great deal we don't know, not least how it got going in the first place. Chapter 19 The Rise of Life In 1953, Stanley Miller, a graduate student at the University of Chicago, took two flasks, one containing a little water to represent a primeval ocean, the other holding a mixture of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide gases to represent the Earth's early atmosphere, connected them with rubber tubes, and introduced some electrical sparks as a stand-in for lightning. After a few days, the water in the flasks had turned green and yellow in a hearty broth of amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, and other organic compounds. If God didn't do it this way, observed Miller's delighted supervisor, the Nobel laureate Harold Urey, he missed a good bet. Press reports of the time made it sound as if about all that was needed now was for somebody to give the flasks a good shake and life would crawl out. As time has shown, it wasn't nearly so simple. Despite half a century of further study, we are no nearer to synthesizing life today than we were in 1953, and much further away from thinking we can. Scientists are now pretty certain that the early atmosphere was nothing like as primed for development as Miller and Urey's gaseous stew, but rather was a much less reactive blend of nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Repeating Miller's experiments with these more challenging inputs has so far produced only one fairly primitive amino acid. At all events, creating amino acids is not really the problem. The problem is proteins. Proteins are what you get when you string amino acids together, and we need a lot of them. No one really knows, but there may be as many as a million types of protein in the human body, and each one is a little miracle. By all the laws of probability, proteins shouldn't exist. To make a protein, you need to assemble amino acids, which I am obliged by long tradition to refer to here as the building blocks of life, in a particular order, in much the same way that you assemble letters in a particular order to spell a word. The problem is that words in the amino acid alphabet are often exceedingly long. To spell collagen, the name of a common type of protein, you need to arrange eight letters in the right order. To make collagen, you need to arrange 1,055 amino acids in precisely the right sequence. But, and here's an obvious but crucial point, you don't make it. It makes itself, spontaneously, without direction. And this is where the unlikelihoods come in. The chances of a 1,055-sequence molecule like collagen spontaneously self-assembling are frankly nil. It just isn't going to happen. To grasp what a long shot its existence is, visualize a standard Las Vegas slot machine, but broaden greatly to about 27 meters, to be precise, to accommodate 1,055 spinning wheels instead of the usual three or four, and with twenty symbols on each wheel, one for each common amino acid. How long would you have to pull the handle before all 1,055 symbols came up in the right order? Effectively, forever. Even if you reduced the number of spinning wheels to 200, which is actually a more typical number of amino acids for a protein, the odds against all 200 coming up in a prescribed sequence are one in ten to the two hundred and sixtieth. That is a one followed by two hundred and sixty zeros. That in itself is a larger number than all the atoms in the universe. Proteins, in short, are complex entities. Hemoglobin is only one hundred and forty-six amino acids long, a runt by protein standards. Yet even it offers 10 to the 190th possible amino acid combinations, 
which is why it took the Cambridge University chemist Max Perutz 23 years, a career, more or less, to unravel it. For random events to produce even a single protein would seem a stunning improbability, like a whirlwind spinning through a junkyard and leaving behind a fully assembled jumbo jet in the colorful simile of the astronomer Fred Hoyle. Yet we are talking about several hundred thousand types of protein, perhaps a million, each unique, and each, as far as we know, vital to the maintenance of a sound and happy you. And it goes on from there. To be of use, a protein must not only assemble amino acids in the right sequence, it must then engage in a kind of chemical origami and fold itself into a very specific shape. Even having achieved this structural complexity, a protein is no good to you if it can't reproduce itself, and proteins can't. For this, you need DNA. DNA is a whiz at replicating. It can make a copy of itself in seconds, but can do virtually nothing else. So we have a paradoxical situation. Proteins can't exist without DNA, and DNA has no purpose without proteins. Are we to assume, then, that they arose simultaneously with the purpose of supporting each other? If so, wow! And there is more still. DNA, proteins, and the other components of life couldn't prosper without some sort of membrane to contain them. No atom or molecule has ever achieved life independently. Pluck any atom from your body, and it is no more alive than is a grain of sand. It is only when they come together within the nurturing refuge of a cell that these diverse materials can take part in the amazing dance that we call life. Without the cell, they are nothing more than interesting chemicals. But without the chemicals, the cell has no purpose. As Davies puts it, if everything needs everything else, how did the community of molecules ever arise in the first place? It is rather as if all the ingredients in your kitchen somehow got together and baked themselves into a cake, but a cake that could, moreover, divide when necessary to produce more cakes. It is little wonder that we call it the miracle of life. It is also little wonder that we have barely begun to understand it. So what accounts for all this wondrous complexity? Well, one possibility is that perhaps it isn't quite, not quite, so wondrous as at first it seems. Take those amazingly improbable proteins. The wonder we see in their assembly comes in assuming that they arrived on the scene fully formed. But what if the protein chains didn't assemble all at once? What if, in the great slot machine of creation, some of the wheels could be held? as a gambler might hold a number of promising cherries. What if, in other words, proteins didn't suddenly burst into being, but evolved? Imagine if you took all the components that make up a human being, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on, and put them in a container with some water, gave it a vigorous stir, and outstepped a completed person. That would be amazing! Well, that's essentially what Hoyle and the others, including many ardent creationists, argue when they suggest that proteins spontaneously formed all at once. They didn't. They can't have. As Richard Dawkins argues in The Blind Watchmaker, there must have been some kind of cumulative selection process that allowed amino acids to assemble in chunks. Perhaps two or three amino acids linked up for some simple purpose— and then after a time bumped into some other similar small cluster, and in so doing discovered some additional improvement. Chemical reactions of the sort associated with life are actually something of a commonplace. It may be beyond us to cook them up in a lab, a la Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, but the universe does it readily enough. Lots of molecules in nature get together to form long chains called polymers. Sugars constantly assemble to form starches. Crystals can do a number of lifelike things, replicate, respond to environmental stimuli, take on a patterned complexity. They've never achieved life itself, of course, but they demonstrate repeatedly that complexity is a natural, spontaneous, entirely reliable event. There may or may not be a great deal of life in the universe at large, but there is no shortage of ordered self-assembly in everything from the transfixing symmetry of snowflakes 
to the comely rings of Saturn. So powerful is this natural impulse to assemble that many scientists now believe that life may be more inevitable than we think, that it is, in the words of the Belgian biochemist and Nobel laureate Christian de Duve, an obligatory manifestation of matter bound to arise wherever conditions are appropriate. De Duve thought it likely that such conditions would be encountered perhaps a million times in every galaxy. Certainly there is nothing terribly exotic in the chemicals that animate us. If you wish to create another living object, whether a goldfish or a head of lattice or a human being, you would need really only four principal elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, plus small amounts of a few others, principally sulfur, phosphorus, calcium, and iron. Put these together in three dozen or so combinations to form some sugars, acids, and other basic compounds, and you can build anything that lives. As Dawkins notes, there is nothing special about the substances from which living things are made. Living things are collections of molecules like everything else. The bottom line is that life is amazing and gratifying, perhaps even miraculous, but hardly impossible, as we repeatedly attest with our own modest existences. To be sure, many of the fine details of life's beginnings remain pretty imponderable. Every scenario you have ever read concerning the conditions necessary for life involves water, from the warm little pond where Darwin supposed life began to the bubbling sea vents that are now the most popular candidates for life's beginnings. But all this overlooks the fact that to turn monomers into polymers, which is to say to begin to create proteins, involves a type of reaction known to biology as dehydration linkages. As one leading biology text puts it, with perhaps just a tiny hint of discomfort, researchers agree that such reactions would not have been energetically favorable in the primitive sea, or indeed in any aqueous medium, because of the mass action law. It is a little like putting sugar in a glass of water and having it become a cube. It shouldn't happen. But somehow in nature it does. The actual chemistry of all this is a little arcane for our purposes here, but it is enough to know that if you make monomers wet, they don't turn into polymers except when creating life on the earth. How and why it happens then and not otherwise is one of biology's great unanswered questions. One of the biggest surprises in the earth sciences in recent decades was discovering just how early in Earth's history life arose. Well into the 1950s, it was thought that life was less than 600 million years old. By the 1970s, a few adventurous souls felt that maybe it went back 2.5 billion years. But the present date of 3.85 billion years is stunningly early. The Earth's surface didn't become solid until about 3.9 billion years ago. We can only infer from this rapidity that it is not difficult for life of bacterial grade to evolve on planets with appropriate conditions, Stephen Jay Gould observed in the New York Times in 1996. Or, as he put it elsewhere, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that life, arising as soon as it could, was chemically destined to be. Life emerged so swiftly, in fact, that some authorities think it must have had help perhaps a good deal of help. The idea that earthly life might have arrived from space has a surprisingly long and even occasionally distinguished history. The great Lord Kelvin himself raised the possibility as long ago as 1871 at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, when he suggested that the germs of life might have been brought to the earth by some meteorite. But it remained little more than a fringe notion until one Sunday in September 1969, when tens of thousands of Australians were startled by a series of sonic booms and the sight of a fireball streaking from east to west across the sky. The fireball made a strange crackling sound as it passed and left behind a smell that some likened to methylated spirits and others described as just awful. The fireball exploded above Murchison, a town of 600 people in the Goulburn Valley north of Melbourne, 
and came raining down in chunks, some weighing over five kilograms. Fortunately, no one was hurt. The meteorite was of a rare type known as a carbonaceous chondrite, and the townspeople helpfully collected and brought in some ninety kilograms of it. The timing could hardly have been better. Less than two months earlier, the Apollo 11 astronauts had returned to Earth with a bag full of lunar rocks, so labs throughout the world were geared up, indeed clamoring, for rocks of extraterrestrial origin. The Murchison meteorite was found to be 4.5 billion years old, and it was studded with amino acids, 74 types in all, eight of which are involved in the formation of earthly proteins. In late 2001, more than 30 years after it crashed, a team at the Ames Research Center in California announced that the Murchison rock also contained complex strings of sugars called polyols, which had not been found off the Earth before. A few other carbonaceous chondrites have strayed into the Earth's path since 1969. One that landed near Tagish Lake in Canada's Yukon in January 2000 was seen over large parts of North America, and they have likewise confirmed that the universe is actually rich in organic compounds. Halley's Comet, it is now thought, is about 25% organic molecules. Get enough of those crashing into a suitable place, Earth, for instance, and you have the basic elements you need for life. There are two problems with notions of panspermia, as extraterrestrial theories are known. The first is that it doesn't answer any questions about how life arose, but merely moves responsibility for it elsewhere. The other is that panspermia tends sometimes to excite even the most respectable adherents to levels of speculation that can be safely called imprudent. Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, and his colleague Leslie Orgel, have suggested that Earth was deliberately seeded with life by intelligent aliens, an idea that Gribben calls at the very fringe of scientific respectability, or, put another way, a notion that would be considered wildly lunatic were it voiced by anyone other than a Nobel laureate. Fred Hoyle and his colleague Chandra Wickram Singh further eroded enthusiasm for panspermia by suggesting, as noted in Chapter 3, that outer space brought us not only life, but also many diseases such as flu and bubonic plague, ideas that were easily disproved by biochemists. Whatever prompted life to begin, it happened just once. That is the most extraordinary fact in biology, perhaps the most extraordinary fact we know. Everything that has ever lived, plant or animal, dates its beginnings from the same primordial twitch. At some point in an unimaginably distant past, some little bag of chemicals fidgeted to life. It absorbed some nutrients, gently pulsed, had a brief existence. This much may have happened before, perhaps many times. But this ancestral packet did something additional and extraordinary. It cleaved itself and produced an heir. A tiny bundle of genetic material passed from one living entity to another and has never stopped moving since. It was the moment of creation for us all. Biologists sometimes call it the big birth. Wherever you go in the world, whatever animal, plant, bug, or blob you look at, if it is alive, it will use the same dictionary and know the same code. All life is one, says Matt Ridley. We are all the result of a single genetic trick handed down from generation to generation over nearly four billion years, to such an extent that you can take a fragment of human genetic instruction and patch it into a faulty yeast cell, and the yeast cell will put it to work as if it were its own. In a very real sense, it is its own. The dawn of life, or something very like it, sits on a shelf in the office of a friendly isotope geochemist named Victoria Bennett in the Earth Sciences Building of the Australian National University in Canberra. An American, Ms. Bennett came to the ANU from California on a two-year contract in 1989 and has been there ever since. When I visited her in late 2001, she handed me a modestly hefty hunk of rock, 
composed of thin, alternating stripes of white quartz and a gray-green material called clinopyroxene. The rock came from Achelia Island in Greenland, where unusually ancient rocks were found in 1997. The rocks are 3.85 billion years old and represent the oldest marine sediments ever found. We can't be certain that what you were holding once contained living organisms because you'd have to pulverize it to find out, Bennett told me. But it comes from the same deposit where the oldest life was excavated, so it probably had life in it. Nor would you find actual fossilized microbes, however carefully you searched. Any simple organisms, alas, would have been baked away by the processes that turned ocean mud to stone. Instead... What we would see if we crunched up the rock and examined it microscopically would be the chemical residues that the organisms left behind. Carbon isotopes and a type of phosphate called apatite, which together provide strong evidence that the rock once contained colonies of living things. We can only guess what the organism might have looked like, Bennett said. It was probably about as basic as life can get. But it was life nonetheless. It lived. It propagated. And eventually, it led to us. If you are into very old rocks, and Ms. Bennett indubitably is, the ANU has long been a prime place to be. This is largely thanks to the ingenuity of a man named Bill Comston, who was now retired, but in the 1970s built the world's first sensitive, high-resolution ion microprobe, or shrimp as it is more affectionately known from its initial letters. This is a machine that measures the decay rate of uranium in tiny minerals called zircons. Zircons appear in most rocks, apart from basalts, and are extremely durable, surviving every natural process but subduction. Most of the Earth's crust has been slipped back into the interior at some point, but just occasionally, in Western Australia and Greenland, for example, Geologists have found outcrops of rock that have remained always at the surface. Comston's machine allowed such rocks to be dated with unparalleled precision. The prototype shrimp was built and machined in the Earth Sciences Department's own workshops and looked like something that had been built from spare parts on a budget, but it worked great. On its first formal test in 1982, it dated the oldest thing ever found a 4.3-billion-year-old rock from Western Australia. It caused quite a stir at the time, Bennett told me, to find something so important so quickly with brand-new technology. She took me down the hall to see the current model, Shrimp 2. It was a big, heavy piece of stainless steel apparatus, perhaps 3.5 meters long and 1.5 meters high, and as solidly built as a deep-sea probe. At a console in front of it, keeping an eye on ever-changing strings of figures on a screen, was a man named Bob from Canterbury University in New Zealand. He had been there since 4 a.m., he told me. It was just after 9 a.m., and Bob had the machine until noon. Shrimp 2 runs 24 hours a day. There are that many rocks to date. Ask a pair of geochemists how something like this works, and they will start talking about isotopic abundances and ionization levels with an enthusiasm that is more endearing than fathomable. The upshot of it is, however, that the machine, by bombarding a sample of rock with streams of charged atoms, is able to detect subtle differences in the amounts of lead and uranium in the zircon samples, by which means the age of rocks can be accurately adduced. Bob told me that it takes about 17 minutes to read one zircon, and it is necessary to read dozens from each rock to make the data reliable. In practice, the process seemed to involve about the same level of scattered activity and about as much stimulation as a trip to a laundrette. Bob seemed very happy, however, but then people from New Zealand very generally do. The Earth Sciences compound was an odd combination of things part office, part lab, part machine shed. We used to build everything here, she said. We even had our own glass blower, but he's retired. But we still have two full-time rock crushers. She caught my look of mild surprise. 
We get through a lot of rocks, and they have to be very carefully prepared. You have to make sure there is no contamination from previous samples, no dust or anything. It's quite a meticulous process. She showed me the rock-crushing machines, which were indeed pristine, though the rock-crushers had apparently gone for coffee. Beside the machines were large boxes containing rocks of all shapes and sizes. They do indeed get through a lot of rocks at the ANU. Back in Bennett's office after our tour, I noticed hanging on her wall a poster giving an artist's colorfully imaginative interpretation of the Earth as it might have looked 3.5 billion years ago, just when life was getting going, in the ancient period known to Earth science as the Archean. The poster showed an alien landscape of huge, very active volcanoes and a steamy, copper-colored sea beneath a harsh, red sky. Stromatolites, a kind of bacterial rock, filled the shallows in the foreground. It didn't look like a very promising place to create and nurture life. I asked her if the painting was accurate. Well, one school of thought says it was actually cool then because the sun was much weaker. I later learned that biologists, when they are feeling jocose, refer to this as the Chinese restaurant problem because we had a dim sun. Without an atmosphere, ultraviolet rays from the sun, even from a weak sun, would have tended to break apart any incipient bonds made by molecules. And yet right there, she tapped the stromatolites, you have organisms almost at the surface. It's a puzzle. So we don't know what the world was like back then. Hmm, she agreed thoughtfully. Either way, it doesn't seem very conducive to life. She nodded amiably. But there must have been something that suited life, otherwise we wouldn't be here. It certainly wouldn't have suited us. If you were to step from a time machine into that ancient Archean world, you would very swiftly scamper back inside, for there was no more oxygen to breathe on the Earth back then than there is on Mars today. It was also full of noxious vapors from hydrochloric and sulfuric acids powerful enough to eat through clothing and blister skin. Nor would it have provided the clean and glowing vistas depicted in the poster in Victoria Bennett's office. The chemical stew that was the atmosphere then would have allowed little sunlight to reach the Earth's surface. What little you could see would be illumined only briefly by bright and frequent lightning flashes. In short, it was the Earth but an Earth we wouldn't recognize as our own. Anniversaries were few and far between in the Archean world. For two billion years, bacterial organisms were the only forms of life. They lived, they reproduced, they swarmed, but they didn't show any particular inclination to move on to another, more challenging level of existence. At some point in the first billion years of life, Cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, learned to tap into a freely available resource, the hydrogen that exists in spectacular abundance in water. They absorbed water molecules, supped on the hydrogen, and released the oxygen as waste, and in so doing, invented photosynthesis. As Margulis and Sagan note, photosynthesis is undoubtedly the most important single metabolic innovation in the history of life on the planet and it was invented not by plants, but by bacteria. As cyanobacteria proliferated, the world began to fill with O2, to the consternation of those organisms that found it poisonous, which in those days was all of them. In an anaerobic or non-oxygen-using world, oxygen is extremely poisonous. Our white blood cells actually use oxygen to kill invading bacteria, that oxygen is fundamentally toxic often comes as a surprise to those of us who find it so convivial to our well-being, but that is only because we have evolved to exploit it. To other things, it is a terror. It is what turns butter rancid and makes iron rust. Even we can tolerate it only up to a point. The oxygen level in our cells is only about a tenth the level found in the atmosphere. The new oxygen-using organisms had two advantages. Oxygen was a more efficient way to produce energy, and it vanquished competitor organisms. Some retreated into the oozy, anaerobic world of bogs and lake bottoms, 
Others did likewise, but then later, much later, migrated to the digestive tracts of beings like you and me. Quite a number of these primeval entities are alive inside your body right now, helping to digest your food, but abhorring even the tiniest hint of O2. Untold numbers of others failed to adapt and died. The cyanobacteria were a runaway success. At first, the extra oxygen they produced didn't accumulate in the atmosphere, but combined with iron to form ferric oxides, which sank to the bottom of primitive seas. For millions of years, the world literally rusted, a phenomenon vividly recorded in the banded iron deposits that provide so much of the world's iron ore today. For many tens of millions of years, not a great deal more than this happened. If you went back to that early Proterozoic world, you wouldn't find many signs of promise for the Earth's future life. Perhaps here and there, in sheltered pools, you'd encounter a film of living scum or a coating of glossy greens and browns on shoreline rocks, but otherwise life remained invisible. But about 3.5 billion years ago, something more emphatic became apparent. Wherever the seas were shallow, visible structures began to appear. As they went through their chemical routines, the cyanobacteria became very slightly tacky, and that tackiness trapped microparticles of dust and sand, which became bound together to form slightly weird but solid structures, the stromatolites that featured in the shallows of the poster on Victoria Bennett's office wall. Stromatolites came in various shapes and sizes. Sometimes they looked like enormous cauliflowers, sometimes like fluffy mattresses. Stromatolite comes from the Greek for mattress. Sometimes they came in the form of columns, rising tens of meters above the surface of the water, on occasion as high as 100 meters. In all their manifestations, they were a kind of living rock, and they represented the world's first cooperative venture with some varieties of primitive organism living just at the surface and others living just underneath, each taking advantage of conditions created by the other. The world had its first ecosystem. For many years, scientists knew about stromatolites from fossil formations, but in 1961 they got a real surprise with the discovery of a community of living stromatolites at Shark Bay on the remote northwest coast of Australia. This was most unexpected. So unexpected, in fact, that it was some years before scientists realized quite what they had found. Today, however, Shark Bay is a tourist attraction, or at least as much of a tourist attraction as a place hundreds of miles from anywhere much and dozens of miles from anywhere at all can ever be. Boardwalks have been built out into the bay so that visitors can stroll over the water to get a good look at the stromatolites, quietly respiring just beneath the surface. They are lusterless and gray, and look, as I recorded in an earlier book, like very large cowpats. But it is a curiously giddying moment to find yourself staring at living remnants of the earth as it was 3.5 billion years ago. As Richard Forty has put it, this is truly time traveling, and if the world were attuned to its real wonders, this site would be as well known as the Pyramids of Giza. Although you'd never guess it, these dull rocks swarm with life, with an estimated, well, obviously estimated, three billion individual organisms on every square yard of rock. Sometimes, when you look carefully, you can see tiny strings of bubbles rising to the surface as they give up their oxygen. In two billion years, such tiny exertions raised the level of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere to 20%, preparing the way for the next, more complex chapter in life's history. It has been suggested that the cyanobacteria at Shark Bay are perhaps the most slowly evolving organisms on Earth and certainly now they are among the rarest. Having prepared the way for more complex life forms, they were then grazed out of existence nearly everywhere by the very organisms whose existence they had made possible. They exist at Shark Bay because the waters are too saline for the creatures that would normally feast on them.
One reason life took so long to grow complex was that the world had to wait until the simpler organisms had oxygenated the atmosphere sufficiently. Animals could not summon up the energy to work, as Forty has put it. It took about two billion years, roughly forty percent of Earth's history, for oxygen levels to reach more or less modern levels of concentration in the atmosphere. But once the stage was set, and apparently quite suddenly, an entirely new type of cell arose, one containing a nucleus and other little bodies collectively called organelles, from a Greek word meaning little tools. The process is thought to have started when some blundering or adventuresome bacterium either invaded or was captured by some other bacterium, and it turned out that this suited them both. The captive bacterium became, it is thought, a mitochondrion. This mitochondrial invasion, or endosymbiotic event, as biologists like to term it, made complex life possible. In plants, a similar invasion produced chloroplasts, which enable plants to photosynthesize. Mitochondria manipulate oxygen in a way that liberates energy from foodstuffs. Without this niftily facilitating trick, life on Earth today would be nothing more than a sludge of simple microbes. Mitochondria are very tiny. You could pack a billion into the space occupied by a grain of sand, but also very hungry. Almost every nutriment you absorb goes to feeding them. We couldn't live for two minutes without them. Yet even after a billion years, mitochondria behave as if they think things might not work out between us. They maintain their own DNA, RNA, and ribosomes. They reproduce at a different time from their host cells. They look like bacteria, divide like bacteria, and sometimes respond to antibiotics in the way bacteria do. They don't even speak the same genetic language as the cell in which they live. In short, they keep their bags packed. It is like having a stranger in your house, but one who has been there for a billion years. The new type of cells are known as eukaryotes, meaning truly nucleated, as contrasted with the old type, which are known as prokaryotes, pre-nucleated, and they seem to have arrived suddenly in the fossil record. The oldest eukaryotes yet known, called Grypania, were discovered in iron sediments in Michigan in 1992. Such fossils have been found just once, and then no more are known for five hundred million years. Earth had taken its first step towards becoming a truly interesting planet. Compared with the new eukaryotes, the old prokaryotes were little more than bags of chemicals, to borrow from the British geologist Stephen Drury. Eukaryotes were bigger, eventually as much as ten thousand times bigger, than their simpler cousins and could carry as much as a thousand times more DNA. Gradually, thanks to these breakthroughs, life became complex and created two types of organism, those that expel oxygen, like plants, and those that take it in, like you and me. Single-celled eukaryotes were once called protozoa, pre-animals, but that term is increasingly disdained. Today, the common term for them is protists. Compared with the bacteria that had gone before, these new protists were wonders of design and sophistication. The simple amoeba, just one cell big and without any ambitions but to exist, contains 400 million bits of genetic information in its DNA. Enough, as Carl Sagan noted, to fill 80 books of 500 pages. Eventually, the eukaryotes learned an even more singular trick. It took a long time, a billion years or so, but it was a good one when they mastered it. They learned to form together into complex, multicellular beings. Thanks to this innovation, big, complicated, visible entities like us were possible. Planet Earth was ready to move on to its next ambitious phase. But before we get too excited about that, it is worth remembering that the world as we are about to see still belongs to the very small. Chapter 20 Small World 
It's probably not a good idea to take too personal an interest in your microbes. Louis Pasteur, the great French chemist and bacteriologist, became so preoccupied with his that he took to peering critically at every dish placed before him with a magnifying glass, a habit that presumably did not win him many repeat invitations to dinner. In fact, there is no point in trying to hide from your bacteria, for they are on and around you always, in numbers you can't conceive of. If you are in good health and averagely diligent about hygiene, you will have a herd of about one trillion bacteria grazing on your fleshy plains, about a hundred thousand of them on every square centimeter of skin. They are there to dine off the ten billion or so flakes of skin you shed every day, plus all the tasty oils and fortifying minerals that seep out from every pore and fissure. You are for them the ultimate buffet, with the convenience of warmth and constant mobility thrown in. By way of thanks, they give you B.O. And those are just the bacteria that inhabit your skin. There are trillions more tucked away in your gut and nasal passages, clinging to your hair and eyelashes, swimming over the surface of your eyes, drilling through the enamel of your teeth. Your digestive system alone is host to more than a hundred trillion microbes of at least four hundred types. Some deal with sugars, some with starches, some attack other bacteria. A surprising number, like the ubiquitous intestinal spirochetes, have no detectable function at all. They just seem to like to be with you. Every human body consists of about ten quadrillion cells, but is host to about a hundred quadrillion bacterial cells. They are, in short, a big part of us. From the bacteria's point of view, of course, we are a rather small part of them. Because we humans are big and clever enough to produce and use antibiotics and disinfectants, it is easy to convince ourselves that we have banished bacteria to the fringes of existence. Don't you believe it? Bacteria may not build cities or have interesting social lives, but they will be here when the sun explodes. This is their planet, and we are on it only because they allow us to be. Bacteria never forget got along for billions of years without us. We couldn't survive a day without them. They process our wastes and make them usable again. Without their diligent munching, nothing would rot. They purify our water and keep our soils productive. Bacteria synthesize vitamins in our gut, convert the things we eat into useful sugars and polysaccharides, and go to war on alien microbes that slip down our gullet. We depend totally on bacteria to pluck nitrogen from the air and convert it into useful nucleotides and amino acids for us. It is a prodigious and gratifying feat. As Margulis and Sagan note, to do the same thing industrially as when making fertilizers, manufacturers must heat the source materials to 500 degrees Celsius and squeeze them to 300 times normal pressures, Bacteria do the same thing all the time, without fuss, and thank goodness, for no larger organism could survive without the nitrogen they pass on. Above all, microbes continue to provide us with the air we breathe and to keep the atmosphere stable. Microbes, including the modern versions of cyanobacteria, supply the greater part of the planet's breathable oxygen. Algae and other tiny organisms bubbling away in the sea blow out about 150 billion kilograms of the stuff every year. And they are amazingly prolific. The more frantic among them can yield a new generation in less than ten minutes. Clostridium perfringens, the disagreeable little organism that causes gangrene, can reproduce in nine minutes, and then begin at once to split again. At such a rate, a single bacterium could theoretically produce more offspring in two days than there are protons in the universe. Given an adequate supply of nutrients, a single bacterial cell can generate 280,000 billion individuals in a single day, according to the Belgian biochemist and Nobel laureate Christian de Duve. In the same period, a human cell can just about manage a single division. About once every million divisions, they produce a mutant. 
Usually this is bad luck for the mutant, for an organism, change is always risky. But just occasionally the new bacterium is endowed with some accidental advantage, such as the ability to elude or shrug off an attack of antibiotics. With this ability to evolve rapidly goes another even scarier advantage. Bacteria share information. Any bacterium can take pieces of genetic coding from any other. Essentially, as Margulis and Sagan put it, all bacteria swim in a single gene pool. Any adaptive change that occurs in one area of the bacterial universe can spread to any other. It's rather as if a human could go to an insect to get the necessary genetic coding to sprout wings or walk on ceilings. It means that from a genetic point of view, bacteria have become a single superorganism, tiny, dispersed, but invincible. They will live and thrive on almost anything you spill, dribble, or shake loose. Just give them a little moisture, as when you run a damp cloth over a counter, and they will bloom as if created from nothing. They will eat wood, the glue and wallpaper, the metals in hardened paint. Scientists in Australia found microbes known as Theobacillus concretivorans, which lived in, indeed could not live without, concentrations of sulfuric acid, strong enough to dissolve metal. A species called Micrococcus radiophilus was found living happily in the waste tanks of nuclear reactors, gorging itself on plutonium and whatever else was there. Some bacteria break down chemical materials from which, as far as we can tell, they gain no benefit at all. They have been found living in boiling mud pots and lakes of caustic soda, deep inside rocks, at the bottom of the sea, in hidden pools of icy water in the McMurdo dry valleys of Antarctica, and eleven kilometers down in the Pacific Ocean, where pressures are more than a thousand times greater than at the surface or equivalent to being squashed beneath fifty jumbo jets. Some of them seem to be practically indestructible. Dinococcus radiodurans is, according to the economist, almost immune to radioactivity. Blast its DNA with radiation and the pieces immediately reform, like the scuttling limbs of an undead creature from a horror movie. Perhaps the most extraordinary survival yet found was that of a streptococcus bacterium that was recovered from the sealed lens of a camera that had stood on the moon for two years. In short, there are few environments in which bacteria aren't prepared to live. They are finding now that when they push probes into ocean vents so hot that the probes actually start to melt, there are bacteria even there, Victoria Bennett told me. In the 1920s, two scientists at the University of Chicago, Edson Baston and Frank Greer, announced that they had isolated from oil wells strains of bacteria that had been living at depths of 600 meters. The notion was dismissed as fundamentally preposterous. There was nothing to live on at 600 meters. And for 50 years, it was assumed that their samples had been contaminated with surface microbes. We now know that there are a lot of microbes living deep within the earth, many of which have nothing at all to do with a conventionally organic world. They eat rocks, or rather the stuff that's in rocks, iron, sulfur, manganese, and so on. And they breathe odd things, too, iron, chromium, cobalt, even uranium. Such processes may be instrumental in concentrating gold, copper, and other precious metals, and possibly deposits of oil and natural gas. It has even been suggested that their tireless nibblings created the Earth's crust. Some scientists now think that there could be as much as 100 trillion tons of bacteria living beneath our feet in what are known as subsurface lithoautotrophic microbial ecosystems, slime for short. Thomas Gold of Cornell University has estimated that if you took all the bacteria out of the Earth's interior and dumped them on the surface, they would cover the planet to a depth of 15 meters, the height of a four-story building. If the estimates are correct, there could be more life under the Earth than on top of it. At depth, microbes shrink in size and become extremely sluggish. 
The liveliest of them may divide no more than once a century, some no more than perhaps once in five hundred years. As the economist has put it, the key to long life, it seems, is not to do too much. When things are really tough, bacteria are prepared to shut down all systems and wait for better times. In 1997, scientists successfully activated some anthrax spores that had lain dormant for 80 years in a museum display in Trondheim, Norway. Other microorganisms have leaped back to life after being released from a 118-year-old can of meat and a 166-year-old bottle of beer. In 1996, scientists at the Russian Academy of Science claimed to have revived bacteria frozen in Siberian permafrost for three million years. But the record claim for durability so far is one made by Russell Vreeland and colleagues at Westchester University in Pennsylvania in 2000, when they announced that they had resuscitated 250-million-year-old bacteria called Bacillus permians that had been trapped in salt deposits 600 meters underground in Carlsbad, New Mexico. If so, this microbe is older than the continents. The report met with some understandable dubiousness. Many biochemists maintained that over such a span, the microbe's components would have become uselessly degraded unless the bacterium roused itself from time to time. However, if the bacterium did stir occasionally, there was no plausible internal source of energy that could have lasted so long. The more doubtful scientists suggested that the sample might have been contaminated, if not during its retrieval, then perhaps while still buried. In 2001, a team from Tel Aviv University argued that Bacillus permians was almost identical to a strain of modern bacteria, Bacillus maris mortui, found in the Dead Sea. Only two of its genetic sequences differed, and then only slightly. Are we to believe, the Israeli researchers wrote, that in 250 million years, Bacillus permians has accumulated the same amount of genetic differences that could be achieved in just three to seven days in the laboratory? In reply, Vreeland suggested that bacteria evolve faster in the lab than they do in the wild. Maybe. It is a remarkable fact that well into the space age, most school textbooks divided the world of the living into just two categories, plant and animal. Microorganisms hardly featured. Amoebas and similar single-celled organisms were treated as proto-animals and algae as proto-plants. Bacteria were usually lumped in with plants too, even though everyone knew they didn't belong there. As far back as the late 19th century, the German naturalist Ernst Haeckel had suggested that bacteria deserved to be placed in a separate kingdom, which he called Monera. But the idea didn't begin to catch on among biologists until the 1960s, and then only among some of them. I note that my trusty American Heritage Desk Dictionary from 1969 doesn't recognize the term. Many organisms in the visible world were also poorly served by the traditional division. Fungi, the group that includes mushrooms, molds, mildews, yeasts, and puffballs, were nearly always treated as botanical objects, though in fact almost nothing about them, how they reproduce and respire, how they build themselves, matches anything in the plant world. Structurally, they have more in common with animals, in that they build their cells from chitin, material that gives them their distinctive texture. The same substance is used to make the shells of insects and the claws of mammals, though it isn't nearly so tasty in a stag beetle as in a portobello mushroom. Above all, unlike all plants, fungi don't photosynthesize, so they have no chlorophyll and thus are not green. Instead, they grow directly on their food source, which can be almost anything. Fungi will eat the sulfur off a concrete wall, or the decaying matter between your toes. Two things no plant will do. Almost the only plant-like quality they have is that they root. Even less comfortably susceptible to categorization was the peculiar group of organisms formerly called myxomycetes, but more commonly known as slime molds. The name, no doubt, has much to do with their obscurity. An appellation that sounded a little more dynamic, ambulant self-activating protoplasm, say, 
and less like the stuff you find when you reach deep into a clogged drain, would almost certainly have earned these extraordinary entities a more immediate share of the attention they deserve. For slime molds are, make no mistake, among the most interesting organisms in nature. When times are good, they exist as one-celled individuals, much like amoebas. But when conditions grow tough, they crawl to a central gathering place and become, almost miraculously, a slug. The slug is not a thing of beauty, and it doesn't go terribly far, usually just from the bottom of a pile of leaf litter to the top, where it is in a slightly more exposed position. But for millions of years, this may well have been the niftiest trick in the universe. And it doesn't stop there. Having hauled itself up to a more favorable locale, the slime mold transforms itself yet again, taking on the form of a plant. By some curious, orderly process, the cells reconfigure, like the members of a tiny marching band, to make a stalk, atop of which forms a bulb known as a fruiting body. Inside the fruiting body are millions of spores, which, at the appropriate moment, are released to the wind to blow away to become single-celled organisms that can start the process again. For years, slime molds were claimed as protozoa by zoologists and as fungi by mycologists, though most people could see they didn't really belong anywhere. When genetic testing arrived, people in lab coats were surprised to find that slime molds were so distinctive and peculiar that they weren't directly related to anything else in nature, and sometimes not even to each other. In 1969, in an attempt to bring some order to the growing inadequacies of classification, an ecologist from Cornell named R. H. Whitaker unveiled in the journal Science a proposal to divide life into five principal branches, kingdoms, as they are known, called Animalia, Plantae, Fungi, Protista, and Monera. Protista was a modification of an earlier term, Protoctista, which had been suggested a century earlier by a Scottish biologist named John Hogg, and was meant to describe any organisms that were neither plant nor animal. Though Whitaker's new scheme was a great improvement, Protista remained ill-defined. Some taxonomists reserved the term for large unicellular organisms, the eukaryotes, but others treated it as a kind of odd sock drawer of biology, putting into it anything that didn't fit anywhere else. It included, depending on which text you consulted, slime molds, amoebas, even seaweed, among much else. By one calculation, it contained as many as 200,000 different species of organism, all told. That's a lot of odd socks. Ironically, just as Whitaker's Five Kingdom classification was beginning to find its way into textbooks, an unassuming academic at the University of Illinois was groping his way towards a discovery that would challenge everything. His name was Carl Wose, and since the mid-1960s, or about as early as it was possible to do so, he had been quietly studying genetic sequences in bacteria. In the early days, this was an exceedingly painstaking process. Work on a single bacterium could easily consume a year. At that time, according to Woes, only about 500 species of bacteria were known, which is fewer than the number of species you have in your mouth. Today, the number is about ten times that, though that is still far short of the 26,900 species of algae, 70,000 of fungi, and 30,800 of amoebas and related organisms whose biographies fill the annals of biology. It isn't simple indifference that keeps the total low. Bacteria can be exasperatingly difficult to isolate and study. Only about 1% will grow in culture. Considering how wildly adaptable they are in nature, it is an odd fact that the one place they seem not to wish to live is a Petri dish. Plop them on a bed of agar and pamper them as you will, and most will just lie there, declining every inducement to bloom. Any bacterium that thrives in a lab is by definition exceptional and yet these were, almost exclusively, the organisms studied by microbiologists. It was, said Woes, like learning about animals from visiting zoos. Genes, however, allowed Woes to approach microorganisms from another angle. 
As he worked, Woes realized that there were more fundamental divisions in the microbial world than anyone suspected. A lot of little organisms that looked like bacteria and behaved like bacteria were actually something else altogether, something that had branched off from bacteria a long time ago. Woes called these organisms archaebacteria, later shortened to archaea. It has to be said that the attributes that distinguish archaea from bacteria are not the sort that would quicken the pulse of any but a biologist. There are mostly differences in their lipids, and an absence of something called peptidoglycan, but in practice they make a world of difference. Archaea are more different from bacteria than you and I are from a crab or spider. Single-handedly, Woes had discovered an unsuspected division of life, so fundamental that it stood above the level of kingdom at the apogee of the universal tree of life, as it is rather reverentially known. In 1976, he startled the world, or at least the little bit of it that was paying attention, by redrawing the tree of life to incorporate not five main divisions, but twenty-three. These he grouped under three new principal categories, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, which he called domains. The new arrangement was as follows. Bacteria, cyanobacteria, purple bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, green non-sulfur bacteria, flavobacteria, and thermotogales. Archaea, halophilic archaeans, methanosarcina, methanobacterium, methanoncoccus, thermocellar, thermoproteus, and pyrodictium. Eukarya, diplomads, microsporidia, trichomonads, flagellates, entamoeba, slime molds, ciliates, plants, fungi, and animals. Woese's new divisions did not take the biological world by storm. Some dismissed his system as much too heavily weighted towards the microbial. Many just ignored it. Woes, according to Francis Ashcroft, felt bitterly disappointed. But slowly his new scheme began to catch on among microbiologists. Botanists and zoologists were much slower to appreciate its virtues. It's not hard to see why. In Woese's model, the worlds of botany and zoology are relegated to a few twigs on the outermost branch of the eukaryan limb. Everything else belongs to unicellular beings. These folks were brought up to classify in terms of gross morphological similarities and differences, Woese told an interviewer in 1996. The idea of doing so in terms of molecular sequence is a bit hard for many of them to swallow. In short, if they couldn't see a difference with their own eyes, they didn't like it. And so they persisted with a more conventional five-kingdom division, an arrangement that Woes called not very useful in his milder moments and positively misleading much of the rest of the time. Biology, like physics before it, Woes wrote, has moved to a level where the objects of interest and their interactions often cannot be perceived through direct observation. In 1998, the great and ancient Harvard zoologist Ernst Mayer, who was then in his 94th year, and at the time of my writing is nearing 100 and still going strong, stirred the pot further by declaring that there should be just two prime divisions of life, empires, he called them, in a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Mayer said that Woese's findings were interesting, but ultimately misguided, noting that Woese was not trained as a biologist, and quite naturally does not have an extensive familiarity with the principles of classification, which is perhaps as close as one distinguished scientist can come to saying of another that he doesn't know what he is talking about. The specifics of Mayer's criticisms are highly technical. They involve issues of meiotic sexuality, Heineggian cladification, and controversial interpretations of the genome of Methanobacterium thermaotrophicum, among rather a lot else. But essentially, he argues that Woese's arrangement unbalances the tree of life. The bacterial realm, Mayer notes, consists of no more than a few thousand species, while the Archean has a mere 175 named specimens, with perhaps a few thousand more to be found, but hardly more than that. By contrast, the eukaryotic realm, that is, the complicated organisms with nucleated cells, like us, 
numbers already in the millions of species. For the sake of the principle of balance, Mayer argues for combining the simple bacterial organisms in a single category, prokaryota, while placing the more complex and highly evolved remainder in the empire eukaryota, which would stand alongside as an equal. Put another way, he argues for keeping things much as they were before. This division between simple cells and complex cells is where the great break is in the living world. If Woese's new arrangement teaches us anything, it is that life really is various, and that most of that variety is small, unicellular, and unfamiliar. It is a natural human impulse to think of evolution as a long chain of improvements, of a never-ending advance toward largeness and complexity, in a word, towards us. We flatter ourselves. Most of the real diversity in evolution has been small-scale. We large things are just flukes, an interesting side branch. Of the 23 main divisions of life, only three, plants, animals, and fungi, are large enough to be seen by the human eye. And even they contain species that are microscopic. Indeed, according to Woes, if you totaled up all the biomass of the planet, every living thing, plants included, microbes would account for at least 80% of all there is, perhaps more. The world belongs to the very small, and it has done for a very long time. So why, you are bound to ask at some point in your life, do microbes so often want to hurt us? What possible satisfaction could there be to a microbe in having us grow feverish or chilled or disfigured with sores or, above all, deceased? A dead host, after all, is hardly going to provide long-term hospitality. To begin with, it is worth remembering that most microorganisms are neutral or even beneficial to human well-being. The most rampantly infectious organism on Earth, a bacterium called Wolbachia, doesn't hurt humans at all, or come to that any other vertebrates. But if you are a shrimp or a worm or a fruit fly, it can make you wish you had never been born. Altogether, only about one microbe in a thousand is a pathogen for humans, according to the National Geographic, though knowing what some of them can do, we could be forgiven for thinking that that is quite enough. Even if most of them are benign, microbes are still the number three killer in the Western world and even many that don't kill us make us deeply rue their existence. Making a host unwell has certain benefits for the microbe. The symptoms of an illness often help to spread the disease. Vomiting, sneezing, and diarrhea are excellent methods of getting out of one host and into position for boarding another. The most effective strategy of all is to enlist the help of a mobile third party. Infectious organisms love mosquitoes because the mosquito sting delivers them directly into a bloodstream, where they can get straight to work before the victim's defense mechanisms can figure out what's hit them. That is why so many grade A diseases, malaria, yellow fever, dengue fever, encephalitis, and a hundred or so other less celebrated but often rapacious maladies, begin with a mosquito bite. It is a fortunate fluke for us that HIV, the AIDS agent, isn't among them, at least not yet. Any HIV the mosquito sucks up on its travels is dissolved by the mosquito's own metabolism. When the day comes that the virus mutates its way around this, we may be in real trouble. It is a mistake, however, to consider the matter too carefully from the position of logic, because microorganisms clearly are not calculating entities. They don't care what they do to you any more than you care what distress you cause when you slaughter them by the millions with a soapy shower or a swipe of deodorant. The only time your continuing well-being is of consequence to a pathogen is when it kills you too well. If they eliminate you before they can move on, then they may well die out themselves. History, Jared Diamond notes, is full of diseases that once caused terrifying epidemics and then disappeared as mysteriously as they had come. He cites the robust but mercifully transient English sweating sickness, which raged from 1485 to 1552, killing tens of thousands as it went, before burning itself out. 
Too much efficiency is not a good thing for any infectious organism. A great deal of sickness arises not because of what the organism has done to you, but because of what your body is trying to do to the organism. In its quest to rid the body of pathogens, the immune system sometimes destroys cells or damages critical tissues. So, often when you are unwell, what you are feeling is not the pathogens, but your own immune responses. Anyway, getting sick is a sensible response to infection. Sick people retire to their beds, and thus are less of a threat to the wider community. Because there are so many things out there with the potential to hurt you, your body holds lots of different varieties of defensive white blood cells, some ten million types in all, each designed to identify and destroy a particular sort of invader. It would be impossibly inefficient to maintain ten million separate standing armies, so each variety of white blood cell keeps only a few scouts on active duty. When an infectious agent, what's known as an antigen, invades, relevant scouts identify the attacker and put out a call for reinforcements of the right type. While your body is manufacturing these forces, you are likely to feel wretched. The onset of recovery begins when the troops finally swing into action. White cells are merciless and will hunt down and kill every last pathogen they can find. To avoid extinction, attackers have evolved two elemental strategies. Either they strike quickly and move on to a new host, as with common infectious diseases like flu, or they disguise themselves so that the white cells fail to spot them, as with HIV, the virus responsible for AIDS, which can sit harmlessly and unnoticed in the nuclei of cells for years before springing into action. One of the odder aspects of infection is that microbes that normally do no harm at all sometimes get into the wrong parts of the body and go kind of crazy, in the words of Dr. Brian Marsh, an infectious diseases specialist at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. It happens all the time with car accidents when people suffer internal injuries. Microbes that are normally benign in the gut get into other parts of the body, the bloodstream, for instance, and cause terrible havoc. The scariest, most out-of-control bacterial disorder of the moment is a disease called necrotizing fasciitis, in which bacteria essentially eat the victim from the inside out, devouring internal tissue and leaving behind a pulpy, noxious residue. Patients often come in with comparatively mild complaints, a skin rash and fever, typically, but then dramatically deteriorate. When they are opened up, it is often found that they are simply being consumed. The only treatment is what is known as radical excisional surgery, cutting out every bit of infected area. Seventy percent of victims die. Many of the rest are left terribly disfigured. The source of the infection is a mundane family of bacteria called Group A Streptococcus, which normally do no more than cause strep throat. Very occasionally, for reasons unknown, some of these bacteria get through the lining of the throat and into the body proper, where they wreak the most devastating havoc. They are completely resistant to antibiotics. About a thousand cases a year occur in the United States, and no one can say that it won't get worse. Precisely the same thing happens with meningitis. At least 10% of young adults, and perhaps 30% of teenagers, carry the deadly meningococcal bacterium. But it lives quite harmlessly in the throat. Just occasionally, in about one young person in a hundred thousand, it gets into the bloodstream and makes them very ill indeed. In the worst cases, death can come in 12 hours. That's shockingly quick. You can have a person who's in perfect health at breakfast and dead by evening, says Marsh. We would have much more success with bacteria if we weren't so profligate with our best weapon against them, antibiotics. Remarkably, by one estimate, some 70% of the antibiotics used in the developed world are given to farm animals, often routinely in stock feed, simply to promote growth or as a precaution against infection. Such applications give bacteria every opportunity to evolve a resistance to them. 
it is an opportunity that they have enthusiastically seized. In 1952, penicillin was fully effective against all strains of Staphylococcus bacteria to such an extent that by the early 1960s, the U.S. Surgeon General, William Stewart, felt confident enough to declare, The time has come to close the book on infectious diseases. We have basically wiped out infection in the United States. Even as he spoke, however, some 90% of those strains were in the process of developing immunity to penicillin. Soon, one of these new strains, called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, began to show up in hospitals. Only one type of antibiotic, vanomycin, remained effective against it. But in 1997, a hospital in Tokyo reported the appearance of a strain that could resist even that. Within months, it had spread to six other Japanese hospitals. All over, the microbes are beginning to win the war again. In U.S. hospitals alone, some 14,000 people a year die from infections they pick up there. As James Surowiecki noted in a New Yorker article, Given a choice between developing antibiotics that people will take every day for two weeks and antidepressants that people will take every day forever, drug companies, not surprisingly, opt for the latter. Although a few antibiotics have been toughened up a bit, the pharmaceutical industry hasn't given us an entirely new antibiotic since the 1970s. Our carelessness is all the more alarming since the discovery that many other ailments may be bacterial in origin. The process of discovery began in 1983, when Barry Marshall, a doctor in Perth, Western Australia, found that many stomach cancers and most stomach ulcers are caused by a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. Even though his findings were easily tested, the notion was so radical that more than a decade would pass before they were generally accepted. America's National Institutes of Health, for instance, didn't officially endorse the idea until 1994. Hundreds, even thousands of people must have died from ulcers who wouldn't have, Marshall told a reporter from Forbes in 1999. Since then, further research has shown that there is or may well be a bacterial component in all kinds of other disorders, heart disease, asthma, arthritis, multiple sclerosis, several types of mental disorders, many cancers. Even it has been suggested in science, no less, obesity. The day may not be far off when we desperately require an effective antibiotic and haven't got one to call on. It may come as a slight comfort to know that bacteria can themselves get sick. They are sometimes infected by bacteriophages, or simply phages, a type of virus. A virus is a strange and unlovely entity, a piece of nucleic acid surrounded by bad news, in the memorable phrase of the Nobel laureate Peter Medawar. Smaller and simpler than bacteria, viruses aren't themselves alive. In isolation, they are inert and harmless, but introduce them into a suitable host, and they burst into busyness, into life. About 5,000 types of virus are known and between them they afflict us with many hundreds of diseases, ranging from the flu and common cold to those that are most invidious to human well-being, smallpox, rabies, yellow fever, Ebola, polio, and AIDS. Viruses prosper by hijacking the genetic material of a living cell and using it to produce more virus. They reproduce in a fanatical manner, then burst out in search of more cells to invade, not being living organisms themselves, they can afford to be very simple. Many, including HIV, have ten genes or fewer, whereas even the simplest bacteria require several thousand. They are also very tiny, much too small to be seen with a conventional microscope. It wasn't until 1943 and the invention of the electron microscope that science got its first look at them. But they can do immense damage. Smallpox in the 20th century alone killed an estimated 300 million people. They also have an unnerving capacity to burst upon the world in some new and startling form, and then to vanish again as quickly as they came. In 1916, in one such case, people in Europe and America began to come down with a strange 
sleeping sickness, which became known as encephalitis lethargica. Victims would go to sleep and not wake up. They could be roused without great difficulty to take food or go to the laboratory, and would answer questions sensibly. They knew who and where they were, though their manner was always apathetic. However, the moment they were permitted to rest, they would at once sink back into deepest slumber and remain in that state for as long as they were left. Some went on in this manner for months before dying. A very few survived and regained consciousness, but not their former liveliness. They existed in a state of profound apathy, like extinct volcanoes, in the words of one doctor. In ten years, the disease killed some five million people and then quietly went away. It didn't get much lasting attention because in the meantime, an even worse epidemic, indeed the worst in history, swept across the world. It is sometimes called the Great Swine Flu Epidemic, and sometimes the Great Spanish Flu Epidemic, but in either case, it was ferocious. The First World War killed 21 million people in four years. Swine flu did the same in its first four months. Almost 80% of American casualties in the First World War came not from enemy fire, but from flu. In some units, the mortality rate was as high as 80%. Swine flu arose as a normal, non-lethal flu in the spring of 1918. But somehow, over the following months, no one knows how or where, it mutated into something more severe. A fifth of victims suffered only mild symptoms, but the rest became gravely ill, and many died. Some succumbed within hours, others held on for a few days. In the United States, the first deaths were recorded among sailors in Boston in late August 1918, but the epidemic quickly spread to all parts of the country. Schools closed, public entertainments were shut down, people everywhere wore masks. It did little good. Between autumn of 1918 and spring of the following year, 548,452 people died of the flu in America. The toll in Britain was 220,000, with similar numbers in France and Germany. No one knows the global toll, as records in the Third World were often poor. But it was not less than 20 million, and probably more like 50 million. Some estimates have put the global total as high as 100 million. In an attempt to devise a vaccine, medical authorities conducted experiments on volunteers at a military prison on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. The prisoners were promised pardons if they survived a battery of tests. These tests were rigorous, to say the least. First, the subjects were injected with infected lung tissue taken from the dead, and then sprayed in the eyes, nose, and mouth with infectious aerosols. If they still failed to succumb, they had their throats swabbed with discharges taken straight from the sick and dying. If all else failed, they were required to sit open-mouthed while a gravely ill victim was sat up slightly and made to cough into their faces. Out of, somewhat amazingly, three hundred men who volunteered, the doctors chose sixty-two for the tests. None contracted the flu. Not one. The only person who did grow ill was the war doctor who swiftly died. The probable explanation for this is that the epidemic had passed through the prison a few weeks earlier, and the volunteers, all of whom had survived that visitation, had a natural immunity. Much about the 1918 flu epidemic is understood poorly, or not at all. One mystery is how it erupted suddenly all over, in places separated by oceans, mountain ranges, and other earthly impediments. A virus can survive for no more than a few hours outside a host body, so how could it appear in Madrid, Bombay, and Philadelphia all in the same week? The probable answer is that it was incubated and spread by people who had only slight symptoms or none at all. Even in normal outbreaks, about 10% of people in any given population have the flu but are unaware of it because they experience no ill effects. And because they remain in circulation, they tend to be the great spreaders of the disease. That would account for the 1918 outbreak's widespread distribution, but it still doesn't explain how it managed to lie low for several months 
before erupting so explosively at more or less the same time all over. Even more mysterious is that it was most devastating to people in the prime of life. Flu normally is hardest on infants and the elderly, but in the 1918 outbreak, deaths were overwhelmingly among people in their twenties and thirties. Older people may have benefited from resistance gained from an earlier exposure to the same strain, but why the very young were similarly spared is unknown. The greatest mystery of all is why the 1918 flu was so ferociously deadly when most flus are not. We still have no idea. From time to time, certain strains of virus return. A disagreeable Russian virus known as H1N1 caused severe outbreaks over wide areas in 1933, then again in the 1950s, and yet again in the 1970s. Where it went in the meantime, each time, is uncertain. One suggestion is that viruses hide out unnoticed in populations of wild animals before trying their hand at a new generation of humans. No one can rule out the possibility that the great swine flu epidemic might once again rear its head. And if it doesn't, others well might. New and frightening viruses crop up all the time. Ebola, Lassa, and Marburg fevers have all tended to flare up and die down again, but no one can say that they aren't quietly mutating away somewhere, or simply awaiting the right opportunity to burst forth in a catastrophic manner. It is now apparent that AIDS has been among us much longer than anyone originally suspected. Researchers at the Manchester Royal Infirmary discovered that a sailor who had died of mysterious untreatable causes in 1959, in fact, had AIDS. Yet, for whatever reasons, the disease remained generally quiescent for another twenty years. The miracle is that other such diseases haven't gone rampant. Lassa fever, which wasn't first detected until 1969 in West Africa, is extremely virulent and little understood. In 1969, a doctor at a Yale University lab in New Haven, Connecticut, who was studying Lassa fever, came down with it. He survived. But more alarmingly, a technician in a nearby lab with no direct exposure also contracted the disease and died. Happily, the outbreak stopped there, but we can't count on always being so fortunate. Our lifestyles invite epidemics. Air travel makes it possible to spread infectious agents across the planet with amazing ease. An Ebola virus could begin the day in, say, Benin, and finish it in New York, or Hamburg, or Nairobi, or all three. It means also that medical authorities increasingly need to be acquainted with pretty much every malady that exists everywhere. But of course they are not. In 1990, a Nigerian living in Chicago was exposed to Lassa fever on a visit to his homeland, but didn't develop symptoms until he had returned to the United States. He died in a Chicago hospital without diagnosis and without anyone taking any special precautions in treating him. Unaware that he had one of the most lethal and infectious diseases on the planet. Miraculously, no one else was infected. We may not be so lucky next time. And on that sobering note, it's time to return to the world of the visibly living. Visibly living. Visibly living. Visibly living. Visibly living. Visibly living. Chapter 21. Life Goes On It isn't easy to become a fossil. The fate of nearly all living organisms, over 99.9% .9 of them, is to compost down to nothingness. When your spark is gone, every molecule you own will be nibbled off you or sluiced away to be put to use in some other system. That's just the way it is. Even if you make it into the small pool of organisms, the less than 0.1% that don't get devoured, the chances of being fossilized are very small. In order to become a fossil, several things must happen. First, you must die in the right place. Only about 15% of rocks can preserve fossils, so it's no good keeling over on a future site of granite. 
In practical terms, the deceased must become buried in sediment where it can leave an impression, like a leaf in wet mud, or decompose without exposure to oxygen, permitting the molecules in its bones and hard parts, and very occasionally softer parts, to be replaced by dissolved minerals, creating a petrified copy of the original. Then, as the sediments in which the fossil lies are carelessly pressed and folded and pushed about by Earth's processes, the fossil must somehow maintain an identifiable shape. Finally, but above all, after tens of millions or perhaps hundreds of millions of years hidden away, it must be found and recognized as something worth keeping. Only about one bone in a billion, it is thought, ever becomes fossilized. If that is so, it means that the complete fossil legacy of all the Americans alive today, that's 270 million people, with 206 bones each, will only be about 50 bones, one quarter of a complete skeleton. That's not to say, of course, that any of these bones will ever actually be found. Bearing in mind that they can be buried anywhere within an area of slightly over 9.3 million square kilometers, little of which will ever be turned over, much less examined, it would be something of a miracle if they were. Fossils are in every sense vanishingly rare. Most of what has lived on Earth has left behind no record at all. It has been estimated that less than one species in 10,000 has made it into the fossil record. That in itself is a stunningly infinitesimal proportion. However, if you accept the common estimate that the Earth has produced 30 billion species of creature in its time, and Richard Leakey and Roger Lewin's statement in The Sixth Extinction that there are 250,000 species of creature in the fossil record, that reduces the proportion to just one in 120,000. Either way, what we possess is the merest sampling of all the life that the Earth has spawned. Moreover, the record we do have is hopelessly skewed. Most land animals, of course, don't die in sediments. They drop in the open and are eaten or left to rot or weather down to nothing. The fossil record, consequently, is almost absurdly biased in favor of marine creatures. About 95% of all the fossils we possess are of animals that once lived underwater, mostly in shallow seas. I mention all this to explain why, on a grey day in February, I went to the Natural History Museum in London to meet a cheerful, vaguely rumpled, very likable paleontologist named Richard Forty. Forty knows an awful lot about an awful lot. He is the author of a wry, splendid book called Life, an Unauthorized Biography, which covers the whole pageant of animate creation. But his first love is a type of marine creature called trilobites, which once teemed in Ordovician seas, but haven't existed for a long time except in fossilized form. All trilobites shared a basic body plan of three parts, or lobes, head, tail, thorax from which comes the name. Forty found his first when he was a boy, clambering over rocks at St. David's Bay in Wales. He was hooked for life. He took me to a gallery of tall metal cupboards. Each cupboard was filled with shallow drawers, and each drawer was filled with stony trilobites, 20,000 specimens in all. It seems like a big number, he agreed, but you have to remember that millions upon millions of trilobites lived for millions upon millions of years in ancient seas. So 20,000 isn't a huge number. And most of these are only partial specimens. Finding a complete trilobite fossil is still a big moment for a paleontologist. Trilobites first appeared, fully formed, seemingly from nowhere, about 540 million years ago near the start of the great outburst of complex life, popularly known as the Cambrian Explosion, and then vanished, along with a great deal else, in the great and still mysterious Permian extinction 300,000 or so centuries later. As with all extinct creatures, there is a natural temptation to regard them as failures. But in fact, they were among the most successful animals ever to live. They reigned for 300 million years, twice the span of dinosaurs, which were themselves among history's great survivors. 
Humans, 40 points out, have survived so far for one half of one percent as long. With so much time at their disposal, the trilobites proliferated prodigiously. Most remained small, about the size of modern beetles, but some grew to be as big as platters. Altogether, they formed at least 5,000 genera and 60,000 species, though more turn up all the time. Forty had recently been at a conference in South America where he was approached by an academic from a small provincial university in Argentina. She had a box that was full of interesting things, trilobites that had never been seen before in South America, or indeed anywhere, and a great deal else. She had no research facilities to study them and no funds to look for more. Huge parts of the world are still unexplored. In terms of trilobites? No, in terms of everything. Throughout the 19th century, trilobites were almost the only known forms of early complex life, and for that reason were assiduously collected and studied. The big mystery about them was their sudden appearance. Even now, as Forty says, it can be startling to go to the right formation of rocks and to work your way upwards through the eons, finding no visible life at all, and then suddenly a whole prophalotaspis or elenellus as big as a crab will pop into your waiting hands. These were creatures with limbs, gills, nervous systems, probing antennae, a brain of sorts, in Forty's words, and the strangest eyes ever seen. Made of calcite rods, the same stuff that forms limestone, they constituted the earliest visual systems known. More than this, the earliest trilobites didn't consist of just one venturesome species, but dozens and didn't appear in one or two locations, but all over. Many thinking people in the 19th century saw this as proof of God's handiwork and refutation of Darwin's evolutionary ideals. If evolution proceeded slowly, they asked, then how did he account for this sudden appearance of complex, fully formed creatures? The fact is, he couldn't. And so matter seemed destined to remain forever until one day in 1909, three months shy of the 50th anniversary of the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, when a paleontologist named Charles Doolittle Walcott made an extraordinary find in the Canadian Rockies. Walcott was born in 1850 and grew up near Utica, New York, in a family of modest means, which became more modest still with the sudden death of his father when Charles was an infant. As a boy, Walcott discovered that he had a knack for finding fossils, particularly trilobites, and built up a collection of sufficient distinction that it was bought by Louis Agassiz for his museum at Harvard for a small fortune, about 45,000 pounds in today's money. Although he had barely a high school education and was self-taught in the sciences, Walcott became a leading authority on trilobites and was the first person to establish that they were arthropods the group that includes modern insects and crustaceans. In 1879, Walcott took a job as a field researcher with the newly formed United States Geological Survey and served with such distinction that within 15 years he had risen to be its head. In 1907, he was appointed secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, where he remained until his death in 1927. Despite his administrative obligations, he continued to do field work and to write prolifically. His books fill a library shelf, according to Forty. Not incidentally, he was also a founding director of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which eventually became the National Aeronautics and Space Agency, or NASA, and thus can rightly be considered the grandfather of the space age. But what he is remembered for now is an astute but lucky find in British Columbia, high above the little town of Field, in the late summer of 1909. The customary version of the story is that Walcott, accompanied by his wife, was riding on a mountain trail when his wife's horse slipped on loose stones. Dismounting to a sister, Walcott discovered that the horse had turned a slab of shale that contained fossil crustaceans of an especially ancient and unusual type. Snow was falling, winter comes early to the Canadian Rockies, so they didn't linger. But the next year, at the first opportunity, Walcott returned to the spot. 
Tracing the presumed route to the rock slide, he climbed 750 feet to near the mountain's summit. There, 8,000 feet above sea level, he found a shale outcrop about the length of a city block, containing an unrivaled array of fossils, from soon after the moment when complex life burst forth in dazzling profusion, the famous Cambrian Explosion. Walcott had found, in effect, the holy grail of paleontology. The outcrop became known as the Burgess Shale from the name of the ridge on which it was found, and for a long time it provided our sole vista upon the inception of modern life in all its fullness, as the late Stephen Jay Gould recorded in his popular book Wonderful Life. Gould, ever scrupulous, discovered from reading Walcott's diaries that the story of the Burgess Shale's discovery appears to have been somewhat embroidered. Walcott makes no mention of a slipping horse or falling snow, but there is no disputing that it was an extraordinary find. It is almost impossible for us, whose time on earth is limited to a breezy few decades, to appreciate how remote in time from us the Cambrian outburst was. If you could fly backwards into the past at the rate of one year per second, it would take you about half an hour to reach the time of Christ and a little over three weeks to get back to the beginnings of human life, but it would take you twenty years to reach the dawn of the Cambrian period. It was, in other words, an extremely long time ago, and the world was a very different place. For one thing, five hundred million years ago and more, when the Burgess Shale was formed, it wasn't at the top of a mountain, but at the foot of one. Specifically, it was in a shallow ocean basin at the bottom of a steep cliff. The seas of that time teemed with life, but normally the animals left no record because they were soft-bodied and decayed upon dying. At Burgess, however, the cliff collapsed, and the creatures below, entombed in a mudslide, were pressed like flowers in a book, their features preserved in wondrous detail. In annual summer trips from 1910 to 1925, by which time he was 75 years old, Walcott excavated tens of thousands of specimens. Gould says 80,000, the normally unimpeachable fact-checkers of National Geographic say 60,000, which he brought back to Washington for further study. In both sheer numbers and diversity, the collection was unparalleled. Some of the Burgess fossils had shells, Many others did not. Some of the creatures were sighted, others blind. The variety was enormous, consisting of 140 species by one count. The Burgess Shale included a range of disparity in anatomical designs never again equaled, and not matched today by all the creatures in the world's oceans, Gould wrote. Unfortunately, according to Gould, Walcott failed to discern the significance of what he had found, Snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, Gould wrote in another work, Eight Little Piggies, Walcott then proceeded to misinterpret these magnificent fossils in the deepest possible way. He placed them into modern groups, making them ancestral to today's worms, jellyfish, and other creatures, and thus failed to appreciate their distinctness. Under such an interpretation, Gould sighed, Life began in primordial simplicity and moved inexorably, predictably, onward to more and better. Walcott died in 1927, and the Burgess fossils were largely forgotten. For nearly half a century they stayed shut away in drawers in the American Museum of Natural History in Washington, seldom consulted and never questioned. Then, in 1973, a graduate student from Cambridge University named Simon Conway Morris paid a visit to the collection. He was astonished by what he found. The fossils were far more varied and magnificent than Walcott had indicated in his writings. In taxonomy, the category that describes the basic body plans of organisms is the phylum, and here Conway Morris concluded were drawer after drawer of such anatomical singularities, all amazingly and unaccountably unrecognized by the man who had found them. With his supervisor, Harry Whittington, and fellow graduate student, Derek Briggs, Conway Morris spent the next several years making a systematic revision of the entire collection, and cranking out one exciting monograph after another as discovery piled upon discovery. 
Many of the creatures employed body plans that were not simply unlike anything seen before or since, but were bizarrely different. One, Openabinia, had five eyes and a nozzle-like snout with claws on the end. Another, a disc-shaped thing called Petoya, looked almost comically like a circular pineapple slice. A third had evidently tottered about on rows of stilt-like legs, and was so odd that they named it Hallucigenia. There was so much unrecognized novelty in the collection that at one point, upon opening a new drawer, Conway Morris famously was heard to mutter, Oh, fuck, not another phylum. The English team's revision showed that the Cambrian had been a time of unparalleled innovation and experimentation in body designs. For almost four billion years, life had dawdled along without any detectable ambitions in the direction of complexity. And then, suddenly, in the space of just five or ten million years, it had created all the basic body designs still in use today. Name a creature, from a nematode worm to Cameron Diaz, and they all use architecture first created in the Cambrian party. What was most surprising, however, was that there were so many body designs that had failed to make the cut, so to speak, and left no descendants. Altogether, according to Gould, at least fifteen, and perhaps as many as twenty, of the Burgess animals belonged to no recognized phylum. The number soon grew in some popular accounts to as many as one hundred, far more than the Cambridge scientists ever actually claimed. The history of life, wrote Gould, is a story of massive removal, followed by differentiation within a few surviving stocks, not the conventional tale of steadily increasing excellence, complexity, and diversity. Evolutionary success, it appeared, was a lottery. One creature that did manage to slip through, a small worm-like being called Picaia gracilans, was found to have a primitive spinal column, making it the earliest known ancestor of all later vertebrates, including us. Picaia were by no means abundant among the Burgess fossils, so goodness knows how close they may have come to extinction. Gould, in a famous quotation, leaves no doubt that he sees our lineal success as a fortunate fluke. Wind back the tape of life to the early days of the Burgess Shale, let it play again from an identical starting point, and the chance becomes vanishingly small that anything like human intelligence would grace the replay. Gould's Wonderful Life was published in 1989 to general critical acclaim and was a great commercial success. What wasn't generally known was that many scientists didn't agree with Gould's conclusions at all and that it was all soon to get very ugly. In the context of the Cambrian, explosion would soon have more to do with modern tempers than ancient physiological facts. In fact, we now know, complex organisms existed at least a hundred million years before the Cambrian. We should have known a whole lot sooner. Nearly forty years after Walcott made his discovery in Canada, on the other side of the planet in Australia, a young geologist named Reginald Sprigg found something even older, and in its way, just as remarkable. In 1946, Sprigg, a young assistant government geologist for the state of South Australia, was sent to make a survey of abandoned mines in the Ediacaran Hills of the Flinders Range, an expanse of baking outback some 500 kilometers north of Adelaide. The idea was to see if there were any old mines that might be profitably reworked using newer technologies, so he wasn't studying surface rocks at all, still less fossils, but one day, while eating his lunch, Sprigg idly overturned a hunk of sandstone and was surprised, to put it mildly, to see that the rock surface was covered in delicate fossils, rather like the impression leaves make in mud. These rocks predated the Cambrian explosion. He was looking at the dawn of visible life. Sprigg submitted a paper to Nature, but it was turned down. He read it instead at the next annual meeting of the Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science, but it failed to find favor with the association's head, who said the Eddie Caron imprints were merely fortuitous inorganic markings, patterns made by wind or rain or tides, but not living beings. His hopes not yet entirely crushed, Sprigg traveled to London and presented his findings to the 1948 International Geological Congress, but failed to excite either interest or belief. 
Finally, for want of a better outlet, he published his findings in the Transactions of the Royal Society of South Australia. Then he quit his government job and took up oil exploration. Nine years later, in 1957, a schoolboy named John Mason, while walking through Charnwood Forest in the English Midlands, found a rock with a strange fossil in it, similar to a modern sea pen, and exactly like some of the specimens Sprigg had found and been trying to tell everyone about ever since. The schoolboy handed it in to a paleontologist at the University of Leicester, who identified it at once as Precambrian. Young Mason got his picture in the papers and was treated as a precocious hero. He still is in many books. The specimen was named in his honor, Charnia Masoni. Today, some of Sprigg's original Ediacaran specimens, along with many of the other 1,500 that have been found throughout the Flinders range since that time, can be seen in a glass case in an upstairs room of the stout and lovely South Australian Museum in Adelaide. But they don't attract a great deal of attention. The delicately etched patterns are rather faint and not terribly arresting to the untrained eye. They are mostly small and disc-shaped, with occasional vague trailing ribbons. Forty has described them as soft-bodied oddities. There is still very little agreement about what these things were, or how they lived. They had, as far as can be told, no mouth or anus with which to take in and discharge digestive materials, and no internal organs with which to process them along the way. In life, Forty says, most of them probably simply lay upon the surface of the sandy sediment, like soft, structureless, and inanimate flatfish. At their liveliest, they were no more complex than jellyfish. All the Ediacaran creatures were diploblastic, meaning they were built from two layers of tissue. With the exception of jellyfish, all animals today are triploblastic. Some experts think they weren't animals at all, but more like plants or fungi. The distinctions between plant and animal are not always clear even now. The modern sponge spends its life fixed to a single spot and has no eyes or brain or beating heart, and yet is an animal. When we go back to the Precambrian, the differences between plants and animals were probably even less clear, said Forty. There isn't any rule that says you have to be demonstrably one or the other. Nor is it agreed that the Ediacaran organisms are in any way ancestral to anything alive today, except possibly some jellyfish. Many authorities see them as a kind of failed experiment, a stab at complexity that didn't take, possibly because the sluggish Ediacaran organisms were devoured or outcompeted by the lither and more sophisticated animals of the Cambrian period. There is nothing closely similar alive today, Forty has written. They are difficult to interpret as any kind of ancestors of what was to follow. The feeling was that ultimately they weren't terribly important to the development of life on Earth. Many authorities believe that there was a mass extermination at the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary and that all the Ediacaran creatures, except the uncertain jellyfish, failed to move on to the next phase. The real business of complex life, in other words, started with a Cambrian explosion. That's how Gould saw it in any case. As for the revisions of the Burgess Shale fossils, almost at once people began to question the interpretations, and in particular Gould's interpretation of the interpretations. From the first, there were a number of scientists who doubted the account that Steve Gould had presented. However much they admired the manner of its delivery, Forty wrote in Life, that is putting it mildly. If only Stephen Gould could think as clearly as he writes, barked the Oxford academic Richard Dawkins in the opening line of a review in the Sunday Telegraph of Wonderful Life. Dawkins acknowledged that the book was unputdownable and a literary tour de force, but accused Gould of engaging in a grandiloquent and near disingenuous misrepresentation of the facts by suggesting that the Burgess revisions had stunned the paleontological community. The view that he is attacking, that evolution marches inexorably towards a pinnacle such as man, has not been believed for fifty years, Dawkins fumed. That was a subtlety lost on many general reviewers. One, writing in the New York Times book review, 
cheerfully suggested that as a result of Gould's book, scientists have been throwing out some preconceptions that they had not examined for generations. They are reluctantly or enthusiastically accepting the idea that humans are as much an accident of nature as a product of orderly development. But the real heat directed at Gould arose from the belief that many of his conclusions were simply mistaken or carelessly inflated. Writing in the journal Evolution, Dawkins attacked Gould's assertions that evolution in the Cambrian was a different kind of process from today, and expressed exasperation at Gould's repeated suggestions that the Cambrian was a period of evolutionary experiment, evolutionary trial and error, evolutionary false starts. It was the fertile time when all the great fundamental body plans were invented. Nowadays, evolution just tinkers with old body plans. Back in the Cambrian, new phyla, new classes arose. Nowadays, we only get new species. Noting how often this idea that there are no new body plans is picked up, Dawkins says, It is as though a gardener looked at an oak tree and remarked wonderingly, Isn't it strange that no major new boughs have appeared on this tree for many years? These days all the new growth appears to be at the twig level. It was a strange time, Forty says now especially when you reflected that this was all about something that happened five hundred million years ago. But feelings really did run quite high. I joked in one of my books that I felt as if I ought to put a safety helmet on before writing about the Cambrian period, but it did actually feel a bit like that. Strangest of all was the response of one of the heroes of Wonderful Life, Simon Conway Morris, who startled many in the paleontological community by rounding abruptly on Gould in a book of his own, The Crucible of Creation. I have never encountered such spleen in a book by a professional, Forty wrote later. The casual reader of The Crucible of Creation, unaware of the history, would never gather that the author's views had once been close to, if not actually shared with, Gould's. When I asked Forty about it, he said, Well, it was very strange. Quite shocking, really, because Gould's portrayal of him had been so flattering. I could only assume that Simon was embarrassed. You know, science changes, but books are permanent, and I suppose he regretted being so irremediably associated with views that he no longer altogether held. There was all that stuff about, oh, fuck, another phylum, and I expect he regretted being famous for that. You'd never know from reading Simon's book that his views had once been nearly identical to Gould's. What happened was that the early Cambrian fossils began to undergo a period of critical reappraisal. Forty and Derek Briggs, one of the other principals in Gould's book, used a method known as cladistics to compare the various Burgess fossils. In simple terms, cladistics consists of organizing organisms on the basis of shared features. Forty gives as an example the idea of comparing a shrew and an elephant. If you consider the elephant's large size, and striking trunk, you might conclude that it could have little in common with a tiny, sniffling shrew. But if you compared both of them with a lizard, you would see that the elephant and shrew were in fact built to much the same plan. In essence, what Forty is saying is that Gould saw elephants and shrews where he and Briggs saw mammals. The Burgess creatures, they believed, weren't as strange and various as they appeared at first sight. They were often no stranger than trilobites, Forty says now. It is just that we have had a century or so to get used to trilobites. Familiarity, you know, breeds familiarity. This wasn't, I should note, because of sloppiness or inattention. Interpreting the forms and relationships of ancient animals on the basis of often distorted and fragmentary evidence is clearly a tricky business. Edward O. Wilson has noted that if you took selected species of modern insects and presented them as Burgess-style fossils, nobody would ever guess that they were all from the same phylum. So different are their body plans. Also instrumental in helping revisions were the discoveries of two further early Cambrian sites, one in Greenland and one in China, plus more scattered finds, which among them yielded many additional and often better specimens. The upshot is that the Burgess fossils were found to be not so different after all. Hallucigenia, it turned out, had been reconstructed upside down. Its stilt-like legs were actually spikes along its back. 
Paytoya, the weird creature that looked like a pineapple slice, was found not to be a distinct creature, but merely part of a larger animal called Anomalocaris. Many of the Burgess specimens have now been assigned to living phyla, just where Walcott put them in the first place. Hallucigenia and some others are thought to be related to Onychophora, a group of caterpillar-like animals. Others have been reclassified as precursors of the modern annelids. In fact, says Forty, there are relatively few Cambrian designs that are wholly novel. More often, they turn out to be just interesting elaborations of well-established designs. As he wrote in Life, none was as strange as a present-day barnacle, nor as grotesque as a queen termite. So the Burgess shale specimens weren't so spectacular after all. This made them, as Forty has written, no less interesting or odd, just more explicable. Their weird body plans were just a kind of youthful exuberance, the evolutionary equivalent, as it were, of spiked hair or tongue studs. Eventually the form settled into a staid and stable middle age. But that still left the enduring question of where all these animals had come from, how they had suddenly appeared from nowhere. Alas, it turns out the Cambrian explosion may not have been quite so explosive as all that. The Cambrian animals, it is now thought, were probably there all along, but were just too small to see. Once again it was trilobites that provided the clue, in particular that seemingly mystifying appearance of different types of trilobite in widely scattered locations around the globe, all at more or less the same time. On the face of it, the sudden appearance of lots of fully formed but varied creatures would seem to enhance the miraculousness of the Cambrian outburst, but in fact it did the opposite. It is one thing to have one well-formed creature like a trilobite burst forth in isolation, that really is a wonder, but to have many of them, all distinct but clearly related, turning up simultaneously in the fossil record in places as far apart as China and New York, clearly suggests that we are missing a big part of their history. There could be no stronger evidence that they simply had to have a forebear, some grandfather species that started the line in a much earlier past. And the reason we haven't found these earlier species, it is now thought, is that they were too tiny to be preserved. Says Forty, it isn't necessary to be big to be a perfectly functioning complex organism. The sea swarms with tiny arthropods today that have left no fossil record. He cites the little copepod, which numbers in the trillions in modern seas and clusters in shoals large enough to turn vast areas of the ocean black. And yet our total knowledge of its ancestry is a single specimen found in the body of an ancient fossilized fish. The Cambrian explosion, if that's the word for it, probably was more an increase in size than a sudden appearance of new body types, Forty says and it could have happened quite swiftly. So, in that sense, I suppose it was an explosion. The idea is that just as mammals bided their time for a hundred million years until the dinosaurs cleared off, and then seemingly burst forth in profusion all over the planet, so too, perhaps, the arthropods and other triploblasts waited in semi-microscopic anonymity for the dominant Ediacaran organisms to have their day. Says Forty, we know that mammals increased in size quite dramatically after the dinosaurs went. Though when I say quite abruptly, I of course mean it in a geological sense. We're still talking millions of years. Incidentally, Reginald Sprigg did eventually get a measure of overdue credit. One of the main early genera, Sprigina, was named in his honor, as were several species, and the whole became known as the Ediacaran fauna after the hills through which he had searched. By this time, however, Sprigg's fossil hunting days were long over. After leaving geology, he founded a successful oil company and eventually retired to an estate in his beloved Flinders Range, where he created a wildlife reserve. He died in 1994, a rich man. For a rich man. For a rich man. For a rich man. For Chapter 22. Goodbye to all that. When you consider it from a human perspective, and clearly it would be difficult for us to do otherwise, life is an odd thing. 
It couldn't wait to get going, but then, having got going, it seemed in very little hurry to move on. Consider the lichen. Lichens are just about the hardiest visible organisms on Earth, but among the least ambitious. They will grow happily enough in a sunny churchyard, but they particularly thrive in environments where no other organism would go, on blowy mountaintops and arctic wastes, wherever there is little but rock and rain and cold and almost no competition. In areas of Antarctica, where virtually nothing else will grow, you can find vast expanses of lichen, four hundred types of them, adhering devotedly to every wind-whipped rock. For a long time, people couldn't understand how they did it. Because lichens grew on bare rock without evident nourishment or the production of seeds, many people, educated people, believed they were stones caught in the process of becoming plants. Spontaneously, inorganic stone becomes living plant, rejoiced one observer, a Dr. Hornschuch, in 1819. Closer inspection showed that lichens were more interesting than magical. They are, in fact, a partnership between fungi and algae. The fungi excrete acids which dissolve the surface of the rock, freeing minerals that the algae convert into food, sufficient to sustain both. It is not a very exciting arrangement, but it is a conspicuously successful one. The world has more than 20,000 species of lichens. Like most things that thrive in harsh environments, lichens are slow-growing. It may take a lichen more than half a century to attain the dimensions of a shirt button. Those the size of dinner plates, writes David Attenborough, are therefore likely to be hundreds if not thousands of years old. It would be hard to imagine a less fulfilling existence. They simply exist, Attenborough adds, testifying to the moving fact that life, even at its simplest level, occurs apparently just for its own sake. It is easy to overlook this thought that life just is. As humans, we are inclined to feel that life must have a point. We have plans and aspirations and desires. We want to take constant advantage of all the intoxicating existence we've been endowed with. But what's life to a lichen? Yet its impulse to exist, to be, is every bit as strong as ours, arguably even stronger. If I were told that I had to spend decades being a furry growth on a rock in the woods, I believe I would lose the will to go on. Lichens don't. Like virtually all living things, they will suffer any hardship, endure any insult for a moment's additional existence. Life, in short, just wants to be. But, and here's an interesting point, for the most part, it doesn't want to be much. This is perhaps a little odd, because life has had plenty of time to develop ambitions. If you imagine the 4,500 million years of Earth's history compressed into a normal earthly day, then life begins very early, about 4 a.m., with the rise of the first simple, single-celled organisms, but then advances no further for the next 16 hours. Not until almost 8.30 in the evening, with a day five-sixths over, has the Earth anything to show the universe but a restless skin of microbes. Then, finally, the first sea plants appear, followed twenty minutes later by the first jellyfish and the enigmatic Ediacaran fauna first seen by Reginald Sprigg in Australia. At 9.04 p.m., trilobites swim onto the scene, followed more or less immediately by the shapely creatures of the Burgess Shale. Just before 10 p.m., plants begin to pop up on the land. Soon after, with less than two hours left in the day, the first land creatures follow. Thanks to ten minutes or so of balmy weather, by 1024 the earth is covered in the great carboniferous forests whose residues give us all our coal, and the first winged insects are evident. Dinosaurs plod onto the scene just before 11 p.m. and hold sway for about three quarters of an hour. At 21 minutes to midnight they vanish and the age of mammals begins. Humans emerge one minute and seventeen seconds before midnight. The whole of our recorded history on this scale would be no more than a few seconds, a single human lifetime, barely an instant. Throughout this greatly speeded-up day, continents slide about and bang together at a clip that seems positively reckless.
Mountains rise and melt away, ocean basins come and go, ice sheets advance and withdraw, and throughout the whole, about three times every minute, somewhere on the planet there is a flashbulb pop of light marking the impact of a Manson-sized meteor or larger. It's a wonder that anything at all can survive in such a pummeled and unsettled environment. In fact, not many things do for long. Perhaps an even more effective way of grasping our extreme recentness, as a part of this 4.5 billion year old picture, is to stretch your arms to their fullest extent and imagine that width as the entire history of the Earth. On this scale, according to John McPhee in Basin and Range, the distance from the fingertips of one hand to the wrist of the other is Precambrian. All of complex life is in one hand, and in a single stroke with a medium-grained nail file, you could eradicate human history. Fortunately, that moment hasn't happened, but the chances are good that it will. I don't wish to interject a note of gloom just at this point, but the fact is that there is one other extremely pertinent quality about life on Earth. It goes extinct, quite regularly. For all the trouble they take to assemble and preserve themselves, species crumple and die, remarkably routinely. And the more complex they get, the more quickly they appear to go extinct. Which is perhaps one reason why so much of life isn't terribly ambitious. So any time life does something bold, it is quite an event, and few occasions were more eventful than when life moved on to the next stage in our narrative and came out of the sea. Land was a formidable environment, hot, dry, bathed in intense ultraviolet radiation, lacking the buoyancy that makes movement in water comparatively effortless. To live on land, creatures had to undergo wholesale revisions of their anatomies. Hold a fish at each end and it sags in the middle, its backbone too weak to support it. To survive out of water, marine creatures needed to come up with new, load-bearing internal architecture. Not the sort of adjustment that happens overnight. Above all, and most obviously, any land creature would have to develop a way to take its oxygen directly from the air, rather than filter it from water. These were not trivial challenges to overcome. On the other hand, there was a powerful incentive to leave the water. It was getting dangerous down there. The slow fusion of the continents into a single landmass, Pangaea, meant there was much less coastline than formerly, and thus less coastal habitat. So competition was fierce. There was also an omnivorous and unsettling new type of predator on the scene, one so perfectly designed for attack that it has scarcely changed in all the long eons since its emergence. The shark. Never would there be a more propitious time to find an alternative environment to water. Plants began the process of land colonization about 450 million years ago, accompanied of necessity by tiny mites and other organisms, which they needed to break down and recycle dead organic matter on their behalf. Larger animals took a little longer to emerge, but by about 400 million years ago they were venturing out of the water too. Popular illustrations have encouraged us to envision the first venturesome land dwellers as a kind of ambitious fish, something like the modern mudskipper, which can hop from puddle to puddle during droughts, or even as a fully formed amphibian. In fact, the first visible, mobile residents on dry land were probably much more like modern wood lice, sometimes also known as pill bugs or sow bugs. These are the little bugs, crustaceans in fact, that are commonly thrown into confusion when you upturn a rock or log. For those that learned to breathe oxygen from the air, times were good. Oxygen levels in the Devonian and Carboniferous periods, when terrestrial life first bloomed, were as high as 35%, as opposed to nearer 20% now. This allowed animals to grow remarkably large, remarkably quickly. And how, you may reasonably wonder, can scientists know what oxygen levels were like hundreds of millions of years ago? The answer lies in a slightly obscure but ingenious field known as isotope geochemistry. The long-ago seas of the Carboniferous and Devonian swarmed with tiny plankton, which wrapped themselves inside tiny protective shells, 
Then, as now, the plankton created their shells by drawing oxygen from the atmosphere and combining it with other elements, carbon especially, to form durable compounds such as calcium carbonate. It's the same chemical trick that goes on in and is discussed elsewhere in relation to the long-term carbon cycle, a process that doesn't make for terribly exciting narrative, but is vital for creating a habitable planet. Eventually in this process, all the tiny organisms die and drift to the bottom of the sea, where they are slowly compressed into limestone. Among the tiny atomic structures the plankton take to the grave with them are two very stable isotopes, oxygen-16 and oxygen-18. If you have forgotten what an isotope is, it doesn't matter, though for the record it's an atom with an abnormal number of neutrons. This is where the geochemists come in, for the isotopes accumulate at different rates depending on how much oxygen or carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere at the time of their creation. By comparing the ancient rates of deposition of the two isotopes, geochemists can read conditions in the ancient world, oxygen levels, air and ocean temperatures, the extent and timing of ice ages, and much else. By combining their isotope findings with other fossil residues that indicate other conditions, such as pollen levels and so on, scientists can, with considerable confidence, recreate entire landscapes that no human eye ever saw. The principal reason oxygen levels were able to build so robustly throughout the period of early terrestrial life was that much of the world's landscape was dominated by giant tree ferns and vast swamps, which by their boggy nature disrupted the normal carbon recycling process. Instead of completely rotting down, falling fronds and other dead vegetative matter accumulated in rich, wet sediments, which were eventually squeezed into the vast coal beds that sustain much economic activity even now. The heady levels of oxygen clearly encouraged outsized growth. The oldest indication of a surface animal yet found is a track left 350 million years ago by a millipede-like creature on a rock in Scotland. It was over a meter long. Before the era was out, some millipedes would reach lengths more than double that. With such creatures on the prowl, it is perhaps not surprising that insects in the period evolved a trick that could keep them safely out of tongue shot. They learned to fly. Some took to this new means of locomotion with such uncanny facility that they haven't changed their techniques in all the time since. Then, as now, dragonflies could cruise at over 50 kilometers an hour, instantly stop, hover, fly backwards, and lift far more, proportionately, than any flying machine humans have come up with. The U.S. Air Force, one commentator has written, has put them in wind tunnels to see how they do it, and despaired. They, too, gorged on the rich air. In carboniferous forests, dragonflies grew as big as ravens. Trees and other vegetation likewise attained outsized proportions. Horsetails and tree ferns grew to heights of 15 meters, club mosses to 40 meters. The first terrestrial vertebrates, which is to say the first land animals from which we would derive, are something of a mystery. This is partly because of a shortage of relevant fossils, but partly also because of an idiosyncratic Swede named Eric Jarvik, whose odd interpretations and secretive manner held back progress on this question for almost half a century. Jarvik was part of a team of Scandinavian scholars who went to Greenland in the 1930s and 1940s looking for fossil fish. In particular, they sought lobe-thinned fish of the type that presumably were ancestral to us and all other walking creatures, known as tetrapods. Most animals are tetrapods, and all living tetrapods have one thing in common, four limbs, each of which ends in a maximum of five fingers or toes. Dinosaurs, whales, birds, humans, even fish, all are tetrapods, which clearly suggests they come from a single common ancestor. The clue to this ancestor, it was assumed, would be found in the Devonian era, from about 400 million years ago. Before that time, nothing walked on land. After that time, lots of things did. Luckily, the team found just such a creature, 
a meter-long animal called an ichthyostiga. The analysis of the fossil fell to Jarvik, who began his study in 1948 and kept at it for the next 48 years. Unfortunately, Jarvik refused to let anyone else study his tetrapod. The world's paleontologists had to be content with two sketchy interim papers in which Jarvik noted that the creature had five fingers on each of four limbs, confirming its ancestral importance. Jarvik died in 1998. After his death, other paleontologists eagerly examined the specimen and found that Jarvik had severely miscounted the fingers and toes. There were actually eight on each limb, and failed to observe that the fish could not possibly have walked. The structure of the fin was such that it would have collapsed under its own weight. Needless to say, this did not do a great deal to advance our understanding of the first land animals. Today, three early tetrapods are known, and none has five digits. In short, we don't know quite where we came from. But come we did, though reaching our present state of eminence has not, of course, always been straightforward. Since life on land began, it is consisted of four megadynasties, as they are sometimes called. The first consisted of primitive, plodding, but sometimes fairly hefty amphibians and reptiles. The best-known animal of this age was the Demetrodon, a sail-backed creature that is commonly confused with dinosaurs, including, I note, in a picture caption in the Carl Sagan book Comet. The Demetrodon was in fact a synapsid, so, once upon a time, were we. Synapsids were one of the four main divisions of early reptilian life, the others being anapsids, uriapsids, and diapsids. The names simply refer to the number and location of small holes found in the sides of their owner's skulls. Synapsids had one hole in their lower temples. Diapsids had two. Uriapsids had a single hole higher up. Over time, each of these principal groupings split into further subdivisions, of which some prospered and some faltered. Anapsids gave rise to the turtles, which for a time, perhaps a touch improbably, appeared poised to predominate as the planet's most advanced and deadly species, before an evolutionary lurch let them settle for durability rather than dominance. The synapsids divided into four streams, only one of which survived beyond the Permian. Happily, that was the stream we belong to, and it evolved into a family of proto-mammals known as therapsids. These formed Megadynasty II. Unfortunately for the therapsids, their cousins, the diapsids, were also productively evolving, in their case into dinosaurs, among other things, which gradually proved too much for the therapsids. Unable to compete head-to-head -head with these aggressive new creatures, the therapsids by and large vanished from the record. A very few, however, evolved into small, furry, burrowing beings that bided their time for a very long while as little mammals. The biggest of them grew no larger than a house cat, and most were no bigger than mice. Eventually this would prove their salvation, but they would have to wait nearly 150 million years for Mega Dynasty III, the age of dinosaurs, to come to an abrupt end and make way for Mega Dynasty IV and our own age of mammals. Each of these massive transformations, as well as many smaller ones between and since, was dependent on that paradoxically important motor of progress, extinction. It is a curious fact that on Earth, species death is, in the most literal sense, a way of life. No one knows how many species of organisms have existed since life began. Thirty billion is a commonly cited figure, but the number has been put as high as four thousand billion. Whatever the actual total, 99.99% of all species that have ever lived are no longer with us. To a first approximation, as David Raup of the University of Chicago likes to say, all species are extinct. For complex organisms, the average lifespan of a species is only about four million years, roughly about where we are now. Extinction is always bad news for the victims, of course, but it appears to be a good thing for a dynamic planet. The alternative to extinction is stagnation, says Ian Tattersall of the American Museum of Natural History, and stagnation is seldom a good thing in any realm.
I should perhaps note that we are speaking here of extinction as a natural, long-term process. Extinction brought about by human carelessness is another matter altogether. Crises in the Earth's history are invariably associated with dramatic leaps afterwards. The fall of the Ediacaran fauna was followed by the creative outburst of the Cambrian period. The Ordovician extinction of 440 million years ago cleared the oceans of a lot of immobile filter feeders and somehow created conditions that favored darting fish and giant aquatic reptiles. These, in turn, were in an ideal position to send colonists onto dry land when another blowout in the late Devonian period gave life another sound shaking. And so it has gone at scattered intervals through history. If most of these events hadn't happened just as they did, just when they did, we almost certainly wouldn't be here now. The Earth has seen five major extinction episodes in its time. The Ordovician, Devonian, Permian, Triassic, and Cretaceous, in that order, and many smaller ones. The Ordovician, 440 million years ago, and Devonian, 365 million, each wiped out about 80 to 85 percent of species. The Triassic, 210 million years ago, and Cretaceous, 65 million years, each wiped out 70 to 75 percent of species. But the real whopper was the Permian extinction of about 245 million years ago which raised the curtain on the long age of the dinosaurs. In the Permian, at least 95% of animals known from the fossil record checked out, never to return. Even about a third of insect species went, the only occasion on which they were lost en masse. It is as close as we have ever come to total obliteration. It was truly a mass extinction, a carnage of a magnitude that had never troubled the earth before, says Richard Forty. The Permian event was particularly devastating to sea creatures. Trilobites vanished altogether. Clams and sea urchins nearly went. Virtually all other marine organisms were staggered. Altogether, on land and in the water, it is thought that the earth lost 52% of its families— that's the level above genus and below order on the grand scale of life, the subject of the next chapter, and perhaps as many as 96% of all its species. It would be a long time, as much as 80 million years by one reckoning, before species totals recovered. Two points need to be kept in mind. First, these are all just informed guesses. Estimates for the number of animal species alive at the end of the Permian range from as low as 45,000 to as high as 240,000. If you don't know how many species were alive, you can hardly specify with conviction the proportion that perished. Moreover, we are talking about the death of species, not individuals. For individuals, the death toll could be much higher, in many cases practically total. The species that survived to the next phase of life's lottery almost certainly owe their existence to a few scarred and limping survivors. In between the big kill-offs, there have also been many smaller, less well-known extinction episodes. The Hemphilian, Frasnian, Fomenian, Rancho Labrian, and a dozen or so others, which were not so devastating to total species numbers, but often critically hit certain populations. Grazing animals, including horses, were nearly wiped out in the Hemphilian event about five million years ago. Horses declined to a single species, which appears so sporadically in the fossil record as to suggest that for a time it teetered on the brink of oblivion. Imagine a human history without horses, without grazing animals. In nearly every case, for both big extinctions and more modest ones, we have bewilderingly little idea of what the cause was. Even after stripping out the more crackpot notions, there are still more theories for what caused the extinction events than there have been events. At least two dozen potential culprits have been identified as causes or prime contributors, including global warming, global cooling, changing sea levels, oxygen depletion of the seas, a condition known as anoxia, Epidemics, giant leaks of methane gas from the seafloor, meteor and comet impacts, 
runaway hurricanes of a type known as hypercanes, huge volcanic upwellings, and catastrophic solar flares. This last is a particularly intriguing possibility. Nobody knows how big solar flares can get, because we have only been watching them since the beginning of the space age, but the sun is a mighty engine, and its storms are commensurately enormous. A typical solar flare, something we wouldn't even notice on Earth, will release the energy equivalent of a billion hydrogen bombs and fling into space 100 billion tons or so of murderous high-energy particles. The magnetosphere and atmosphere between them normally swat these back into space or steer them safely towards the poles, where they produce the Earth's comely auroras. But it is thought that an unusually big blast say, a hundred times the typical flare, could overwhelm our ethereal defenses. The light show would be a glorious one, but it would almost certainly kill a very high proportion of all that basked in its glow. Moreover, and rather chillingly, according to Bruce Tsuratani of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, it would leave no trace in history. What all this leaves us with, as one researcher has put it, is tons of conjecture, and very little evidence. Cooling seems to be associated with at least three of the big extinction events, the Ordovician, Devonian, and Permian, but beyond that, little is generally accepted, including whether a particular episode happened swiftly or slowly. Scientists can't agree, for instance, whether the late Devonian extinction, the event that was followed by vertebrates moving on to the land, happened over millions of years, or thousands of years, or in one lively day. One of the reasons it is so hard to produce convincing explanations for extinctions is that it is so very hard to exterminate life on a grand scale. As we have seen from the Manson impact, you can receive a ferocious blow and still stage a full, if presumably somewhat wobbly, recovery. So why, out of all the thousands of impacts Earth has endured, was the KT event of 65 million years ago, which put pay to the dinosaurs, so singularly devastating? Well, first, it was positively enormous. It struck with a force of 100 million megatons. Such an outburst is not easily imagined, but as James Lawrence Powell has pointed out, if you exploded one Hiroshima-sized bomb for every person alive on Earth today you would still be about a billion bombs short of the size of the KT impact. Yet even that alone may not have been enough to wipe out 70% of Earth's life, dinosaurs included. The KT meteor had the additional advantage, advantage if you were a mammal, that is, that it landed in a shallow sea just 10 meters deep, probably at just the right angle, at a time when oxygen levels were 10% higher than at present, and so the world was more combustible. Above all, the floor of the sea where it landed was made of rock rich in sulfur. The result was an impact that turned an area of seafloor the size of Belgium into aerosols of sulfuric acid. For months afterwards, the earth was subjected to rains acid enough to burn skin. In a sense, an even greater question than what wiped out 70% of the species that were existing at the time is, how did the remaining 30% survive? Why was the event so irremediably devastating to every single dinosaur that existed, while other reptiles, like snakes and crocodiles, passed through unimpeded? So far as we can tell, no species of toad, newt, salamander, or other amphibian went extinct in North America. Why should these delicate creatures have emerged unscathed from such an unparalleled disaster, asks Tim Flannery in his fascinating prehistory of America, Eternal Frontier. In the seas, it was much the same story. All the ammonites vanished, but their cousins, the nautiloids, who lived similar lifestyles, swam on. Among plankton, some species were practically wiped out, 92% of foraminiferans, for instance while other organisms like diatoms, designed to a similar plan and living alongside them, were comparatively unscathed. These are difficult inconsistencies. As Richard Forty observes, somehow it does not seem satisfying just to call them lucky ones and leave it at that. 
If, as seems entirely likely, the event was followed by months of dark and choking smoke, then many of the insect survivors become difficult to account for. Some insects, like beetles, Forty notes, could live on wood or other things lying around. But what about those like bees that navigate by sunlight and need pollen? Explaining their survival isn't so easy. Above all, there are the corals. Corals require algae to survive, and algae require sunlight, and both together require steady minimum temperatures. Much publicity has been given in the last few years to corals dying from changes in sea temperatures of only a degree or so. If they are that vulnerable to small changes, how do they survive the long impact winter? There are also many regional variations that are hard to explain. Extinctions seem to have been far less severe in the southern hemisphere than the northern. New Zealand, in particular, appears to have come through largely unscathed, and yet it had almost no burrowing creatures. Even its vegetation was overwhelmingly spared, and yet the scale of conflagration elsewhere suggests that devastation was global. In short, there is just a great deal we don't know. Some animals absolutely prospered, including, a little surprisingly, the turtles once again. As Flannery notes, the period immediately after the dinosaur extinction could well be known as the Age of Turtles. Sixteen species survived in North America, and three more came into existence soon after. Clearly it helped to be at home in water. The KT impact wiped out almost 90% of land-based species, but only 10% of those living in fresh water. Water obviously offered protection against heat and flame, but also presumably provided more sustenance in the lean period that followed. All the land-based animals that survived had a habit of retreating to a safer environment during times of danger, into water or underground either of which would have provided considerable shelter against the ravages without. Animals that scavenged for a living would also have enjoyed an advantage. Lizards were, and are, largely impervious to the bacteria in rotting carcasses. Indeed, often they are positively drawn to them, and for a long while there were clearly a lot of putrid carcasses about. It is often wrongly stated that only small animals survived the KT event, in fact, among the survivors were crocodiles, which were not just large, but three times larger than they are today. But on the whole, it is true, most of the survivors were small and furtive. Indeed, with the world dark and hostile, it was a perfect time to be small, warm-blooded, nocturnal, flexible in diet, and cautious by nature, the very qualities that distinguished our mammalian forebears. Had our evolution been more advanced we would probably have been wiped out. Instead, mammals found themselves in a world to which they were as well suited as anything alive. However, it wasn't as if mammals swarmed forward to fill every niche. Evolution may abhor a vacuum, wrote the paleobiologist Stephen M. Stanley, but it often takes a long time to fill it. For perhaps as many as ten million years, mammals remained cautiously small. In the early tertiary, if you were the size of a bobcat, you could be king. But once they got going, mammals expanded prodigiously, sometimes to an almost preposterous degree. For a time there were guinea pigs the size of rhinos, and rhinos the size of a two-story house. Wherever there was a vacancy in the predatory chain, mammals rose, often literally, to fill it. Early members of the raccoon family migrated to South America, discovered a vacancy, and evolved into creatures the size and ferocity of bears. Birds, too, prospered disproportionately. For millions of years, a gigantic, flightless, carnivorous bird called Titanus was possibly the most ferocious creature in North America. Certainly it was the most daunting bird that ever lived. It stood three meters high, weighed over 350 kilograms, and had a beak that could tear the head off pretty much anything that irked it. Its family survived in formidable fashion for 50 million years, yet until a skeleton was discovered in Florida in 1963, we had no idea that it had ever existed. Which brings us to another reason for our uncertainty about extinctions, the paltriness of the fossil record. 
We have touched already on the unlikelihood of any set of bones becoming fossilized, but the record is actually worse than you might think. Consider dinosaurs. Museums give the impression that we have a global abundance of dinosaur fossils. In fact, overwhelmingly, museum displays are artificial. The giant Diplodocus that dominates the entrance hall of the Natural History Museum in London and has delighted and informed generations of visitors is made entirely of plaster. Built in 1903 in Pittsburgh and presented to the museum by Andrew Carnegie. The entrance hall of the American Museum of Natural History in New York is dominated by an even grander tableau, a skeleton of a large Barasaurus defending her baby from attack by a darting and toothy Allosaurus. It is a wonderfully impressive display. The Barasaurus rises perhaps nine meters towards the high ceiling, but also entirely fake. Every one of the several hundred bones in the display is a cast. Visit almost any large natural history museum in the world, in Paris, Vienna, Frankfurt, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, and what will greet you are antique models, not ancient bones. The fact is we don't really know a great deal about the dinosaurs. For the whole of the age of dinosaurs, fewer than 1,000 species have been identified, almost half of them known from a single specimen, which is about a quarter of the number of mammal species alive now. Dinosaurs, bear in mind, ruled the earth for roughly three times as long as mammals have. So either dinosaurs were remarkably unproductive of species, or we have barely scratched the surface, to use an irresistibly apt cliché. For millions of years through the age of dinosaurs, not a single fossil has yet been found. Even for the period of the late Cretaceous, the most studied prehistoric period there is, thanks to our long interest in dinosaurs and their extinction, some three-quarters of all species that lived may yet be undiscovered. Animals bulkier than the Diplodocus, or more forbidding than Tyrannosaurus, may have roamed the earth in their thousands, and we may never know it. Until very recently, everything known about the dinosaurs of this period came from only about 300 specimens, representing just 16 species. The scantiness of the record led to the widespread belief that dinosaurs were already on their way out when the KT impact occurred. In the late 1980s, a paleontologist from the Milwaukee Public Museum, Peter Sheehan, decided to conduct an experiment. Using 200 volunteers, he made a painstaking census of a well-defined but also well-picked-over area of the famous Hell Creek Formation in Montana, Sifting meticulously, the volunteers collected every last tooth and vertebra and chip of bone. Everything that had been overlooked by previous diggers. The work took three years. When they had finished, they found that they had more than tripled, for the planet, the number of dinosaur fossils from the late Cretaceous. The survey established that dinosaurs remained numerous right up to the time of the KT impact. There is no reason to believe that the dinosaurs were dying out gradually during the last three million years of the Cretaceous, Sheehan reported. We are so used to the notion of our own inevitability as life's dominant species that it is hard to grasp that we are here only because of timely extraterrestrial bangs and other random flukes. The one thing we have in common with all other living things is that for nearly four billion years our ancestors have managed to slip through a series of closing doors every time we needed them to. Stephen Jay Gould expressed it succinctly in a well-known line, Humans are here today because our particular line never fractured, never once at any of the billion points that could have erased us from history. We started this chapter with three points. Life wants to be. Life doesn't always want to be much. Life from time to time goes extinct. To this we may add a fourth. Life goes on. And often, as we shall see, it goes on in ways that are decidedly amazing. 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 Chapter 23 the richness of being.
Here and there in the Natural History Museum in London, built into recesses along the underlit corridors or standing between glass cases of minerals and ostrich eggs and a century or so of other productive clutter, are secret doors, at least secret in the sense that there is nothing about them to attract the visitor's notice. Occasionally you might see someone with a distracted manner and interestingly willful hair that mark the scholar emerge from one of the doors and hasten down a corridor, probably to disappear through another door a little further on, but this is a relatively rare event. For the most part, the doors stay shut, giving no hint that beyond them exists another, a parallel natural history museum as vast as, and in many ways more wonderful than, the one the public knows and adores. The Natural History Museum contains some 70 million objects from every realm of life and every corner of the planet, with another 100,000 or so added to the collection each year. But it is really only behind the scenes that you get a sense of what a treasure house this is. In cupboards and cabinets and long rooms full of close-packed shelves are kept tens of thousands of pickled animals in bottles, millions of insects pinned to squares of card, drawers of shiny mollusks, bones of dinosaurs, skulls of early humans, endless folders of neatly pressed plants. It is a little like wandering through Darwin's brain. The spirit room alone holds fifteen miles of shelving containing jar upon jar of animals preserved in methylated spirit. Back here are specimens collected by Joseph Banks in Australia, Alexander von Humboldt in Amazonia, and Darwin on the Beagle Voyage, and much else that is either very rare or historically important, or both. Many people would love to get their hands on these things. A few actually have. In 1954, the museum acquired an outstanding ornithological collection, from the estate of a devoted collector named Richard Meinertshagen, author of Birds of Arabia, among other scholarly works. Meinertshagen had been a faithful attendee of the museum for years, coming almost daily to take notes for the production of his books and monographs. When the crates arrived, the curators excitedly levered them open to see what they had been left, and were surprised, to put it mildly, to discover that a very large number of specimens bore the museum's own labels. Mr. Meinertshagen, it turned out, had been helping himself to their collections for years. It explained his habit of wearing a large overcoat even during warm weather. A few years later, a charming old regular in the mollusks department, quite a distinguished gentleman, I was told, was caught inserting valued seashells into the hollow legs of his zimmer frame. I don't suppose there's anything in here that somebody somewhere doesn't covet. Richard Forty said, with a thoughtful air, as he gave me a tour of the beguiling world that is the behind-the-scenes part of the museum. We wandered through a confusion of departments where people sat at large tables, doing intent investigative things with arthropods and palm fronds and boxes of yellowed bones. Everywhere there was an air of unhurried thoroughness, of people being engaged in a gigantic endeavor that could never be completed and mustn't be rushed. In 1967, I had read, the museum issued its report on the John Murray Expedition, an Indian Ocean survey, 44 years after the expedition had concluded. This is a world where things move at their own pace, including a tiny lift Forty and I shared with a scholarly-looking elderly man with whom Forty chatted genially and familiarly, as we proceeded upwards at about the rate that sediments are laid down. When the man departed, Forty said to me, That was a very nice chap named Norman, who spent forty-two years studying one species of plant, St. John's wort. He retired in 1989, but he still comes in every week. How do you spend forty-two years on one species of plant? I asked. It's remarkable, isn't it? Forty agreed. He thought for a moment. He's very thorough, apparently. The lift door opened to reveal a bricked-over opening. Forty looked confounded. That's very strange, he said. That used to be botany back there. He punched a button for another floor, and we found our way at length to botany by means of back staircases and discreet trespass through yet more departments where investigators toiled lovingly over once-living objects. 
And so it was that I was introduced to Len Ellis and the quiet world of bryophytes, mosses to the rest of us. When Emerson poetically noted that mosses favor the north sides of trees, the moss upon the forest bark was pole star when the night was dark, he really meant lichens, for in the nineteenth century mosses and lichens weren't distinguished. True mosses aren't actually fussy about where they grow, so they are no good as natural compasses. In fact, mosses aren't actually much good for anything. Perhaps no great group of plants has so few uses, commercial or economic, as the mosses, wrote Henry S. Conard, perhaps just a touch sadly, in How to Know the Mosses and Liverworts, published in 1956 and still to be found on many library shelves as almost the only attempt to popularize the subject. They are, however, prolific. Even with lichens removed, bryophytes is a busy realm, with over 10,000 species contained within some 700 genera. The plump and stately Moss Flora of Britain and Ireland by A. J. E. Smith runs to 700 pages, and Britain and Ireland are by no means outstandingly mossy places. The tropics are where you find the variety, Len Ellis told me. A quiet spare man, he has been at the Natural History Museum for 27 years, and curator of the department since 1990. You can go out into a place like the rainforests of Malaysia and find new varieties with relative ease. I did that myself not long ago. I looked down, and there was a species that had never been recorded. So we don't know how many species are still to be discovered? Oh, no, no idea. You might not think that there will be that many people in the world prepared to devote lifetimes to the study of something so inescapably low-key. But in fact, moss people number in the hundreds, and they feel very strongly about their subject. Oh, yes, Ellis told me. The meetings can get very lively at times. I asked him for an example of controversy. Well, here's one inflicted on us by one of your countrymen, he said, smiling lightly and opened a hefty reference work containing illustrations of mosses whose most notable characteristic to the uninstructed eye was their uncanny similarity one to another. That, he said, tapping a moss, used to be one genus, Drepanoclidus. Now it's been reorganized into three, Drepanoclidus, Warnstorphia, and Hamataculus. And did that lead to blows, I asked, perhaps a touch hopefully. Well, it made sense. It made perfect sense. But it meant a lot of reordering of collections, and it put all the books out of date for a time, so there was a bit of, you know, grumbling. Mosses offer mysteries as well, he told me. One famous case, famous to moss people anyway, involved a retiring type called Hyophila stanfordensis, which was discovered on the campus of Stanford University in California, and later also found growing beside a path in Cornwall, but has never been encountered anywhere in between. How it came to exist in two such unconnected locations is anybody's guess. It's now known as Henediella Stanfordensis, Ellis said, another revision. We nodded thoughtfully. When a new moss is found, it must be compared with all other mosses to make sure that it hasn't been recorded already. Then a formal description must be written, and illustrations prepared, and the result published in a respectable journal. The whole process seldom takes less than six months. The twentieth century was not a great age for moss taxonomy. Much of the century's work was devoted to untangling the confusions and duplications left behind by the nineteenth century. That was the golden age of moss collecting. You may recall that Charles Lyell's father was a great moss man. One aptly named Englishman, George Hunt, hunted British mosses so assiduously that he probably contributed to the extinction of several species. But it is thanks to such efforts that Len Ellis's collection is one of the world's most comprehensive. All 780,000 of his specimens are pressed into large folded sheets of heavy paper, some very old and covered with spidery Victorian script. Some, for all we know, might have been in the hand of Robert Brown, the great Victorian botanist, unveiler of Brownian motion and the nucleus of cells, who founded and ran the museum's botany department for its first thirty-one years until his death in 1858. All the specimens, 
are kept in lustrous old mahogany cabinets so strikingly fine that I remarked upon them. Oh, those were Sir Joseph Banks's from his house in Soho Square, Ella said casually, as if identifying a recent purchase from Ikea. He had them built to hold his specimens from the Endeavour voyage. He regarded the cabinets thoughtfully, as if for the first time in a long while. I don't know how we ended up with them in bryology, he added. This was an amazing disclosure. Joseph Banks was England's greatest botanist, and the Endeavour voyage, that is, the one on which Captain Cook charted the 1769 transit of Venus and claimed Australia for the crown, among rather a lot else, was the greatest botanical expedition in history. Banks paid £10,000, about £600,000 in today's money, to take himself and a party of nine others, a naturalist, a secretary, three artists, and four servants, on the three-year adventure around the world. Goodness knows what the bluff Captain Cook made of such a velvety and pampered assemblage, but he seems to have liked Banks well enough and could not but admire his talents in botany, a feeling shared by posterity. Never before or since has a botanical party enjoyed greater triumphs. Partly it was because the voyage took in so many new or little-known places, Tierra del Fuego, Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, New Guinea. But mostly it was because Banks was such an astute and inventive collector. Even when unable to go ashore at Rio de Janeiro because of a quarantine, he sifted through a bale of fodder sent for the ship's livestock and made new discoveries. Nothing, it seems, escaped his notice. Altogether, he brought back 30,000 plant specimens, including 1,400 not seen before, enough to increase by about a quarter the number of known plants in the world. But Banks's grand cash was only part of the total haul in what was an almost absurdly acquisitive age. Plant collecting in the 18th century became a kind of international mania. Glory and wealth alike awaited those who could find new species and botanists and adventurers went to the most incredible lengths to satisfy the world's craving for horticultural novelty. Thomas Nuttall, the man who named the Wisteria after Caspar Wister, came to America as an uneducated printer, but discovered a passion for plants, and walked halfway across the country and back again, collecting hundreds of growing things never seen before. John Fraser, for whom is named the Fraser Fir, spent years in the wilderness collecting on behalf of Catherine the Great, and emerged at length to find that Russia had a new czar who thought he was mad and refused to honor his contract. Fraser took everything to Chelsea, where he opened a nursery and made a handsome living selling rhododendrons, azaleas, magnolias, Virginia creepers, asters, and other colonial exotica to a delighted English gentry. Huge sums could be made with the right finds. John Lyon, an amateur botanist, spent two hard and dangerous years collecting specimens, but cleared almost £125,000 in today's money for his efforts. Many, however, just did it for the love of botany. Nuttall gave most of what he found to the Liverpool Botanic Gardens. Eventually, he became director of Harvard's Botanic Garden and author of the encyclopedic Genera of North American Plants, which he not only wrote, but also largely typeset. And that was just plants. There was also all the fauna of the new worlds, kangaroos, kiwis, raccoons, bobcats, mosquitoes, and other curious forms beyond imagining. The volume of life on Earth was seemingly infinite, as Jonathan Swift noted in some famous lines. So, naturalists observe, a flea hath smaller fleas that on him prey and these have smaller still to bite them, and so proceed ad infinitum. All this new information needed to be filed, ordered, and compared with what was known. The world was desperate for a workable system of classification. Fortunately, there was a man in Sweden who stood ready to provide it. His name was Carl Linné, later changed, with permission, to the more aristocratic von Linné but he is remembered now by the Latinized form Carolus Linnaeus. He was born in 1707 in the village of Reschult in southern Sweden, the son of a poor but ambitious Lutheran curate. 
and was such a sluggish student that his exasperated father apprenticed him, or by some accounts nearly apprenticed him, to a cobbler. Appalled at the prospect of spending a lifetime banging tacks into leather, young Linnae begged for another chance, which was granted, and he never thereafter wavered from academic distinction. He studied medicine in Sweden and Holland, though his passion became the natural world. In the early 1730s, still in his twenties, he began to produce catalogues of the world's plant and animal species, using a system of his own devising, and gradually his fame grew. Rarely has a man been more comfortable with his own greatness. He spent much of his leisure time penning long and flattering portraits of himself, declaring that there had never been a greater botanist or zoologist, and that his system of classification was the greatest achievement in the realm of science. Modestly, he suggested that his gravestone should bear the inscription Princeps Botanicorum, Prince of Botanists. It was never wise to question his generous self-assessments. Those who did so were apt to find they had weeds named after them. Linnaeus's other striking quality was an abiding, at times one might say a feverish, preoccupation with sex. He was particularly struck by the similarity between certain bivalves and the female pudenda. To the parts of one species of clam, he gave the names vulva, labia, pubes, anus, and hymen. He grouped plants by the nature of their reproductive organs and endowed them with an arrestingly anthropomorphic amorousness. His descriptions of flowers and their behavior are full of references to promiscuous intercourse, barren concubines, and the bridal bed. In spring, he wrote in one oft-quoted passage, Love comes even to the plants. Males and females hold their nuptials, showing by their sexual organs which are males, which females. The flower's leaves serve as a bridal bed, which the Creator has so gloriously arranged, adorned with such noble bed curtains, and perfumed with so many soft scents, that the bridegroom with his bride might there celebrate their nuptials with so much the greater solemnity. When the bed has thus been made ready, then is the time for the bridegroom to embrace his beloved bride and surrender himself to her. He named one genus of plants Clitoria. Not surprisingly, many people thought him strange. But his system of classification was irresistible. Before Linnaeus, plants were given names that were expansively descriptive. The common ground cherry was called Physalis amno ramosissime ramis angulosis glabris foliis dentoceratis. Linnaeus lopped it back to Physalis angulata, which name it still uses. The plant world was equally disordered by inconsistencies of naming. A botanist could not be sure if Rosa sylvestris alba cum rubore folio glabro was the same plant that others called Rosa sylvestris inodora su canina. Linnaeus solved the puzzlement by calling it simply Rosa Canina. To make these excisions useful and agreeable to all required much more than simply being decisive. It required an instinct, a genius, in fact, for spotting the salient qualities of a species. The Linnaean system is so well established that we can hardly imagine an alternative. But before Linnaeus, systems of classification were often highly whimsical. Animals might be categorized by whether they were wild or domesticated, terrestrial or aquatic, large or small, even whether they were thought handsome and noble or of no consequence. Buffon arranged his animals by their utility to man. Anatomical considerations barely came into it. Linnaeus made it his life's work to rectify this deficiency by classifying all that was alive according to its physical attributes. Taxonomy which is to say the science of classification has never looked back. It all took time, of course. The first edition of his great Systema Naturae in 1735 was just 14 pages long, but it grew and grew, until by the twelfth edition, the last that Linnaeus would live to see, it extended to three volumes and 2,300 pages. In the end, he named or recorded some 13,000 species of plant and animal. Other works were more comprehensive, 
John Ray's three-volume Historia Generalis Plantarum in England, completed a generation earlier, covered no fewer than 18,625 species of plants alone. But what Linnaeus had that no one else could touch was consistency, order, simplicity, and timeliness. Though his work dates from the 1730s, it didn't become widely known in England until the 1760s, just in time to make Linnaeus a kind of father figure to British naturalists. Nowhere was his system adopted with greater enthusiasm, which is why, for one thing, the Linnaean Society has its home in London and not Stockholm. Linnaeus was not flawless. He made room for mythical beasts and monstrous humans, whose descriptions he gullibly accepted from seamen and other imaginative travellers. Among these were a wild man, Homo ferus, who walked on all fours and had not yet mastered the art of speech, and Homo caudatis, man with a tail. But then it was, as we should not forget, an altogether more credulous age. Even the great Joseph Banks took a keen and believing interest in a series of reported sightings of mermaids off the Scottish coast at the end of the 18th century. For the most part, however, Linnaeus's lapses were offset by sound and often brilliant taxonomy. Among other accomplishments, he saw that whales belonged with cows, mice, and other common terrestrial animals in the order Quadrupedia, later changed to Mammalia, which no one had done before. In the beginning, Linnaeus intended to give each plant only a genus name and a number, Convolvulus I, Convolvulus II, and so on. But he soon realized that that was unsatisfactory, and hit on the binomial arrangement that remains at the heart of the system to this day. The intention originally was to use the binomial system for everything, rocks, minerals, diseases, winds, whatever existed in nature. Not everyone embraced the system warmly. Many were disturbed by its tendency toward indelicacy, which was slightly ironic, as before Linnaeus, the common names of many plants and animals had been heartily vulgar. The dandelion was long popularly known as the pissabed because of its supposed diuretic properties, and other names in everyday use included mare's fart, naked ladies, twitch bollock, hound's piss, open arse, and bum towel. One or two of these earthy appellations may unwittingly survive in English yet. The maidenhair in maidenhair moss, for instance, does not refer to the hair on the maiden's head. At all events, it had long been felt that the natural sciences would be appreciably dignified by a dose of classical renaming. So there was a certain dismay in discovering that the self-appointed prince of botany had sprinkled his texts with such designations as clitoria, fornicata, and vulva. Over the years, many of these were quietly dropped, though not all. The common slipper limpet still answers on formal occasions to crepidula fornicata, and many other refinements introduced as the needs of the natural sciences grew more specialized. In particular, the system was bolstered by the gradual introduction of additional hierarchies. Genus, plural genera, and species had been employed by naturalists for over a hundred years before Linnaeus, and order, class, and family in their biological senses all came into use in the 1750s and 60s. But phylum wasn't coined until 1876 by the German Ernst Haeckel, and family and order were treated as interchangeable until early in the 20th century. For a time, zoologists used family where botanists placed order, to the occasional confusion of nearly everyone. Linnaeus had divided the animal world into six categories, mammals, reptiles, birds, fishes, insects, and vermes, or worms, for everything that didn't fit into the first five. From the outset, it was evident that putting lobsters and shrimp into the same category as worms was unsatisfactory, and various new categories, such as mollusca and crustacea, were created. Unfortunately, these new classifications were not uniformly applied from nation to nation. In an attempt to re-establish order, the British in 1842 proclaimed a new set of rules called the Stricklandian Code, but the French saw this as high-handed, and the Société Zoologique countered with its own conflicting code. Meanwhile, the American Ornithological Society, for obscure reasons, decided to use the 1758 edition of Systema Naturae, 
as the basis for all its naming, rather than the 1766 edition used elsewhere, which meant that many American birds spent the 19th century logged in different genera from their avian cousins in Europe. Not until 1902, at an early meeting of the International Congress of Zoology, did naturalists begin at last to show a spirit of compromise and adopt a universal code. Taxonomy is described sometimes as a science and sometimes as an art, but really it's a battleground. Even today there is more disorder in the system than most people realize. Take the category of the phylum, the division that describes the basic body plans of organisms. A few phyla are generally well known, such as mollusks, the home of clams and snails, arthropods, insects and crustaceans, and chordates, us and all other animals with a backbone or proto-backbone. Thereafter, things move swiftly in the direction of obscurity. Among the obscure, we might list Gnathostomulida, marine worms, Cnidaria, jellyfish, medusae, anemones and corals, and the delicate Priapulida, or little penis worms. Familiar or not, these are elemental divisions. Yet there is surprisingly little agreement on how many phyla there are or ought to be. Most biologists fix the total at about 30, but some opt for a number in the low 20s, while Edward O. Wilson, in The Diversity of Life, puts the number at a surprisingly robust 89. It depends on where you decide to make your divisions, whether you are a lumper or a splitter, as they say in the biological world. At the more workaday level of species, the possibilities for disagreements are even greater. Whether a species of grass should be called Aegilops in curva, Aegilops in curvata, or Aegilops ovata may not be a matter that would stir many non-botanists to passion, but it can be a source of very lively heat in the right quarters. The problem is that there are 5,000 species of grass, and many of them look awfully alike, even to people who know grass. In consequence, some species have been found and named at least 20 times, and there are hardly any, it appears, that haven't been independently identified at least twice. The two-volume Manual of the Grasses of the United States devotes 200 closely typeset pages to sorting out all the synonymies, as the biological world refers to its inadvertent but quite common duplications, and that is just for the grasses of a single country. To deal with disagreements on the global stage, a body known as the International Association for Plant Taxonomy arbitrates on questions of priority and duplication. At intervals, it hands down decrees, declaring that Zauschneria californica, a common plant in rock gardens, is to be known henceforth as Epilobium canum, or that Agliothamnion tenuissimum may now be regarded as conspecific with Agliothamnion bisoides, but not with Agliothamnion pseudobisoides. Normally, these are small matters of tidying up that attract little notice, but when they touch on beloved garden plants, as they sometimes do, shrieks of outrage inevitably follow. In the late 1980s, the common chrysanthemum was banished, on apparently sound scientific principles, from the genus of the same name, and relegated to the comparatively drab and undesirable world of the genus Dendranthema. Chrysanthemum breeders are a proud and numerous lot, and they protested to the real if improbable-sounding Committee on Spermatophyta. There are also committees for Pteridophyta, Bryophyta, and Fungi, among others, all reporting to an executive called the Rapporteur General. This is truly an institution to cherish. Although the rules of nomenclature are supposed to be rigidly applied, botanists are not indifferent to sentiment, and in 1995 the decision was reversed. Similar adjudications have saved petunias, euonymus, and a popular species of amaryllis from demotion, but not many species of geraniums, which some years ago were transferred amid howls to the genus Pelagonium. The disputes are entertainingly surveyed in Charles Eliot's The Potting Shed Papers. Disputes and reorderings of much the same type can be found in all the other realms of the living, so keeping an overall tally is not nearly as straightforward a matter as you might suppose. In consequence, the rather amazing fact is that we don't have the faintest idea 
not even to the nearest order of magnitude, in the words of Edward O. Wilson, of the number of things that live on our planet. Estimates range from three million to two hundred million. More extraordinary still, according to a report in The Economist, as much as 97% of the world's plant and animal species may still await discovery. Of the organisms that we do know about, more than 99 in 100 are only sketchily described. A scientific name, a handful of specimens in a museum, and a few scraps of description in scientific journals is how Wilson describes the state of our knowledge. In the diversity of life, he estimated the number of known species of all types, plants, insects, microbes, algae, everything, at 1.4 million, but added that that was just a guess. Other authorities have put the number of known species slightly higher, at around 1.5 million to 1.8 million. But there is no central registry of these things, so nowhere to check numbers. In short, the remarkable position in which we find ourselves is that we don't actually know what we actually know. In principle, you ought to be able to go to experts in each area of specialization, ask how many species there are in their fields, then add the totals. Many people have, in fact, done so. The problem is that seldom do any two come up with matching figures. Some sources put the number of known types of fungi at 70,000, others at 100,000, nearly half as many again. You can find confident assertions that the number of described earthworm species is 4,000, and equally confident assertions that the figure is 12,000. For insects, the numbers run from 750,000 to 950,000 species. These are, you understand, supposedly the known number of species. For plants, the commonly accepted numbers range from 248,000 to 265,000. That may not seem too vast a discrepancy, but it's more than 20 times the number of flowering plants in the whole of North America. Putting things in order is not the easiest of tasks. In the early 1960s, Colin Groves of the Australian National University began a systematic survey of the 250-plus known species of primate. Oftentimes, it turned out that the same species had been described more than once, sometimes several times, without any of the discoverers realizing that they were dealing with an animal that was already known to science. It took Groves four decades to untangle everything, and that was with a comparatively small group of easily distinguished, generally non-controversial creatures. Goodness knows what the results would be if anyone attempted a similar exercise with the planet's estimated 20,000 types of lichens, 50,000 species of mollusk, or 400,000-plus beetles. What is certain is that there is a great deal of life out there, though the actual quantities are necessarily estimates based on extrapolations, sometimes exceedingly expansive extrapolations. In a well-known exercise in the 1980s, Terry Irwin of the Smithsonian Institution saturated a stand of 19 rainforest trees in Panama with an insecticide fog, then collected everything that fell into his nets from the canopy. Among his haul, actually hauls, since he repeated the experiment seasonally to make sure he caught migrant species, were 1,200 types of beetle. On the basis of the distribution of beetles elsewhere, the number of other tree species in the forest, the number of forests in the world, the number of other insect types, and so on up a long chain of variables, he estimated a figure of 30 million species of insects for the entire planet, a figure he later said was too conservative. Others using the same or similar data have come up with figures of 13 million, 80 million, or 100 million insect types, underlining the conclusion that however carefully arrived at, such figures inevitably owe at least as much to supposition as to science. According to the Wall Street Journal, the world has about 10,000 active taxonomists. Not a great number when you consider how much there is to be recorded. But, the journal adds, because of the cost, about 1,250 pounds per species, and paperwork, only about 15,000 new species of all types are logged per year. 
It's not a biodiversity crisis, it's a taxonomist crisis, barks Cohen Mays, Belgian-born head of invertebrates at the Kenyan National Museum in Nairobi, whom I met briefly on a visit to the country in the autumn of 2002. There were no specialized taxonomists in the whole of Africa, he told me. There was one in the Ivory Coast, but I think he has retired, he said. It takes eight to ten years to train a taxonomist, but none are coming along in Africa. They are the real fossils, Mays added. He himself was to be let go at the end of the year, he said. After seven years in Kenya, his contract was not being renewed. No funds, Mays explained. Writing in the journal Nature a few months earlier, the British biologist G. H. Godfrey noted that there is a chronic lack of prestige and resources for taxonomists everywhere. In consequence, many species are being described poorly in isolated publications with no attempt to relate a new taxon to existing species and classifications. Moreover, much of taxonomists' time is taken up not with describing new species, but simply with sorting out old ones. Many, according to Godfrey, spend most of their career trying to interpret the work of 19th-century systematists, deconstructing their often inadequate published descriptions or scouring the world's museums for type material that is often in very poor condition. Godfrey particularly stresses the absence of attention being paid to the systematizing possibilities of the Internet. The fact is that taxonomy, by and large, is still quaintly wedded to paper. In an attempt to haul things into the modern age, in 2001, Kevin Kelly, co-founder of Wired magazine, launched an enterprise called the All Species Foundation with the aim of finding and recording on a database every living organism. The cost of such an exercise has been estimated at anywhere from 1.3 billion pounds to as much as 30 billion pounds. As of the spring of 2002, the foundation had just 750,000 pounds in funds and four full-time employees. If, as the numbers suggest, we have perhaps a hundred million species of insects yet to find, and if our rates of discovery continue at the present pace, we should have a definitive total for insects in a little over 15,000 years. The rest of the animal kingdom may take a little longer. So why do we know as little as we do? There are nearly as many reasons as there are animals left to count. But here are a few of the principal causes. Most living things are small and easily overlooked. In practical terms, this is not always a bad thing. You might not slumber quite so contentedly if you were aware that your mattress is home to perhaps two million microscopic mites which come out in the wee hours to sup on your sebaceous oils and feast on those lovely crunchy flakes of skin that you shed as you doze and toss. Your pillow alone may be home to 40,000 of them. To them, your head is just one large oily bonbon. And don't think a clean pillowcase will make a difference. To something on the scale of bed mites, the weave of the tightest human fabric looks like ship's rigging. Indeed, if your pillow is six years old, which is apparently about the average age for a pillow, it has been estimated that one-tenth of its weight will be made up of sloughed skin, living mites, dead mites, and mite dung. To quote the man who did the measuring, Dr. John Maunder of the British Medical Entomology Center, but at least they are your mites. Think of what you snuggle up with each time you climb into a hotel bed. These mites have been with us since time immemorial but they weren't discovered until 1965. If creatures as intimately associated with us as bed mites escaped our notice until the age of color television, it's hardly surprising that most of the rest of the small-scale world is barely known to us. Go out into the woods, any woods at all, bend down and scoop up a handful of soil, and you will be holding up to 10 billion bacteria, most of them unknown to science. Your sample will also contain perhaps a million plump yeasts, some 200,000 hairy little fungi known as molds, perhaps 10,000 protozoans, of which the most familiar is the amoeba, and assorted rotifers, flatworms, roundworms, and other microscopic creatures known collectively as cryptozoa. A large portion of these will also be unknown.
The most comprehensive handbook of microorganisms, Berge's Manual of Systematic Bacteriology, lists about 4,000 types of bacteria. In the 1980s, a pair of Norwegian scientists, Jostein Goxer and Vigdis Torsvik, collected a gram of random soil from a beech forest near their lab in Bergen and carefully analyzed its bacterial content. They found that this single small sample contained between 4,000 and 5,000 separate bacterial species, more than in the whole of Berge's manual. They then traveled to a coastal location a few miles away, scooped up another gram of earth, and found that it contained four to five thousand other species. As Edward O. Wilson observes, if over nine thousand microbial types exist in two pinches of substrate from two localities in Norway, how many more await discovery in other radically different habitats? Well, according to one estimate, it could be as many as four hundred million. We don't look in the right places. In The Diversity of Life, Wilson describes how one botanist spent a few days tramping around ten hectares of jungle in Borneo and discovered a thousand new species of flowering plant, more than are found in the whole of North America. The plants weren't hard to find. It's just that no one had looked there before. Cohen Mays of the Kenyan National Museum told me that he went to one cloud forest, as mountaintop forests are known in Kenya, and in half an hour of not particularly dedicated looking, found four new species of millipedes, three representing new genera, and one new species of tree. Big tree, he added, and shaped his arms as if about to dance with a very large partner. Cloud forests are found on the tops of plateaus, and have sometimes been isolated for millions of years. They provide the ideal climate for biology, and they have hardly been studied, he said. Overall, tropical rainforests cover only about 6% of Earth's surface, but they harbor more than half of its animal life, and about two-thirds of its flowering plants, and most of this life remains unknown to us because too few researchers spend time in them. Not incidentally, much of this could be quite valuable. At least 99% of flowering plants have never been tested for their medicinal properties. Because they can't flee from predators, plants have had to contrive elaborate chemical defenses, and so are particularly rich in intriguing compounds. Even now, nearly a quarter of all prescribed medicines are derived from just 40 plants, with another 16% coming from animals or microbes, so there is a serious risk, with every hectare of forest felled, of losing medically vital possibilities. Using a method called combinatorial chemistry, chemists can generate 40,000 compounds at a time in labs, but these products are random and not uncommonly useless, whereas any natural molecule will have already passed what the economist calls the ultimate screening program over three and a half billion years of evolution. Looking for the unknown isn't simply a matter of traveling to remote or distant places, however. In his book, Life and Unauthorized Biography, Richard Forty notes how one ancient bacterium was found on the wall of a country pub, where men had urinated for generations, a discovery that would seem to involve rare amounts of luck and devotion and possibly some other quality not specified. There aren't enough specialists. The stock of things to be found, examined, and recorded very much outruns the supply of scientists available to do it. Take the hardy and little-known organisms known as deloid rotifers. These are microscopic animals that can survive almost anything. When conditions are tough, they curl up into a compact shape, switch off their metabolism, and wait for better times. In this stage, you can drop them into boiling water or freeze them almost to absolute zero, that is, the level where even atoms give up. And when this torment is finished and they are returned to a more pleasing environment, they will uncurl and move on as if nothing has happened. So far, about 500 species have been identified, though other sources say 360. But nobody has any idea, even remotely, how many there may be altogether. For years, almost all that was known about them was thanks to the work of a devoted amateur, 
a London clerical worker named David Bryce, who studied them in his spare time. They can be found all over the world. But you could have all the Deloitte Rotifer experts in the world to dinner and not have to borrow plates from the neighbors. Even creatures as important and ubiquitous as fungi, and fungi are both, attract comparatively little notice. Fungi are everywhere, and come in many forms, as mushrooms, molds, mildews, yeasts, and puffballs, to name but a sampling, and they exist in volumes that most of us little suspect. Gather together all the fungi found in a typical hectare of meadowland, and you would have 2,800 kilograms of the stuff. These are not marginal organisms. Without fungi, there would be no potato blights, Dutch elm disease, jock itch, or athlete's foot, but also no yogurts, or beers, or cheeses. Altogether, about 70,000 species of fungi have been identified, but it is thought the total number could be as high as 1.8 million. A lot of mycologists work in industry, making cheeses and yogurts and the like so it is hard to say how many are actively involved in research. But we can safely take it that there are more species of fungi to be found than there are people to find them. The world is a really big place. We have been gulled by the ease of air travel and other forms of communication into thinking that the world is not all that big. But at ground level, where researchers must work, it is actually enormous, enormous enough to be full of surprises. The okapi, the nearest living relative of the giraffe, is now known to exist in substantial numbers in the rainforests of Zaire. The total population is estimated at perhaps 30,000, yet its existence wasn't even suspected until the 20th century. The large, flightless New Zealand bird called the takahi, had been presumed extinct for 200 years before being found living in a rugged area of the country's South Island. In 1995, a team of French and British scientists in Tibet, who were lost in a snowstorm in a remote valley, came across a breed of horse called the Rywoch that had previously been known only from prehistoric cave drawings. The valley's inhabitants were astonished to learn that the horse was considered a rarity in the wider world. Some people think even greater surprises may await us. A leading British ethnobiologist, wrote The Economist in 1995, thinks a megatherium, a sort of giant ground sloth which may stand as high as a giraffe, may lurk in the fastnesses of the Amazon basin. Perhaps significantly, the ethnobiologist wasn't named. Perhaps even more significantly, nothing more has been heard of him or his giant sloth. No one, however, can categorically say that no such thing is there until every jungly glade has been investigated, and we are a long way from achieving that. But even if we groomed thousands of field workers and dispatched them to the furthest corners of the world, it would not be effort enough, for wherever life can be, it is. Life's extraordinary fecundity is amazing, even gratifying, but also problematic. To survey it all, you would have to turn over every rock, sift through the litter on every forest floor, sieve unimaginable quantities of sand and dirt, climb into every forest canopy, and devise much more efficient ways to examine the seas. Even then, you would overlook whole ecosystems. In the 1980s, amateur cave explorers entered a deep cave in Romania that had been sealed off from the outside world for a long but unknown period and found 33 species of insects and other small creatures, spiders, centipedes, lice, all blind, colorless, and new to science. They were living off the microbes in the surface scum of pools, which in turn were feeding on hydrogen sulfide from hot springs. Our instinct may be to see the impossibility of tracking everything down as frustrating, dispiriting, perhaps even appalling, but it can just as well be viewed as almost unbearably exciting. We live on a planet that has a more or less infinite capacity to surprise. What reasoning person could possibly want it any other way? What is nearly always most arresting in any ramble through the scattered disciplines of modern science is realizing how many people have been willing to devote lifetimes to the most sumptuously esoteric lines of inquiry. 
In one of his essays, Stephen Jay Gould notes how a hero of his named Henry Edward Crampton spent 50 years, from 1906 to his death in 1956, quietly studying a genus of land snails called Partula in Polynesia. Over and over, year after year, Crampton measured to the tiniest degree, to eight decimal places, the whorls and arcs and gentle curves of numberless Partula, compiling the results into fastidiously detailed tables. A single line of text in a Crampton table could represent weeks of measurement and calculation. Only slightly less devoted, and certainly more unexpected, was Alfred C. Kinsey, who became famous for his studies of human sexuality in the 1940s and 1950s. Before his mind became filled with sex, so to speak, Kinsey was an entomologist, and a dogged one at that. In one expedition lasting two years, he hiked 4,000 kilometers to assemble a collection of 300,000 wasps. How many stings he collected along the way is not, alas, recorded. Something that had been puzzling me was the question of how you assured a chain of succession in these arcane fields. Clearly, there cannot be many institutions in the world that require or are prepared to support specialists in barnacles or Pacific snails. As we parted at the Natural History Museum in London, I asked Richard Forty how science ensures that when one person goes, there's someone ready to take his place. He chuckled rather heartily at my naivete. I'm afraid it's not as if we have substitutes sitting on the bench somewhere waiting to be called in to play. When a specialist retires, or even more unfortunately dies, that can bring a stop to things in that field, sometimes for a very long while. And I suppose that's why you value someone who spends 42 years studying a single species of plant, even if it doesn't produce anything terribly new. Precisely, he said, precisely. And he really seemed to mean it. Chapter 24. Cells It starts with a single cell. The first cell splits to become two, and the two become four, and so on. After just 47 doublings, you have 10,000 trillion cells in your body and are ready to spring forth as a human being. And every one of those cells knows exactly what to do to preserve and nurture you from the moment of conception to your last breath. You have no secrets from your cells. They know far more about you than you do. Each one carries a copy of the complete genetic code, the instruction manual for your body, so it knows how to do not only its own job, but every other job in the body, too. Never in your life will you have to remind a cell to keep an eye on its adenosine triphosphate levels, or to find a place for the extra squirt of folic acid that's just unexpectedly turned up. It will do that for you, and millions more things besides. Every cell in nature is a thing of wonder. Even the simplest are far beyond the limits of human ingenuity. To build the most basic yeast cell, for example, you would have to miniaturize about the same number of components as are found in a Boeing 777 jetliner and fit them into a sphere just five microns across. Then, somehow, you would have to persuade that sphere to reproduce. But yeast cells are as nothing compared with human cells, which are not just more varied and complicated, but vastly more fascinating because of their complex interactions. Your cells are a country of 10,000 trillion citizens, each devoted in some intensively specific way to your overall well-being. There isn't a thing they don't do for you. They let you feel pleasure and form thoughts. They enable you to stand and stretch and caper. When you eat, they extract the nutrients, distribute the energy, and carry off the wastes. All those things you learned about in school biology, but they also remember to make you hungry in the first place, and reward you with a feeling of well-being afterwards so that you won't forget to eat again. They keep your hair growing, your ears waxed, your brain quietly purring. 
They manage every corner of your being. They will jump to your defense the instant you are threatened. They will unhesitatingly die for you. Billions of them do daily. And not once in all your years have you thanked even one of them. So let us take a moment now to regard them with the wonder and appreciation they deserve. We understand a little of how cells do the things they do, how they lay down fat or manufacture insulin or engage in many of the other acts necessary to maintain a complicated entity like yourself, but only a little. You have at least 200,000 different types of protein laboring away inside you, and so far we understand what no more than about 2% of them do. Others put the figure at more like 50%. It depends, apparently, on what you mean by understand. Surprises at the cellular level turn up all the time. In nature, nitric oxide is a formidable toxin and a common component of air pollution. So scientists were naturally a little surprised when in the mid-1980s they found it being produced in a curiously devoted manner in human cells. Its purpose was at first a mystery, but then scientists began to find it all over the place, controlling the flow of blood and the energy level of cells, attacking cancers and other pathogens, regulating the sense of smell, even assisting in penile erections. It also explained why nitroglycerin, the well-known explosive, soothes the heart pain known as angina. It is converted into nitric oxide in the bloodstream, relaxing the muscle linings of vessels, allowing blood to flow more freely. In barely the space of a decade, this one gassy substance went from extraneous toxin to ubiquitous elixir. You possess some few hundred different types of cell, according to the Belgian biochemist Christian de Duve, and they vary enormously in size and shape, from nerve cells, whose filaments can stretch to over a meter, to tiny disc-shaped red blood cells, to the rod-shaped photocells that help to give us vision. They also come in a sumptuously wide range of sizes, nowhere more strikingly than at the moment of conception, when a single beating sperm confronts an egg 85,000 times bigger than it, which rather puts the notion of male conquest into perspective. On average, however, a human cell is about 20 microns wide. That is about two hundredths of a millimeter which is too small to be seen, but roomy enough to hold thousands of complicated structures like mitochondria and millions upon millions of molecules. In the most literal way, cells also vary in liveliness. Your skin cells are all dead. It's a somewhat galling notion to reflect that every inch of your surface is deceased. If you are an average-sized adult, you are lugging around over two kilograms of dead skin of which several billion tiny fragments are sloughed off each day. Run a finger along a dusty shelf, and you are drawing a pattern very largely in old skin. Most living cells seldom last more than a month or so, but there are some notable exceptions. Liver cells can survive for years, though the components within them may be renewed every few days. Brain cells last as long as you do. You are issued with a hundred billion or so at birth, and that is all you are ever going to get. It has been estimated that you lose 500 of them an hour, so if you have any serious thinking to do, there really isn't a moment to waste. The good news is that the individual components of your brain cells are constantly renewed, so that, as with the liver cells, no part of them is actually likely to be more than about a month old. Indeed, it has been suggested that there isn't a single bit of any of us, not so much as a stray molecule, that was part of us nine years ago. It may not feel like it, but at the cellular level, we are all youngsters. The first person to describe a cell was Robert Hooke, whom we last encountered squabbling with Isaac Newton over credit for the invention of the inverse square law. Hooke achieved many things in his 68 years. He was both an accomplished theoretician and a dab hand at making ingenious and useful instruments but nothing he did brought him greater admiration than his popular book Microphagia, or Some Physiological Descriptions of Miniature Bodies Made by Magnifying Glasses, published in 1665. 
It revealed to an enchanted public a universe of the very small that was far more diverse, crowded, and finely structured than anyone had ever come close to imagining. Among the microscopic features first identified by Hook were little chambers in plants that he called cells, because they reminded him of monks' cells. Hook calculated that a one-inch square of cork would contain 1,259,712,000 of these tiny chambers, the first appearance of such a very large number anywhere in science. Microscopes by this time had been around for a generation or so, but what set hooks apart were their technical supremacy. They achieved magnifications of 30 times, making them the last word in 17th century optical technology. So it came as something of a shock when just a decade later, Hook and the other members of London's Royal Society began to receive drawings and reports from an unlettered linen draper in the Dutch city of Delft, employing magnifications of up to 275 times. The draper's name was Antony van Leeuwenhoek. Though he had little formal education and no background in science, he was a perceptive and dedicated observer and a technical genius. To this day, it is not known how he got such magnificent magnifications from such simple handheld devices, which were little more than modest wooden dowels with a tiny bubble of glass embedded in them, far more like magnifying glasses than what most of us think of as microscopes, but really not much like either. Leeuwenhoek made a new instrument for every experiment he performed, and was extremely secretive about his techniques though he did sometimes offer tips to the British on how they might improve their resolutions. Over a period of fifty years, beginning remarkably enough when he was already past forty, Leeuwenhoek made almost two hundred reports to the Royal Society, all written in Low Dutch, the only tongue of which he was master. He offered no interpretations, but simply the facts of what he had found, accompanied by exquisite drawings. He sent reports on almost everything that could be usefully examined. Bread mold, a bee's stinger, blood cells, teeth, hair, his own saliva, excrement, and semen, these last with fretful apologies for their inescapably unsavory nature, nearly all of which had never been seen microscopically before. After he reported finding animalcules in a sample of pepper water in 1676, the members of the Royal Society spent a year with the best devices English technology could produce, searching for the little animals, before getting the magnification right. What Leeuwenhoek had found were protozoa. He calculated that there were 8,280,000 of these tiny beings in a single drop of water, more than the number of people in Holland. The world teemed with life in ways and numbers that no one had previously suspected. Inspired by Leeuwenhoek's fantastic findings, others began to peer into microscopes with such keenness that they sometimes found things that weren't in fact there. One respected Dutch observer, Nicholas Hartsucker, was convinced he saw tiny, preformed men in sperm cells. He called the little beings homunculi, and for some time many people believed that all humans, indeed all creatures, were simply vastly inflated versions of tiny but complete precursor beings. Leeuwenhoek himself occasionally got carried away with his enthusiasms. In one of his least successful experiments, he tried to study the explosive properties of gunpowder by observing a small blast at close range. He nearly blinded himself in the process. In 1683, Leeuwenhoek discovered bacteria. But that was about as far as progress could get for the next century and a half because of the limitations of microscope technology. Not until 1831 would anyone first see the nucleus of a cell. It was found by the Scottish botanist Robert Brown, that frequent but always shadowy visitor to the history of science. Brown, who lived from 1773 to 1858, called it nucleus from the Latin nucula, meaning little nut or kernel. Only in 1839, however, did anyone realize that all living matter is cellular. It was Theodor Schwann, a German, who had this insight, and it was not only comparatively late, as scientific insights go, but not widely embraced at first. 
It wasn't until the 1860s and some landmark work by Louis Pasteur in France that it was shown conclusively that life cannot arise spontaneously but must come from pre-existing cells. The belief became known as the cell theory, and it is the basis of all modern biology. The cell has been compared to many things, from a complex chemical refinery by the physicist James Treffel to a vast teeming metropolis, the biochemist Guy Brown. A cell is both of those things and neither. It is like a refinery in that it is devoted to chemical activity on a grand scale and like a metropolis in that it is crowded and busy and filled with interactions that seem confused and random but clearly have some system to them. But it is a much more nightmarish place than any city or factory that you have ever seen. To begin with, there is no up or down inside the cell. Gravity doesn't meaningfully apply at the cellular scale. And not an atom's width of space is unused. There is activity everywhere, and a ceaseless thrum of electrical energy. You may not feel terribly electrical, but you are. The food we eat and the oxygen we breathe are combined in the cells into electricity. The reason we don't give each other massive shocks or scorch the sofa when we sit down is that it is all happening on a tiny scale, a mere 0.1 volts, traveling distances measured in nanometers. However, scale that up, and it would translate as a jolt of 20 million volts per meter, about the same as the charge carried by the main body of a thunderstorm. Whatever their size or shape, nearly all your cells are built to fundamentally the same plan. They have an outer casing or membrane, a nucleus wherein resides the necessary genetic information to keep you going, and a busy space between the two called the cytoplasm. The membrane is not, as most of us imagine it, a durable, rubbery casing, something that you would need a sharp pin to prick. Rather, it is made up of a type of fatty material known as a lipid, which has the approximate consistency of a light grade of machine oil, to quote Sherwin B. Newland. If that seems surprisingly insubstantial, bear in mind that at the microscopic level, things behave differently. To anything on a molecular scale, water becomes a kind of heavy-duty gel, and a lipid is like iron. If you could visit a cell, you wouldn't like it. Blown up to a scale at which atoms were about the size of peas, a cell itself would be a sphere roughly half a mile across, and supported by a complex framework of girders called the cytoskeleton. Within it, millions upon millions of objects, some the size of basketballs, others the size of cars, would whiz about like bullets. There wouldn't be a place you could stand without being pummeled and ripped thousands of times every second from every direction. Even for its full-time occupants, the inside of a cell is a hazardous place. Each strand of DNA is on average attacked or damaged once every 8.4 seconds, 10,000 times in a day, by chemicals and other agents that whack into or carelessly slice through it, and each of these wounds must be swiftly stitched up if the cell is not to perish. The proteins are especially lively, spinning, pulsating, and flying into each other up to a billion times a second. Enzymes, themselves a type of protein, dash everywhere, performing up to a thousand tasks a second. Like greatly speeded up worker ants, they busily build and rebuild molecules, hauling a piece off this one, adding a piece to that one. Some monitor passing proteins and mark with a chemical those that are irreparably damaged or flawed. Once so selected, the doomed proteins proceed to a structure called a proteasome, where they are stripped down and their components used to build new proteins. Some types of protein exist for less than half an hour. Others survive for weeks. But all lead existences that are inconceivably frenzied. As de Duve notes, the molecular world must necessarily remain entirely beyond the powers of our imagination owing to the incredible speed with which things happen in it. But slow things down to a speed at which the interactions can be observed, and things don't seem quite so unnerving. You can see that a cell is just millions of objects, lysosomes, endosomes, ribosomes, ligands, 
peroxisomes, proteins of every size and shape, bumping into millions of other objects and performing mundane tasks, extracting energy from nutrients, assembling structures, getting rid of waste, warding off intruders, sending and receiving messages, making repairs. Typically, a cell will contain some 20,000 different types of protein, and of these, about 2,000 types will each be represented by at least 50,000 molecules. This means, says Newland, that even if we count only those molecules present in amounts of more than 50,000 each, the total is still a very minimum of 100 million protein molecules in each cell. Such a staggering figure gives some idea of the swarming immensity of biochemical activity within us. It is all an immensely demanding process. Your heart must pump 343 liters of blood an hour, over 8,000 liters every day, 3 million liters in a year. That's enough to fill four Olympic-sized swimming pools to keep all those cells freshly oxygenated. And that's at rest. During exercise, the rate can increase as much as sixfold. The oxygen is taken up by the mitochondria. These are the cell's power stations, and there are about a thousand of them in a typical cell, though the number varies considerably depending on what a cell does and how much energy it requires. You may recall from an earlier chapter that the mitochondria are thought to have originated as captive bacteria, and that they now live essentially as lodgers in our cells preserving their own genetic instructions, dividing to their own timetable, speaking their own language. You may also recall that we are at the mercy of their goodwill. Here's why. Virtually all the food and oxygen you take into your body are delivered after processing to the mitochondria, where they are converted into a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. You may not have heard of ATP, but it is what keeps you going. ATP molecules are essentially little battery packs that move through the cell, providing energy for all the cell's processes. And you get through a lot of it. At any given moment, a typical cell in your body will have about one billion ATP molecules in it. And in two minutes, every one of them will have been drained dry and another billion will have taken their place. Every day you produce and use up a volume of ATP equivalent to about half your body weight. Feel the warmth of your skin. That's ATP at work. When cells are no longer needed, they die, with what can only be called great dignity. They take down all the struts and buttresses that hold them together and quietly devour their component parts. The process is known as apoptosis, or programmed cell death. Every day, billions of your cells die for your benefit, and billions of others clean up the mess. Cells can also die violently, for instance when infected, but mostly they die because they are told to. Indeed, if not told to live, if not given some kind of active instruction from another cell, cells automatically kill themselves. Cells need a lot of reassurance. When, as occasionally happens, a cell fails to expire in the prescribed manner, but rather begins to divide and proliferate wildly, we call the result cancer. Cancer cells are really just confused cells. Cells make this mistake fairly regularly, but the body has elaborate mechanisms for dealing with it. It is only very rarely that the process spirals out of control. On average, humans suffer one fatal malignancy for each 100 million billion cell divisions, Cancer is bad luck in every possible sense of the term. The wonder of cells is not that things occasionally go wrong, but that they manage everything so smoothly for decades at a stretch. They do so by constantly sending and monitoring streams of messages, a cacophony of messages, from all around the body. Instructions, queries, corrections, requests for assistance, updates, notices to divide or expire. Most of these signals arrive by means of couriers called hormones, chemical entities such as insulin, adrenaline, estrogen, and testosterone that convey information from remote outposts like the thyroid and endocrine glands. Still other messages arrive by telegraph from the brain or from regional centers in a process called paracrine signaling. 
Finally, cells communicate directly with their neighbors to make sure their actions are coordinated. What is perhaps most remarkable is that it is all just random, frantic action, a sequence of endless encounters directed by nothing more than elemental rules of attraction and repulsion. There is clearly no thinking presence behind any of the actions of the cells. It all just happens, smoothly and repeatedly, and so reliably that seldom are we even conscious of it. Yet somehow all this produces not just order within the cell, but a perfect harmony right across the organism. In ways that we have barely begun to understand, trillions upon trillions of reflexive chemical reactions add up to a mobile, thinking, decision-making you. Or come to that, a rather less reflective but still incredibly organized dung beetle. Every living thing, never forget, is a wonder of atomic engineering. Indeed, some organisms that we think of as primitive enjoy a level of cellular organization that makes our own look carelessly pedestrian. Disassemble the cells of a sponge, bypassing them through a sieve, for instance, then dump them into a solution, and they will find their way back together and build themselves into a sponge again. You can do this to them over and over, and they will doggedly reassemble, because, like you and me and every other living thing, they have one overwhelming impulse to continue to be. And that's because of a curious, determined, barely understood molecule that is itself not alive and for the most part doesn't do anything at all. We call it DNA. And to begin to understand its supreme importance to science and to us, we need to go back 160 years or so to Victorian England, to the moment when the naturalist Charles Darwin had what has been called the single best idea that anyone has ever had, and then, for reasons that take a little explaining, locked it away in a drawer for the next 15 years. Chapter 25. Darwin's Singular Notion In the late summer or early autumn of 1859, Whitwell Elwin, editor of the respected British journal The Quarterly Review, was sent an advance copy of a new book by the naturalist Charles Darwin. Elwin read the book with interest, and agreed that it had merit, but feared that the subject matter was too narrow to attract a wide audience. He urged Darwin to write a book about pigeons instead. Everyone is interested in pigeons, he observed helpfully. Elwin's sage advice was ignored, and On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life was published in late November 1859, priced at 15 shillings. The first edition of 1,250 copies sold out on the first day. It has never been out of print, and scarcely out of controversy in all the time since. Not bad going for a man whose principal other interest was earthworms, and who, but for a single impetuous decision to sail around the world, would very probably have passed his life as an anonymous country parson known for, well, for an interest in earthworms. Charles Robert Darwin was born on the 12th of February, 1809, in Shrewsbury, a sedate market town in the West Midlands. His father was a prosperous and well-regarded physician. His mother, who died when Charles was only eight, was the daughter of Josiah Wedgwood, of pottery fame. Darwin enjoyed every advantage of upbringing, but continually pained his widowed father with his lackluster academic performance. You care for nothing but shooting, dogs, and rat-catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and all your family wrote the elder Darwin, in a line that nearly always appears just about here in any review of Charles's early life. Although his inclination was to natural history, for his father's sake he tried to study medicine at Edinburgh University, but couldn't bear the blood and suffering. The experience of witnessing an operation on an understandably distressed child, this was in the days before anesthetics, of course, left him permanently traumatized. He tried law instead, but found that insupportably dull, and finally managed, more or less by default, to acquire a degree in divinity from Cambridge. 
A life in a rural vicarage seemed to await him when from out of the blue there came a more tempting offer. Darwin was invited to sail on the naval survey ship HMS Beagle, essentially as dinner company for the captain, Robert Fitzroy, whose rank precluded his socializing with anyone other than a gentleman. Fitzroy, who was very odd, chose Darwin in part because he liked the shape of Darwin's nose. It betokened depth of character, he believed. Darwin was not Fitzroy's first choice, but got the nod when Fitzroy's preferred companion dropped out. From a 21st century perspective, the two men's most striking shared feature was their extreme youthfulness. At the time of sailing, Fitzroy was only 23, Darwin just 22. Fitzroy's formal assignment was to chart coastal waters, but his hobby, passion really, was to seek out evidence for a literal, biblical interpretation of creation. That Darwin was trained for the ministry was central to Fitzroy's decision to have him aboard. That Darwin subsequently proved to be not only liberal of view, but less than wholeheartedly devoted to Christian fundamentals, became a source of lasting friction between them. Darwin's time aboard the Beagle from 1831 to 1836 was obviously the formative experience of his life, but also one of the most trying. He and his captain shared a small cabin, which can't have been easy, as Fitzroy was subject to fits of fury followed by spells of simmering resentment. He and Darwin constantly engaged in quarrels, some bordering on insanity, as Darwin later recalled. Ocean voyages tended to become melancholy undertakings at the best of times, the previous captain of the Beagle had put a bullet through his brain during a moment of lonely gloom, and Fitzroy came from a family well known for a depressive instinct. His uncle, Viscount Castlereagh, had slit his throat the previous decade while serving as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Fitzroy would himself commit suicide by the same method in 1865. Even in his calmer moods, Fitzroy proved strangely unknowable. Darwin was astounded to learn, upon the conclusion of their voyage, that almost at once Fitzroy married a young woman, to whom he had long been betrothed. In five years in Darwin's company he had not once hinted at an attachment, or even mentioned her name. In every other respect, however, the Beagle voyage was a triumph. Darwin experienced adventure enough to last a lifetime and accumulated a horde of specimens sufficient to make his reputation and keep him occupied for years. He found a magnificent trove of giant ancient fossils, including the finest megatherium known to date, survived a lethal earthquake in Chile, discovered a new species of dolphin, which he dutifully named Delphinus Fitzroyi, conducted diligent and useful geological investigations throughout the Andes, and developed a new and much-admired theory for the formation of coral atolls, which suggested, not incidentally, that atolls could not form in less than a million years, the first hint of his long-standing attachment to the extreme antiquity of earthly processes. In 1836, aged 27, he returned home, having been away for five years and two days. He never left England again. One thing Darwin didn't do on the voyage was propound the theory, or even a theory, of evolution. For a start, evolution as a concept was already decades old by the 1830s. Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus, had paid tribute to evolutionary principles in a poem of inspired mediocrity called The Temple of Nature, years before Charles was even born. It wasn't until the younger Darwin was back in England and read Thomas Malthus's essay on the principle of population which proposed that increases in food supply could never keep up with population growth for mathematical reasons, that the idea began to percolate through his mind that life is a perpetual struggle and that natural selection was the means by which some species prospered while others failed. Specifically, what Darwin saw was that all organisms compete for resources, and those that had some innate advantage would prosper and pass on that advantage to their offspring. By such means would species continuously improve. It seems an awfully simple idea. It is an awfully simple idea, but it explained a great deal, and Darwin was prepared to devote his life to it. 
How stupid of me not to have thought of it, T.H. Huxley cried upon reading on the origin of species. It is a view that has been echoed ever since. Interestingly, Darwin didn't use the phrase survival of the fittest in any of his work, though he did express his admiration for it. The expression was coined in 1864, five years after the publication of On the Origin of Species, by Herbert Spencer in Principles of Biology. Nor did he employ the word evolution in print until the sixth edition of Origin, by which time its use had become too widespread to resist, preferring instead descent with modification. Nor, above all, were his conclusions in any way inspired by his noticing, during his time in the Galapagos Islands, an interesting diversity in the beaks of finches. The story as conventionally told, or at least as frequently remembered by many of us, is that Darwin, while traveling from island to island, noticed that on each the finches' beaks were marvelously adapted for exploiting local resources, that on one island beaks were sturdy and short and good for cracking nuts, while on the next island beaks were perhaps long and thin and well-suited for winkling food out of crevices, and it was this that set him to thinking that perhaps the birds had not been created this way, but had, in a sense, created themselves. In fact, the birds had created themselves, but it wasn't Darwin who noticed it. At the time of the Beagle voyage, Darwin was fresh out of university, and not yet an accomplished naturalist, and so failed to see that the Galapagos birds were all of a type. It was his friend, the ornithologist John Gould, who realized that what Darwin had found was lots of finches with different talents. Unfortunately, in his inexperience, Darwin had not noted which birds came from which islands. He had made a similar error with tortoises. It took years to sort the models out. Because of these various oversights, and the need to sort through crates and crates of other beagle specimens, it wasn't until 1842, five years after his return to England, that Darwin finally began to sketch out the rudiments of his new theory. These he expanded into a 230-page sketch two years later, and then he did an extraordinary thing. He put his notes away, and for the next decade and a half busied himself with other matters. He fathered ten children, devoted nearly eight years to writing an exhaustive opus on barnacles. I hate a barnacle as no man ever did before, he sighed, understandably, upon the work's conclusion, and fell prey to strange disorders that left him chronically listless, faint, and flurried, as he put it. The symptoms nearly always included a terrible nausea and generally also incorporated palpitations, migraines, exhaustion, trembling, spots before the eyes, shortness of breath, swimming of the head, and, not surprisingly, depression. The cause of the illness has never been established. The most romantic and perhaps likely of the many suggested possibilities is that he suffered from Chagas's disease, a lingering tropical malady that he could have acquired from the bite of a benchuga bug in South America. A more prosaic explanation is that his condition was psychosomatic. In either case, the misery was not. Often he could work for no more than twenty minutes at a stretch, sometimes not even that. Much of the rest of his time was devoted to a series of increasingly desperate treatments. Icy plunge baths, dousings in vinegar, draping himself with electric chains that subjected him to small jolts of current, he became something of a hermit, seldom leaving his home in Kent, down house. One of his first acts upon moving to the house was to erect a mirror outside his study window, so that he could identify and, if necessary, avoid collars. Darwin kept his theory to himself because he well knew the storm it would cause. In 1844, the year he locked his notes away, a book called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation roused much of the thinking world to fury by suggesting that humans might have evolved from lesser primates without the assistance of a divine creator. Anticipating the outcry, the author had taken careful steps to conceal his identity, which he kept a secret from even his closest friends for the next forty years. Some wondered if Darwin himself might be the author. Others suspected Prince Albert. In fact, the author was a successful and generally unassuming Scottish publisher named Robert Chambers, 
whose reluctance to reveal himself had a practical dimension as well as a personal one. His firm was a leading publisher of Bibles. Vestiges was warmly blasted from pulpits throughout Britain and far beyond, but also attracted a good deal of more scholarly ire. The Edinburgh Review devoted nearly an entire issue, 85 pages, to pulling it to pieces. Even T. H. Huxley, a believer in evolution, attacked the book with some venom, unaware that the author was a friend. Darwin's own manuscript might have remained locked away till his death, but for an alarming blow that arrived from the Far East in the early summer of 1858, in the form of a packet containing a friendly letter from a young naturalist named Alfred Russell Wallace, and the draft of a paper on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type, outlining a theory of natural selection that was uncannily similar to Darwin's secret jottings. Even some of the phrasing echoed Darwin's own. I never saw a more striking coincidence, Darwin reflected in dismay. If Wallace had my manuscript sketch written out in 1842, he could not have made a better short abstract. Wallace didn't drop into Darwin's life quite as unexpectedly as is sometimes suggested. The two were already corresponding, and Wallace had more than once generously sent Darwin specimens that he thought might be of interest. In the process of these exchanges, Darwin had discreetly warned Wallace that he regarded the subject of species creation as his exclusive territory. This summer will make the twentieth year since I opened my first notebook on the question of how and in what way do species and varieties differ from each other, he had written to Wallace some time earlier. I am now preparing my work for publication, he added, even though he wasn't really. Wallace failed to grasp what Darwin was trying to tell him, and in any case, of course, he could have had no idea that his own theory was so nearly identical to one that Darwin had been evolving, as it were, for two decades. Darwin was placed in an agonizing quandary. If he rushed into print to preserve his priority, he would be taking advantage of an innocent tip-off from a distant admirer. But if he stepped aside, as gentlemanly conduct arguably required, he would lose credit for a theory that he had independently propounded. Wallace's theory was, by Wallace's own admission, the result of a flash of insight. Darwin's was the product of years of careful, plodding, methodical thought. It was all crushingly unfair. To compound his misery, Darwin's youngest son, also named Charles, had contracted scarlet fever and was critically ill. At the height of the crisis, on the 28th of June, the child died. Despite the distraction of his son's illness, Darwin found time to dash off letters to his friends Charles Lyell and Joseph Hooker, offering to step aside but noting that to do so would mean that all his work, whatever it may amount to, will be smashed. Lyell and Hooker came up with a compromise solution of presenting a summary of Darwin's and Wallace's ideas together. The venue they settled on was a meeting of the Linnaean Society, which at the time was struggling to find its way back into fashion as a seat of scientific eminence. On the 1st of July, 1858, Darwin's and Wallace's theory was unveiled to the world. Darwin himself was not present. On the day of the meeting, he and his wife were burying their son. The Darwin-Wallace presentation was one of seven that evening. One of the others was on the flora of Angola, and if the thirty or so people in the audience had any idea that they were witnessing the scientific highlight of the century, they showed no sign of it. No discussion followed, nor did the event attract much notice elsewhere. Darwin cheerfully noted later that only one person, a Professor Houghton of Dublin, mentioned the two papers in print, and his conclusion was that all that was new in them was false, and what was true was old. Wallace, still in the distant east, learned of these maneuverings long after the event, but was remarkably equable, and seemed pleased to have been included at all. He even referred to the theory forever after as Darwinism. Much less amenable to Darwin's claim of priority was a Scottish gardener named Patrick Matthew, who had, rather remarkably, also come up with the principles of natural selection more than twenty years earlier. In fact, in the very year that Darwin had set sail in the Beagle. Unfortunately, Matthew had published these views in a book called Naval Timber and Arboriculture, 
which had been missed not just by Darwin, but by the entire world. Matthew kicked up in a lively manner with a letter to Gardner's Chronicle when he saw Darwin gaining credit everywhere for an idea that really was his. Darwin apologized without hesitation, though he did note for the record, I think that no one will feel surprised that neither I, nor apparently any other naturalist, has heard of Mr. Matthew's views, considering how briefly they are given, and they appeared in the appendix to a work on naval timber and arboriculture. Wallace continued for another fifty years as a naturalist and thinker, occasionally a very good one, but increasingly fell from scientific favor by taking up dubious interests, such as spiritualism and the possibility of life existing elsewhere in the universe. So the theory became, essentially by default, Darwin's alone. Darwin never ceased being tormented by his ideas. He referred to himself as the devil's chaplain and said that revealing the theory felt like confessing a murder. Apart from all else, he knew it deeply pained his beloved and pious wife. Even so, he set to work at once expanding his manuscript into a book-length work. Provisionally, he called it an abstract of an essay on the origin of species and varieties through natural selection, a title so tepid and tentative that his publisher John Murray decided to issue just 500 copies. But once presented with a manuscript and a slightly more arresting title, Murray reconsidered and increased the initial print run to 1,250. On the Origin of Species was an immediate commercial success, but rather less of a critical one. Darwin's theory presented two intractable difficulties. It needed far more time than Lord Kelvin was willing to concede, and it was scarcely supported by fossil evidence. Where, asked Darwin's more thoughtful critics, were the transitional forms that his theory so clearly called for? If new species were continuously evolving, then there ought to be lots of intermediate forms scattered across the fossil record, but there were not. In fact, the record as it existed then, and for a long time afterwards, showed no life at all, right up to the moment of the famous Cambrian explosion. But now here was Darwin, without any evidence, insisting that the earlier seas must have had abundant life, and that we just hadn't found it yet, because, for whatever reason, it hadn't been preserved. It simply could not be otherwise, Darwin maintained. The case at present must remain inexplicable, and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained, he allowed most candidly, but he refused to allow an alternative possibility. By way of explanation, he speculated, inventively but incorrectly, that perhaps the Precambrian seas had been too clear to lay down sediments, and thus had preserved no fossils. Even Darwin's closest friends were troubled by the blitheness of some of his assertions. Adam Sedgwick, who had taught Darwin at Cambridge and taken him on a geological tour of Wales in 1831, said the book gave him more pain than pleasure. Louis Agassiz, the celebrated Swiss paleontologist, dismissed it as poor conjecture. Even Lyell concluded gloomily, Darwin goes too far. T. H. Huxley disliked Darwin's insistence on huge amounts of geological time because Huxley was a saltationist, which is to say, a believer in the idea that evolutionary changes happen not gradually, but suddenly. Saltationists, the word comes from the Latin for leap, couldn't accept that complicated organs could ever emerge in slow stages. What good, after all, is one-tenth of a wing or half an eye? Such organs, they thought, made sense only if they appeared in a finished state. The belief was a little surprising in as radical a spirit as Huxley because it closely recalled a very conservative religious notion first put forward by the English theologian William Paley in 1802 and known as Argument from Design. Paley contended that if you found a pocket watch on the ground, even if you'd never seen such a thing before, you would instantly perceive that it had been made by an intelligent entity. So it was, he believed, with nature. Its complexity was proof of its design. The notion was a powerful one in the 19th century, and it gave Darwin trouble, too. The eye to this day gives me a cold shudder, he acknowledged in a letter to a friend. In the origin, he conceded that it 
seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree that natural selection could produce such an instrument in gradual steps. Even so, and to the unending exasperation of his supporters, Darwin not only insisted that all change was gradual, but in nearly every edition of Origin stepped up the amount of time he supposed necessary to allow evolution to progress, which pushed his ideas increasingly out of favor. Eventually, according to the scientist and historian Jeffrey Schwartz, Darwin lost virtually all the support that still remained among the ranks of fellow natural historians and geologists. Ironically, considering that Darwin called his book On the Origin of Species, the one thing he couldn't explain was how species originated. Darwin's theory suggested a mechanism for how a species might become stronger or better or faster, in a word, fitter, but gave no indication of how it might throw up a new species. A Scottish engineer, Fleming Jenkin, considered the problem and noted an important flaw in Darwin's argument. Darwin believed that any beneficial trait that arose in one generation would be passed on to subsequent generations, thus strengthening the species. Jenkin pointed out that a favorable trait in one parent wouldn't become dominant in succeeding generations, but in fact would be diluted through blending. If you pour whiskey into a tumbler of water, you don't make the whiskey stronger, you make it weaker. And if you pour that dilute solution into another glass of water, it becomes weaker still. In the same way, any favorable trait introduced by one parent would be successively watered down by subsequent matings until it ceased to be apparent at all. Thus, Darwin's theory was a recipe not for change, but for constancy. Lucky flukes might arise from time to time, but they would soon vanish under the general impulse to bring everything back to a stable mediocrity. If natural selection were to work, some alternative, unconsidered mechanism was required. Unknown to Darwin and to everyone else, 1,200 kilometers away in a tranquil corner of Middle Europe, a retiring monk named Gregor Mendel was coming up with a solution. Mendel was born in 1822 to a humble farming family in a backwater of the Austrian Empire in what is now the Czech Republic. Schoolbooks once portrayed him as a simple but observant provincial monk whose discoveries were largely serendipitous, the result of noticing some interesting traits of inheritance while pottering about with pea plants in the monastery's kitchen garden. In fact, Mendel was a trained scientist. He had studied physics and mathematics at the Olmutz Philosophical Institute and University of Vienna, and he brought scientific discipline to all he did. Moreover, the monastery at Brno, where he lived from 1843, was known as a learned institution. It had a library of 20,000 books and a tradition of careful scientific investigation. Before embarking on his experiments, Mendel spent two years preparing his control specimens, seven varieties of pea, to make sure they bred true. Then, helped by two full-time assistants, he repeatedly bred and crossbred hybrids from 30,000 pea plants. It was delicate work, requiring the three men to take the most exacting pains to avoid accidental cross-fertilization and to note every slight variation in the growth and appearance of seeds, pods, leaves, stems, and flowers, Mendel knew what he was doing. He never used the word gene. It wasn't coined until 1913 in an English medical dictionary, though he did invent the terms dominant and recessive. What he established was that every seed contained two factors, or elementa, as he called them, a dominant one and a recessive one and these factors, when combined, produced predictable patterns of inheritance. The results he converted into precise mathematical formulae. Altogether, Mendel spent eight years on the experiments, then confirmed his results with similar experiments on flowers, corn, and other plants. If anything, Mendel was too scientific in his approach, for when he presented his findings at the February and March meetings of the Natural History Society of Brno in 1865, the audience of about forty listened politely, but was conspicuously unmoved, even though the breeding of plants was a matter of great practical interest to many of the members. 
When Mendel's report was published, he eagerly sent a copy to the great Swiss botanist Carl Wilhelm von Nageli, whose support was more or less vital for the theory's prospects. Unfortunately, Nageli failed to perceive the importance of what Mendel had found. He suggested that Mendel try breeding hawkweed. Mendel dutifully obeyed, but quickly realized that hawkweed had none of the requisite features for studying heritability. It was evident that Nagli had not read the paper closely or possibly at all. Frustrated, Mendel retired from investigating heritability and spent the rest of his life growing outstanding vegetables and studying bees, mice, and sunspots, among much else. Eventually, he was made abbot. Mendel's findings weren't quite as widely ignored as is sometimes suggested. His study received a glowing entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica, then a more leading record of scientific thought than now, and was cited repeatedly in an important paper by the German Wilhelm Olbers Focke. Indeed, it was because Mendel's ideas never entirely sank below the waterline of scientific thought that they were so easily recovered when the world was ready for them. Together, without realizing it, Darwin and Mendel laid the groundwork for all of life sciences in the 20th century. Darwin saw that all living things are connected, that ultimately they trace their ancestry to a single common source. Mendel's work provided the mechanism to explain how that could happen. The two men could easily have helped each other. Mendel owned a German edition of The Origin of Species, which he is known to have read, so he must have realized the applicability of his work to Darwin's. Yet he appears to have made no effort to get in touch. And Darwin, for his part, is known to have studied Focke's influential paper with its repeated references to Mendel's work, but didn't connect them to his own studies. The one thing everyone thinks featured in Darwin's argument, that humans are descended from apes, didn't feature at all, except as one passing illusion. Even so, it took no great leap of imagination to see the implications for human development in Darwin's theories, and it became an immediate talking point. The showdown came on Saturday, the 30th of June, 1860, at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Oxford. Huxley had been urged to attend by Robert Chambers, author of Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, though he was still unaware of Chambers' connection to that contentious tome. Darwin, as ever, was absent. The meeting was held at the Oxford Zoological Museum. More than a thousand people crowded into the chamber. Hundreds more were turned away. People knew that something big was going to happen— though they had first to wait while a slumber-inducing speaker named John William Draper of New York University bravely slogged his way through two hours of introductory remarks on the intellectual development of Europe considered with reference to the views of Mr. Darwin. Finally, the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, rose to speak. Wilberforce had been briefed, or so it is generally assumed, by the ardent anti-Darwinian Richard Owen, who had been a guest in his home the night before. As nearly always with events that end in uproar, accounts of what exactly transpired vary widely. In the most popular version, Wilberforce, when properly in flow, turned to Huxley with a dry smile and demanded of him whether he claimed attachment to the apes by way of his grandmother or grandfather. The remark was doubtless intended as a quip, but it came across as an icy challenge. According to his own account, Huxley turned to his neighbor and whispered, The Lord hath delivered him into my hands, then rose with a certain relish. Others, however, recalled a Huxley trembling with fury and indignation. At all events, Huxley declared that he would rather claim kinship to an ape than to someone who used his eminence to propound uninformed twaddle in what was supposed to be a serious scientific forum. Such a riposte, was scandalous impertinence, as well as an insult to Wilberforce's office, and the proceedings instantly collapsed into tumult. A Lady Brewster fainted. Robert Fitzroy, Darwin's companion on the Beagle twenty-five years before, wandered through the hall with a Bible held aloft, shouting, The Book! The Book! He was at the conference to present a paper on storms in his capacity as head of the newly created meteorological department. Interestingly, 
Each side afterwards claimed to have routed the other. Darwin did eventually make his belief in our kinship with the apes explicit in The Descent of Man in 1871. The conclusion was a bold one, since nothing in the fossil record supported such a notion. The only known early human remains of that time were the famous Neanderthal bones from Germany and a few uncertain fragments of jaw bones, and many respected authorities refused to believe even in their antiquity. The Descent of Man was altogether a more controversial book than The Origin, but by the time of its appearance the world had grown less excitable, and its arguments caused much less of a stir. For the most part, however, Darwin passed his twilight years on other projects, most of which touched only tangentially on questions of natural selection. He spent amazingly long periods picking through bird droppings, scrutinizing the contents in an attempt to understand how seeds spread between continents, and spent years more studying the behavior of worms. One of his experiments was to play the piano to them, not to amuse them, but to study the effects on them of sound and vibration. He was the first to realize how vitally important worms are to soil fertility. It may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world, he wrote in his masterwork on the subject, The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, 1881, which was actually more popular than On the Origin of Species had ever been. Among his other books were On the Various Contrivances by Which British and Foreign Orchids Are Fertilized by Insects, 1862, Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals, 1872, which sold almost 5,300 copies on its first day, The Effects of Cross and Self-Fertilization in the Vegetable Kingdom, 1876, a subject that came in probably close to Mendel's own work without attaining anything like the same insights, and The Power of Movement in Plants. Finally, but not least, he devoted much effort to studying the consequences of inbreeding a matter of private interest to him. Having married his own cousin, Darwin glumly suspected that certain physical and mental frailties among his children arose from a lack of diversity in his family tree. Darwin was often honored in his lifetime, but never for On the Origin of Species or The Descent of Man. When the Royal Society bestowed on him the prestigious Copley Medal, it was for his geology, zoology, and botany, not evolutionary theories, and the Linnaean Society was similarly pleased to honor Darwin without embracing his radical notions. He was never knighted, though he was buried in Westminster Abbey next to Newton. He died at Down in April 1882. Mendel died two years later. Darwin's theory didn't really gain widespread acceptance until the 1930s and 1940s, with the advance of a refined theory called, with a certain auteur, the modern synthesis, combining Darwin's ideas with those of Mendel and others. For Mendel, appreciation was also posthumous, though it came somewhat sooner. In 1900, three scientists, working separately in Europe, rediscovered Mendel's work, more or less simultaneously. It was only because one of them, a Dutchman named Hugo de Vries, seemed set to claim Mendel's insights as his own, that a rival made it noisily clear that the credit really lay with the forgotten monk. The world was almost, but not quite, ready to begin to understand how we got here, how we made each other. It is fairly amazing to reflect that at the beginning of the twentieth century, and for some years beyond, the best scientific minds in the world couldn't actually tell you in any meaningful way where babies came from. And these, you may recall, were men who thought science was nearly at an end. 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 Chapter 26. The Stuff of Life If your two parents hadn't bonded just when they did, possibly to the second, possibly to the nanosecond, you wouldn't be here. And if their parents hadn't bonded in a precisely timely manner, you wouldn't be here either. And if their parents hadn't done likewise, and their parents before them, and so on, obviously and indefinitely, you wouldn't be here. Push backwards through time, 
and these ancestral debts begin to add up. Go back just eight generations to about the time that Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln were born, and already there are over 250 people on whose timely couplings your existence depends. Continue further to the time of Shakespeare and the Mayflower Pilgrims, and you have no fewer than 16,384 ancestors earnestly exchanging genetic material in a way that would eventually and miraculously result in you. At 20 generations ago, the number of people procreating on your behalf has risen to 1,048,576. Five generations before that, and there are no fewer than 33,554,432 men and women on whose devoted couplings your existence depends. By 30 generations ago, your total number of forebears Remember, these aren't cousins and aunts and other incidental relatives, but only parents and parents of parents in a line leading ineluctably to you, is over one billion, one billion seventy three million seven hundred and forty one thousand eight hundred twenty four to be precise. If you go back sixty four generations to the time of the Romans, the number of people on whose cooperative efforts your eventual existence depends has risen to approximately one million trillion which is several thousand times the total number of people who have ever lived. Clearly, something has gone wrong with our maths here. The answer, it may interest you to learn, is that your line is not pure. You couldn't be here without a little incest. Actually, quite a lot of incest, albeit at a genetically discreet remove. With so many millions of ancestors in your background, there will have been many occasions when a relative from your mother's side of the family procreated with some distant cousin from your father's side of the ledger. In fact, if you are in a partnership now with someone from your own race and country, the chances are excellent that you are at some level related. Indeed, if you look around you on a bus or in a park or cafe or any crowded place, most of the people you see are very probably relatives. When someone boasts to you that he is descended from Shakespeare or William the Conqueror, you should answer at once, Me too! In the most literal and fundamental sense, we are all family. We are also uncannily alike. Compare your genes with any other human beings, and on average there will be about 99.9% .9 the same. That is what makes us a species. The tiny differences in that remaining 0.1%, roughly one nucleotide base in every thousand, to quote the British geneticist and recent Nobel laureate John Sulston, are what endow us with our individuality. Much has been made in recent years of the piecing together of the human genome. In fact, there is no such thing as the human genome. Every human genome is different. Otherwise, we would all be identical. It is the endless recombinations of our genomes, each nearly identical to all the others, but not quite, that make us what we are, both as individuals and as a species. But what exactly is this thing we call the genome? And what come to that are genes? Well, start with a cell again. Inside the cell is a nucleus, and inside each nucleus are the chromosomes, 46 little bundles of complexity of which 23 come from your mother and 23 from your father. With a very few exceptions, every cell in your body, 99.999% .99 of them, say, carries the same complement of chromosomes. The exceptions are the red blood cells, some immune system cells, and egg and sperm cells, which for various organizational reasons don't carry the full genetic package. Chromosomes constitute the complete set of instructions necessary to make and maintain you, and are made of long strands of a little wonder chemical called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, the most extraordinary molecule on Earth, as it has been called. DNA exists for just one reason, to create more DNA, and you have a lot of it inside you, nearly two meters of it squeezed into almost every cell. Each length of DNA comprises some 3.2 billion letters of coding, enough to provide 10 to the 3 billion 480 millionth possible combinations. 
guaranteed to be unique against all conceivable odds, in the words of Christian de Duve. That's a lot of possibility, a one followed by more than three billion zeros. It would take more than 5,000 average-sized books just to print that figure, notes de Duve. Look at yourself in the mirror and reflect upon the fact that you are beholding 10,000 trillion cells and that almost every one of them holds two yards of densely compacted DNA, and you begin to appreciate just how much of this stuff you carry around with you. If all your DNA were woven into a single fine strand, there would be enough of it to stretch from the earth to the moon and back, not once or twice, but again and again. Altogether, according to one calculation, you may have as much as 20 million kilometers of DNA bundled up inside you. Your body, in short, loves to make DNA, and without it you couldn't live. Yet DNA is not itself alive. No molecule is, but DNA is, as it were, especially unalive. It is among the most non-reactive, chemically inert molecules in the living world in the words of the geneticist Richard Lewontin. That is why it can be recovered from patches of long-dried blood or semen in murder investigations and coaxed from the bones of ancient Neanderthals. It also explains why it took scientists so long to work out how a substance so mystifyingly low-key, so in a word lifeless, could be at the very heart of life itself. As a known entity, DNA has been around longer than you might think. It was discovered as far back as 1869 by Johann Friedrich Miescher, a Swiss scientist working at the University of Tübingen in Germany. While delving microscopically through the pus in surgical bandages, Miescher found a substance he didn't recognize and called it nuclein because it resided in the nuclei of cells. At the time, Miescher did little more than note its existence, but Nuclean clearly remained on his mind. For twenty-three years later, in a letter to his uncle, he raised the possibility that such molecules could be the agents behind heredity. This was an extraordinary insight, but one so far in advance of the day's scientific requirements that it attracted no attention at all. For most of the next half-century, the common assumption was that the material, now called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, had at most a subsidiary role in matters of heredity. It was too simple. It had just four basic components, called nucleotides, which was like having an alphabet of just four letters. How could you possibly write the story of life with such a rudimentary alphabet? The answer is that you do it in much the way that you create complex messages with the simple dots and dashes of Morse code, by combining them. DNA didn't do anything at all, as far as anyone could tell. It just sat there in the nucleus, possibly binding the chromosome in some way, or adding a splash of acidity on command, or fulfilling some other trivial task that no one had yet thought of. The necessary complexity, it was thought, had to exist in proteins in the nucleus. There were, however, two problems with dismissing DNA. First, there was so much of it, nearly two meters in nearly every nucleus, so clearly the cells esteemed it in some important way. On top of this, it kept turning up like the suspect in a murder mystery in experiments. In two studies in particular, one involving the pneumonococcus bacterium and another involving bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria, DNA betrayed an importance that could be explained only if its role were more central than prevailing thought allowed. The evidence suggested that DNA was somehow involved in the making of proteins, a process vital to life. Yet it was also clear that proteins were being made outside the nucleus, well away from the DNA that was supposedly directing their assembly. No one could understand how DNA could possibly be getting messages to the proteins. The answer, we now know, was RNA, or ribonucleic acid, which acts as an interpreter between the two. It is a notable oddity of biology that DNA and proteins don't speak the same language. For almost four billion years they have been living the world's great double act. 
and yet they answer to mutually incompatible codes, as if one spoke Spanish and the other Hindi. To communicate, they need a mediator in the form of RNA. Working with a kind of chemical clerk called a ribosome, RNA translates information from a cell's DNA into terms proteins can understand and act upon. However, by the early 1900s, where we resume our story, we were still a very long way from understanding that, or indeed almost anything else to do with the confused business of heredity. Clearly, there was a need for some inspired and clever experimentation. And happily, the age produced a young person with a diligence and aptitude to undertake it. His name was Thomas Hunt Morgan, and in 1904, just four years after the timely rediscovery of Mendel's experiments with pea plants, and still almost a decade before gene would even become a word, he began to do remarkably dedicated things with chromosomes. Chromosomes had been discovered by chance in 1888 and were so-called because they readily absorbed dye, and thus were easy to see under the microscope. By the turn of the century, it was strongly suspected that they were involved in the passing on of traits, but no one knew how, or even really whether they did this. Morgan chose as his subject of study a tiny, delicate fly formerly called Drosophila melanogaster, but more commonly known as the fruit fly, or vinegar fly, banana fly, or garbage fly. Drosophila is familiar to most of us as that frail, colorless insect that seems to have a compulsive urge to drown in our drinks. As laboratory specimens, fruit flies had certain very attractive advantages. They cost almost nothing to house and feed, could be bred by the millions in milk bottles, went from egg to productive parenthood in ten days or less, and had just four chromosomes, which kept things conveniently simple. Working out of a small lab, which became known inevitably as the Fly Room, in Shermerhorn Hall at Columbia University in New York, Morgan and his team embarked on a program of meticulous breeding and crossbreeding involving millions of flies. One biographer says billions, though that is probably an exaggeration, each of which had to be captured with tweezers and examined under a jeweler's glass for any tiny variations in inheritance. For six years... They tried to produce mutations by any means they could think of, zapping the flies with radiation and x-rays, rearing them in bright light and darkness, baking them gently in ovens, spinning them crazily in centrifuges, but nothing worked. Morgan was on the brink of giving up when there occurred a sudden and repeatable mutation, a fly that had white eyes rather than the usual red ones. With this breakthrough, Morgan and his assistants were able to generate useful deformities, allowing them to track a trait through successive generations. By such means, they could work out the correlations between particular characteristics and individual chromosomes, eventually proving to more or less everyone's satisfaction that chromosomes were at the heart of inheritance. The problem, however, remained the next level of biological intricacy, the enigmatic genes and the DNA that composed them. These were much trickier to isolate and understand. As late as 1933, when Morgan was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work, many researchers still weren't convinced that genes even existed. As Morgan noted at the time, there was no consensus as to what the genes are, whether they are real or purely fictitious. It may seem surprising that scientists could struggle to accept the physical reality of something so fundamental to cellular activity. But as Wallace King and Sanders point out in Biology, the Science of Life, that rarest thing, a readable textbook, we are in much the same position today in respect of mental processes such as thought and memory. We know that we have them, of course, but we don't know what, if any, physical form they take. So it was for a very long time with genes. The idea that you could pluck one from your body and take it away for study was as absurd to many of Morgan's peers as the idea that scientists today might capture a stray thought and examine it under a microscope. What was certainly true was that something associated with chromosomes was directing cell replication. Finally, in 1944, after 15 years of effort, a team at the Rockefeller Institute in Manhattan 
led by a brilliant but diffident Canadian named Oswald Avery, succeeded with an exceedingly tricky experiment in which an innocuous strain of bacteria was made permanently infectious by crossing it with alien DNA, proving that DNA was far more than a passive molecule and almost certainly was the active agent in heredity. The Austrian-born biochemist Erwin Shargaff later quite seriously suggested that Avery's discovery was worth two Nobel Prizes. Unfortunately, Avery was opposed by one of his own colleagues at the Institute, a strong-willed and disagreeable protein enthusiast named Alfred Mirsky, who did everything in his power to discredit Avery's work, including, it has been said, lobbying the authorities at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm not to give Avery a Nobel Prize. Avery by this time was sixty-six years old and tired. Unable to deal with the stress and controversy, he resigned his position and never went near a lab again. But other experiments elsewhere overwhelmingly supported his conclusions, and soon the race was on to find the structure of DNA. Had you been a betting person in the early 1950s, your money would almost certainly have been on Linus Pauling of Caltech, America's leading chemist, to crack the structure of DNA. Pauling was unrivaled in determining the architecture of molecules and had been a pioneer in the field of X-ray crystallography, the technique that would prove crucial to peering into the heart of DNA. In an exceedingly distinguished career, he would win two Nobel Prizes for chemistry in 1954 and peace in 1962. But with DNA, he became convinced that the structure was a triple helix, not a double one, and never quite got on the right track. Instead, victory fell to an unlikely quartet of scientists in England, who didn't work as a team, often weren't on speaking terms, and were for the most part novices in the field. Of the four, the nearest to a conventional boffin was Morris Wilkins, who had spent much of the Second World War helping to design the atomic bomb. Two of the others, Rosalind Franklin and Francis Crick, had spent their war years working for the British government on mines. Crick on the type that blow up, Franklin on the type that produce coal. The most unconventional of the foursome was James Watson, an American prodigy who as a boy had distinguished himself as a member of a highly popular radio program called The Quiz Kids and thus could claim to be at least part of the inspiration for some of the members of the Glass family in Franny and Zooey and other works by J.D. Salinger, and who had entered the University of Chicago aged just fifteen. He had earned his Ph.D. by the age of twenty-two, and was now attached to the famous Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. In 1951 he was a gawky twenty-three-year-old with a strikingly lively head of hair, that appears in photographs to be straining to attach itself to some powerful magnet just out of frame. Crick, twelve years older and still without a doctorate, was less memorably hirsute and slightly more tweedy. In Watson's account, he is presented as blustery, nosy, cheerfully argumentative, impatient with anyone slow to share a notion, and constantly in danger of being asked to go elsewhere. Neither was formally trained in biochemistry. They assumed, correctly as it turned out, that if you could determine the shape of a DNA molecule, you would be able to see how it did what it did. They hoped to achieve this, it would appear, by doing as little work as possible beyond thinking, and no more of that than was absolutely necessary. As Watson cheerfully, if not a touch disingenuously, remarked in his autobiographical book The Double Helix, it was my hope that the gene might be solved without my learning any chemistry. They weren't actually assigned to work on DNA, and at one point were ordered to stop doing it. Watson was ostensibly mastering the art of crystallography. Crick was supposed to be completing a thesis on the X-ray diffraction of large molecules. Although Crick and Watson enjoy nearly all the credit in popular accounts for solving the mystery of DNA, their breakthrough was crucially dependent on experimental work done by the competitors, the results of which were obtained fortuitously in the tactful words of the historian Lisa Jardine. Far ahead of them, at least at the beginning, were two academics at King's College in London, Wilkins and Franklin. 
The New Zealand-born Wilkins was a retiring figure, almost to the point of invisibility. A 1998 PBS documentary on the discovery of the structure of DNA, a feat for which he shared the 1962 Nobel Prize with Crick and Watson, managed to overlook him entirely. Franklin was the most enigmatic character of them all. In a severely unflattering portrait, Watson in the double helix depicted Franklin as a woman who was unreasonable, secretive, chronically uncooperative, and, this seemed especially to irritate him, almost willfully unsexy. He allowed that she was not unattractive and might have been quite stunning had she taken even a mild interest in clothes. But in this, she disappointed all expectations. She didn't even use lipstick, he noted in wonder, while her dress sense showed all the imagination of English blue-stocking adolescents. However, she did have the best images in existence of the possible structure of DNA, achieved by means of X-ray crystallography, the technique perfected by Linus Pauling. Crystallography had been used successfully to map atoms and crystals, hence crystallography, but DNA molecules were a much more finicky proposition. Only Franklin was managing to get good results from the process, but to Wilkins's perennial exasperation, she refused to share her findings. If Franklin was not warmly forthcoming with her findings, she cannot be altogether blamed. Female academics at King's in the 1950s were treated with a formalized disdain that dazzles modern sensibilities, actually any sensibilities. However senior or accomplished, they were not allowed into the college's senior common room, but instead had to take their meals in a more utilitarian chamber that even Watson conceded was dingily pokey. On top of this, she was being constantly pressed, at times actively harassed, to share her results with a trio of men whose desperation to get a peek at them was seldom matched by more engaging qualities like respect. I'm afraid we always used to adopt, uh, let's say, a patronizing attitude towards her, Crick later recalled. Two of these men were from a competing institution, and the third was more or less openly siding with them. It should hardly come as a surprise that she kept her results locked away. That Wilkins and Franklin did not get along was a fact that Watson and Crick seemed to have exploited to their benefit. Although the two of them were trespassing rather unashamedly on Wilkins's territory, it was with them that he increasingly sided, not altogether surprisingly, since Franklin herself was beginning to act in a decidedly queer way. Although her results showed that DNA definitely was helical in shape, she insisted to all that it was not. To Wilkins's presumed dismay and embarrassment, in the summer of 1952, she posted a mock notice around the King's Physics Department that said, It is with great regret that we have to announce the death, on Friday the 18th of July, 1952, of DNA Helix. It is hoped that Dr. M. H. F. Wilkins will speak in memory of the late Helix. The outcome of all this was that in January 1953, Wilkins showed Watson Franklin's images apparently without her knowledge or consent. It would be an understatement to call it a significant help to him. Years later, Watson conceded that it was the key event. It mobilized us. Armed with a knowledge of the DNA molecule's basic shape and some important elements of its dimensions, Watson and Crick redoubled their efforts. Everything now seemed to go their way. At one point, Pauling was en route to a conference in England, at which he would in all likelihood have met Wilkins and learned enough to correct the misconceptions that had put him on the wrong line of inquiry. But this was the McCarthy era and Pauling found himself detained at Idlewild Airport in New York, his passport confiscated, on the grounds that he was too liberal of temperament to be allowed to travel abroad. Crick and Watson also had the no less convenient good fortune that Pauling's son was working at the Cavendish and innocently kept them abreast of any news of developments and setbacks at home. Still facing the possibility of being trumped at any moment, Watson and Crick applied themselves feverishly to the problem. It was known that DNA had four chemical components called adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine, and that these paired up in particular ways. 
By playing with pieces of cardboard cut into the shape of molecules, Watson and Crick were able to work out how the pieces fit together. From this, they made a mechano-like model, perhaps the most famous in modern science, consisting of metal plates bolted together in a spiral, and invited Wilkins, Franklin, and the rest of the world to have a look. Any informed person could see at once that they had solved the problem. It was, without question, a brilliant piece of detective work, with or without the boost of Franklin's picture. The 25th of April, 1953 edition of Nature carried a 900-word article by Watson and Crick titled A Structure for Deoxyribose Nucleic Acid. Accompanying it were separate articles by Wilkins and Franklin. It was an eventful time in the world. Edmund Hillary was just about to clamber to the top of Everest, while Elizabeth II was shortly to be crowned queen. So the discovery of the secret of life was mostly overlooked. It received a small mention in the News Chronicle and was ignored elsewhere. Rosalind Franklin did not share in the Nobel Prize. She died of ovarian cancer at the age of just 37 in 1958, four years before the award was granted. Nobel Prizes are not awarded posthumously. The cancer almost certainly arose as a result of chronic overexposure to X-rays through her work and could have been avoided. In her much-praised recent biography, Brenda Maddox noted that Franklin rarely wore a lead apron and often stepped carelessly in front of a beam. Oswald Avery never won a Nobel Prize either and was also largely overlooked by posterity, though he did at least have the satisfaction of living just long enough to see his findings vindicated. He died in 1955. Watson and Crick's discovery wasn't actually confirmed until the 1980s. As Crick said in one of his books, it took over 25 years for our model of DNA to go from being only rather plausible to being very plausible, and from there to being virtually certainly correct. Even so, with the structure of DNA understood, progress in genetics was swift, and by 1968 the journal Science could run an article entitled that was the molecular biology that was, suggesting, it hardly seems possible, but it is so, that the work of genetics was nearly at an end. In fact, of course, it was only just beginning. Even now there is a great deal about DNA that we scarcely understand, not least why so much of it doesn't actually seem to do anything. Ninety-seven percent of your DNA consists of nothing but long stretches of meaningless garble junk, or non-coding DNA, as biochemists prefer to put it. Only here and there, along each strand, do you find sections that control and organize vital functions. These are the curious and long-elusive genes. Genes are nothing more nor less than instructions to make proteins. This they do with a certain dull fidelity. In this sense, they are rather like the keys of a piano, each playing a single note and nothing else, which is obviously a trifle monotonous, but combine the genes, as you would combine piano keys, and you can create chords and melodies of infinite variety. Put all these genes together and you have, to continue the metaphor, the great symphony of existence known as the human genome. An alternative and more common way to regard the genome is as a kind of instruction manual for the body. Viewed this way, the chromosomes can be imagined as the book's chapters and the genes as individual instructions for making proteins. The words in which the instructions are written are called codons, and the letters are known as bases. The bases, the letters of the genetic alphabet, consist of the four nucleotides mentioned a while back adenine, thiamine, guanine, and cytosine. Despite the importance of what they do, these substances are not made of anything exotic. Guanine, for instance, is the same stuff that abounds in and gives its name to guano. The shape of a DNA molecule, as everyone knows, is rather like a spiral staircase or twisted rope ladder, the famous double helix. The uprights of this structure are made of a type of sugar called deoxyribose, and the whole of the helix is a nucleic acid, hence the name deoxyribonucleic acid. The rungs or steps are formed by two bases joining across the space between them, 
and they can combine in only two ways. Guanine is always paired with cytosine, and thiamine always with adenine. The order in which these letters appear as you move up or down the ladder constitutes the DNA code. Logging it has been the job of the human genome projects. Now, the particular brilliance of DNA lies in its manner of replication. When it is time to produce a new DNA molecule, the two strands part down the middle like the zip on a jacket, and each half goes off to form a new partnership. Because each nucleotide along a strand pairs up with a specific other nucleotide, each strand serves as a template for the creation of a new matching strand. If you possess just one strand of your own DNA, you could easily enough reconstruct the matching side by working out the necessary partnerships. If the topmost rung on one strand was made of guanine, then you would know that the topmost rung on the matching strand must be cytosine. Work your way down the ladder through all the nucleotide pairings, and eventually you would have the code for a new molecule. That is just what happens in nature except that nature does it really quickly, in only a matter of seconds, which is quite a feat. Most of the time, our DNA replicates with dutiful accuracy, but just occasionally, about one time in a million, a letter gets into the wrong place. This is known as a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, familiarly known to biochemists as a SNP. Generally, these SNPs are buried in stretches of non-coding DNA and have no detectable consequence for the body, but occasionally they make a difference. They might leave you predisposed to some disease, but equally they might confer some slight advantage, more protective pigmentation, for instance, or increased production of red blood cells for someone living at altitude. Over time, these slight modifications accumulate both in individuals and in populations, contributing to the distinctiveness of both. The balance between accuracy and errors in replication is a fine one. Too many errors and the organism can't function, but too few and it sacrifices adaptability. A similar balance must exist between stability and innovation in an organism. An increase in red blood cells can help a person or group living at high elevations to move and breathe more easily because more red cells can carry more oxygen. But additional red cells also thicken the blood. Add too many, and it's like pumping oil, in the words of Temple University anthropologist Charles Weitz. That's hard on the heart. Thus, those designed to live at high altitude get increased breathing efficiency, but pay for it with higher-risk hearts. By such means does Darwinian natural selection look after us. It also helps to explain why we are all so similar. Evolution simply won't let you become too different, not without becoming a new species, anyway. The 0.1% difference between your genes and mine is accounted for by our SNPs. Now, if you compared your DNA with a third person's, there would also be 99.9% .9 correspondence, but the SNPs would, for the most part, be in different places. Add more people to the comparison, and you will get yet more SNPs in yet more places. For every one of your 3.2 billion bases, somewhere on the planet there will be a person or group of persons with different coding in that position. So not only is it wrong to refer to the human genome, but in a sense we don't even have a human genome. We have six billion of them. We are all 99.9% .9 the same, but equally, in the words of the biochemist David Cox, you could say all human beings share nothing, and that would be correct too. But we have still to explain why so little of that DNA has any discernible purpose. It starts to get a little unnerving, but it does really seem that the purpose of life is to perpetuate DNA. The 97% of our DNA commonly called junk is largely made up of clumps of letters that, in Matt Ridley's words, exist for the pure and simple reason that they are good at getting themselves duplicated. Most of your DNA, in other words, is devoted not to you, but to itself. You are a machine for the benefit of it, not it for you. Life, you will recall, just wants to be, and DNA is what makes it so. Even when DNA includes instructions for making genes, when it codes for them, as scientists put it, 
It is not necessarily with the smooth functioning of the organism in mind. One of the commonest genes we have is for a protein called reverse transcriptase, which has no known beneficial function in human beings at all. The one thing it does do is make it possible for retroviruses such as HIV to slip unnoticed into the human system. In other words, our bodies devote considerable energies to producing a protein that does nothing that is beneficial and sometimes clobbers us. Our bodies have no choice but to make it because the genes order it. We are vessels for their whims. Altogether, almost half of human genes, the largest proportion known in any organism, don't do anything at all, as far as we can tell, except reproduce themselves. All organisms are in some sense slaves to their genes. That's why salmon and spiders and other types of creature, more or less beyond counting, are prepared to die in the process of mating. The desire to breed, to disperse one's genes, is the most powerful impulse in nature. As Sherwin B. Newland has put it, empires fall, ids explode, great symphonies are written, and behind all of it is a single instinct that demands satisfaction. From an evolutionary point of view, sex is really just a reward mechanism to encourage us to pass on our genetic material. Scientists had only barely absorbed the surprising news that most of our DNA doesn't do anything, when even more unexpected findings began to turn up. First in Germany and then in Switzerland, researchers performed some rather bizarre experiments that produced curiously unbizarre outcomes. In one, they took the gene that controlled the development of a mouse's eye and inserted it into the larva of a fruit fly. The thought was that it might produce something interestingly grotesque. In fact, the mouse eye gene not only made a viable eye in the fruit fly, it made a fly's eye. Here were two creatures that hadn't shared a common ancestor for 500 million years, yet could swap genetic material as if they were sisters. The story was the same wherever researchers looked. They found that they could insert human DNA into certain cells of flies, and the flies would accept it as if it were their own. Over 60% of human genes, it turns out, are fundamentally the same as those found in fruit flies. At least 90% correlate at some level with those found in mice. We even have the same genes for making a tail, if only they would switch on. In field after field, researchers found that whatever organism they were working on, whether nematode worms or human beings, they were often studying essentially the same genes. Life, it appeared, was drawn up from a single set of blueprints. Further probings revealed the existence of a clutch of master control genes, each directing the development of a section of body, which were dubbed homeotic, from a Greek word meaning similar, or hox genes. Hox genes answered the long, bewildering question of how billions of embryonic cells, all arising from a single fertilized egg and carrying identical DNA, know where to go and what to do. That this one should become a liver cell, this one a stretchy neuron, this one a bubble of blood, this one part of the shimmer on a beating wing. It is the Hox genes that instruct them, and they do it for all organisms in much the same way. Interestingly, the amount of genetic material and how it is organized doesn't necessarily or even generally reflect the level of sophistication of the creature that contains it. We have 46 chromosomes, but some ferns have more than 600. The lungfish, one of the least evolved of all complex animals, has 40 times as much DNA as we have. Even the common newt is more genetically splendorous than we are, by a factor of five. Clearly, it is not the number of genes you have that matters so much as what you do with them. This is a very good thing, because the number of genes in humans has taken a big hit lately. Until recently, it was thought that humans had at least 100,000 genes, possibly a good many more, but that number was drastically reduced by the first results of the Human Genome Project, which suggested a figure more like 35,000 or 40,000 genes, about the same number as are found in grass. That came as both a surprise and a disappointment. It won't have escaped your attention that genes have been commonly implicated in any number of human frailties. 
Exultant scientists have at various times declared themselves to have found the genes responsible for obesity, schizophrenia, homosexuality, criminality, violence, alcoholism, even shoplifting and homelessness. Perhaps the apogee or nadir of this faith in biodeterminism was a study published in the journal Science in 1980 contending that women are genetically inferior at mathematics. In fact, we now know, almost nothing about you is so accommodatingly simple. This is clearly a pity, in one important sense, for if you had individual genes that determined height or propensity to diabetes or to baldness or any other distinguishing trait, then it would be easy, comparatively easy anyway, to isolate and tinker with them. Unfortunately, 35,000 genes functioning independently is not nearly enough to produce the kind of physical complexity that makes a satisfactory human being. Genes, clearly, therefore, must cooperate. A few disorders, hemophilia, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and cystic fibrosis, for example, are caused by lone dysfunctional genes. But as a rule, disruptive genes are weeded out by natural selection long before they can become permanently troublesome to a species or population. For the most part, our fate and comfort, and even our eye color, are determined not by individual genes, but by complexes of genes working in alliance. That's why it is so hard to work out how it all fits together, and why we won't be producing designer babies anytime soon. In fact, the more we have learned in recent years, the more complicated matters have tended to become. Even thinking, it turns out, affects the way genes work. How fast a man's beard grows, for instance, is partly a function of how much he thinks about sex, because thinking about sex produces a testosterone surge. In the early 1990s, scientists made an even more profound discovery when they found they could knock out supposedly vital genes from embryonic mice and still see the mice often not only born healthy, but sometimes actually fitter than their brothers and sisters who had not been tampered with. When certain important genes were destroyed, it turned out, others were stepping in to fill the breach. This was excellent news for us as organisms, but not so good for our understanding of how cells work, since it introduced an extra layer of complexity to something that we had barely begun to understand anyway. It is largely because of these complicating factors that cracking the human genome came to be seen almost at once as only a beginning. The genome, as Eric Lander of MIT has put it, is like a parts list for the human body. It tells us what we are made of, but says nothing about how we work. What's needed now is the operating manual, instructions for how to make it go. We are not close to that point yet. So now the quest is to crack the human proteome, a concept so novel that the term proteome didn't even exist a decade ago. The proteome is the library of information that creates proteins. Unfortunately, observed Scientific American in the spring of 2002, the proteome is much more complicated than the genome. That's putting it mildly. Proteins, you will remember, are the workhorses of all living systems. As many as a hundred million of them may be busy in any cell at any moment. That's a lot of activity to try to figure out. Worse, proteins' behavior and functions are based not simply on their chemistry, as with genes, but also on their shapes. To function, a protein not only must have the necessary chemical components properly assembled, but then must also be folded into an extremely specific shape. Folding is the term that's used, but it's a misleading one, as it suggests a geometric tidiness that doesn't in fact apply. Proteins loop and coil and crinkle into shapes that are at once extravagant and complex. They are more like furiously mangled coat hangers than folded towels. Moreover, proteins are, if I may be permitted to use a handy archaism, the swingers of the biological world. Depending on mood and metabolic circumstance, they will allow themselves to be phosphorylated, glycosylated, acetylated, ubiquitinated, farnesylated, sulfated, and linked to glycophosphated dilinositol anchors, among rather a lot else. Often it takes relatively little to get them going, it appears. 
Drink a glass of wine, as Scientific American notes, and you materially alter the number and types of proteins at large in your system. This is pleasant for drinkers, but not nearly so helpful for geneticists who are trying to understand what is going on. It can all begin to seem impossibly complicated, but there is also an underlying simplicity in all this, too, owing to an equally elemental underlying unity in the way life works. All the tiny, deft chemical processes that animate cells, the cooperative efforts of nucleotides, the transcription of DNA into RNA, evolved just once and have stayed pretty well fixed ever since across the whole of nature. As the late French geneticist Jacques Monod put it, only half in jest, anything that is true of E. coli must be true of elephants, except more so. Every living thing is an elaboration on a single original plan. As humans, we are mere increments, each of us a musty archive of adjustments, adaptations, modifications, and providential tinkerings stretching back 3.8 billion years. Remarkably, we are even quite closely related to fruit and vegetables. About half the chemical functions that take place in a banana are fundamentally the same as the chemical functions that take place in you. It cannot be said too often. All life is one. That is, and I suspect will forever prove to be, the most profound true statement there is. And 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 true statement. Part 6. The Road to Us. Descended from the apes. My dear, let us hope that that is not true. But if it is, let us pray that it will not become generally known. Remark attributed to the wife of the Bishop of Worcester, after Darwin's theory of evolution was explained to her. Chapter 27. Ice Time. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander. Byron. Darkness. In 1815, on the island of Sumbawa in Indonesia, a handsome and long quiescent mountain named Tambora exploded spectacularly, killing a hundred thousand people with its blast and associated tsunamis. No one living now has ever seen such fury. Tambora was far bigger than anything any living human has experienced. It was the biggest volcanic explosion in 10,000 years, 150 times the size of Mount St. Helens, equivalent to 60,000 Hiroshima-sized atom bombs. News didn't travel terribly fast in those days. In London, the Times ran a small story, actually a letter from a merchant, seven months after the event. But by this time, Tambora's effects were already being felt. 240 cubic kilometers of smoky ash, dust, and grit had diffused through the atmosphere, obscuring the sun's rays and causing the earth to cool. Sunsets were unusually but blearily colorful, an effect memorably captured by the artist J. M. W. Turner, who could not have been happier. But mostly the world existed under an oppressive, dusky pall. It was this deathly dimness that inspired Byron to write the lines just quoted. Spring never came, and summer never warmed. 1816 became known as the year without summer. Crops everywhere failed to grow. In Ireland, a famine and associated typhoid epidemic killed 65,000 people. In New England, the year became popularly known as 1800 and froze to death. Morning frosts continued until June, and almost no planted seed would grow. Short of fodder, livestock died, or had to be prematurely slaughtered. In every way, it was a dreadful year, almost certainly the worst for farmers in modern times. Yet globally, the temperature fell by less than one degree Celsius. The Earth's natural thermostat, as scientists would learn, is an exceedingly delicate instrument. The 19th century was already a chilly time. 
For 200 years, Europe and North America had been experiencing a little ice age, as it has become known, which permitted all kinds of wintry events. Frost fairs on the Thames, ice skating races along Dutch canals, that are mostly impossible now. It was a period, in other words, when frigidity was much on people's minds. So we may perhaps excuse 19th century geologists for being slow to realize that the world they lived in was in fact balmy compared with former epochs, and that much of the land around them had been shaped by crushing glaciers and cold that would wreck even a frost fair. They knew there was something odd about the past. The European landscape was littered with inexplicable anomalies, the bones of Arctic reindeer in the warm south of France, huge rocks stranded in improbable places, and they often came up with inventive but not terribly plausible explanations. One French naturalist named De Luc, trying to explain how granite boulders had come to rest high up on the limestone flanks of the Jura Mountains, suggested that perhaps they had been shot there by compressed air in caverns, like corks out of a pop gun. The term for a displaced boulder is an erratic, but in the 19th century the expression seemed to apply more often to the theories than to the rocks. The great British geologist Arthur Hallam has suggested that if James Hutton, the 18th century father of geology, had visited Switzerland, he would have seen at once the significance of the carved valleys, the polished striations, the telltale strand lines where rocks had been dumped, and the other abundant clues that point to passing ice sheets. Unfortunately, Hutton was not a traveler. But even with nothing better at his disposal than second-hand accounts, Hutton rejected out of hand the idea that huge boulders had been carried 1,000 meters up mountainsides by floods. All the water in the world won't make a boulder float, he pointed out, and became one of the first to argue for widespread glaciation. Unfortunately, his ideas escaped notice, and for another half-century, most naturalists continued to insist that gouges on rocks could be attributed to passing carts or even the scrape of hobnailed boots. Local peasants, uncontaminated by scientific orthodoxy, knew better, however. The naturalist Jean de Charpentier told the story of how, in 1834, he was walking along a country lane with a Swiss woodcutter, when they got to talking about the rocks along the roadside. The woodcutter matter-of-factly told him that the boulders had come from the Grimsel, a zone of granite some distance away. When I asked him how he thought that these stones had reached their location, he answered without hesitation, the Grimsel Glacier transported them on both sides of the valley, because that glacier extended in the past as far as the town of Bern. Charpentier was delighted, for he had come to such a view himself. But when he raised the notion at scientific gatherings, it was dismissed. One of Charpentier's closest friends was another Swiss naturalist, Louis Agassiz, who, after some initial skepticism, came to embrace and eventually all but appropriate the theory. Agassiz had studied under Cuvier in Paris, and now held the post of Professor of Natural History at the College of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. Another friend of Agassiz, a botanist named Karl Schimper, was actually the first to coin the term Ice Age in German Eiszeit in 1837, and to propose that there was good evidence to show that ice had once lain heavily not just across the Swiss Alps, but over much of Europe, Asia, and North America. It was a radical notion. He lent Agassiz his notes, then came very much to regret it, as Agassiz increasingly got the credit for what Schimper felt, with some legitimacy, was his theory. Charpentier likewise ended up a bitter enemy of his old friend. Alexander von Humboldt, yet another friend, may have had Agassiz at least partly in mind when he observed that there are three stages in scientific discovery. First, people deny that it is true. Then they deny that it is important. Finally, they credit the wrong person. At all events, Agassiz made the field his own. In his quest to understand the dynamics of glaciation, he went everywhere deep into dangerous crevasses and up to the summits of the craggiest alpine peaks, often apparently unaware that he and his team were the first to climb them. Nearly everywhere, Agassiz encountered an unyielding reluctance to accept his theories. 
Humboldt urged him to return to his area of real expertise, fossil fish, and give up this mad obsession with ice. But Agassiz was a man possessed by an idea. Agassiz's theory found even less support in Britain, where most naturalists had never seen a glacier and often couldn't grasp the crushing forces that ice in bulk exerts. Could scratches and polish just be due to ice? asked Roderick Murchison in a mocking tone at one meeting, evidently imagining the rocks as covered in a kind of light and glassy rhyme. To his dying day he expressed the frankest incredulity at those ice-mad geologists who believed that glaciers could account for so much. William Hopkins, a Cambridge professor and leading member of the Geological Society, endorsed this view arguing that the notion that ice could transport boulders presented such obvious mechanical absurdities as to make it unworthy of the society's attention. Undaunted, Agassiz traveled tirelessly to promote his theory. In 1840, he read a paper to a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Glasgow, at which he was openly criticized by the great Charles Lyell. The following year, the Geological Society of Edinburgh passed a resolution conceding that there might be some general merit in the theory, but that certainly none of it applied to Scotland. Lyle did eventually come round. His moment of epiphany came when he realized that a moraine, or line of rocks, near his family estate in Scotland, which he had passed hundreds of times, could be understood only if one accepted that a glacier had dropped them there. But having become converted... Lyle then lost his nerve and backed off public support of the Ice Age idea. It was a frustrating time for Agassiz. His marriage was breaking up. Schimper was hotly accusing him of the theft of his ideas. Charpentier wouldn't speak to him. And the greatest living geologist offered support of only the most tepid and vacillating kind. In 1846, Agassiz traveled to America to give a series of lectures and there at last found the esteem he craved. Harvard gave him a professorship and built him a first-rate museum, the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Doubtless it helped that he had settled in New England, where the long winters encouraged a certain sympathy for the idea of interminable periods of cold. It also helped that six years after his arrival, the first scientific expedition to Greenland reported that nearly the whole of that semi-continent was covered in an ice sheet, just like the ancient one imagined in Agassiz's theory. At long last, his ideas began to find a real following. The one central defect of Agassiz's theory was that his ice ages had no cause, but assistance was about to come from an unlikely quarter. In the 1860s, journals and other learned publications in Britain began to receive papers on hydrostatics, electricity, and other scientific subjects from a James Crawl of Anderson's University in Glasgow. One of the papers, on how variations in the Earth's orbit might have precipitated ice ages, was published in the Philosophical Magazine in 1864 and was recognized at once as a work of the highest standard. So there was some surprise, and perhaps just a touch of embarrassment, when it turned out that Kroll was not an academic at the university, but a janitor. Born in 1821, Kroll grew up poor, and his formal education lasted only to the age of 13. He worked at a variety of jobs, as a carpenter, insurance salesman, keeper of a temperance hotel, before taking a position as a janitor at Anderson's, now the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Inducing his brother to do much of his work, he was able to pass many quiet evenings in the university library, teaching himself physics, mechanics, astronomy, hydrostatics, and the other fashionable sciences of the day, and gradually began to produce a string of papers, with a particular emphasis on the motions of the earth and their effect on climate. Kroll was the first to suggest that cyclical changes in the shape of the earth's orbit from elliptical which is to say slightly oval, to nearly circular, to elliptical again, might explain the onset and retreat of ice ages. No one had ever thought before to consider an astronomical explanation for variations in the Earth's weather. 
Thanks almost entirely to Kroll's persuasive theory, people in Britain began to become more responsive to the notion that at some former time, parts of the earth had been in the grip of ice. When his ingenuity and aptitude were recognized, Kroll was given a job at the Geological Survey of Scotland and widely honored. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society in London and of the New York Academy of Science, and given an honorary degree from the University of St. Andrews, among much else. Unfortunately, just as Agassiz's theory was at last beginning to find converts in Europe, he was busy taking it into ever more exotic territory in America. He began to find evidence for glaciers practically everywhere he looked, including near the equator. Eventually he became convinced that ice had once covered the whole earth, extinguishing all life, which God had then recreated. None of the evidence Agassiz cited supported such a view. Nonetheless, in his adopted country, his stature grew and grew, until he was regarded as only slightly below a deity. When he died in 1873, Harvard felt it necessary to appoint three professors to take his place. Yet, as sometimes happens, his theories fell swiftly out of fashion. Less than a decade after his death, his successor in the chair of geology at Harvard wrote that the so-called glacial epoch, so popular a few years ago among glacial geologists, may now be rejected without hesitation. Part of the problem was that Kroll's computation suggested that the most recent ice age occurred 80,000 years ago whereas the geological evidence increasingly indicated that the Earth had undergone some sort of dramatic perturbation much more recently than that. Without a plausible explanation for what might have provoked an ice age, the whole theory fell into abeyance. There it might have remained for some time, had it not been for a Serbian academic named Milutin Milankovic, who had no background in celestial motions at all. He was a mechanical engineer by training, but who, in the early 1900s, developed an unexpected interest in the matter. Milankovic realized that the problem with Kroll's theory was not that it was incorrect, but that it was too simple. As the Earth moves through space, it is subject not just to variations in the length and shape of its orbit, but also to rhythmic shifts in its angle of orientation to the Sun its tilt and pitch and wobble, all affecting the duration and intensity of sunlight falling on any patch of land. In particular, it is subject to three changes in position, known formally as its obliquity, precession, and eccentricity over long periods of time. Milankovitch wondered if there might be a relationship between these complex cycles and the comings and goings of ice ages. The difficulty was that the cycles were of widely different lengths, of approximately 20,000, 40,000, and 100,000 years, respectively, but varying in each case by up to a few thousand years, which meant that determining their points of intersection over long spans of time involved a nearly endless amount of exceedingly devoted computation. Essentially, Milankovitch had to work out the angle and duration of incoming solar radiation at every latitude on Earth, in every season, for a million years, adjusted for three ever-changing variables. Happily, this was precisely the sort of repetitive toil that suited Milankovitch's temperament. For the next twenty years, even while on holiday, he worked ceaselessly with pencil and slide rule, computing the tables of his cycles, work that now could be completed in a day or two with a computer. The calculations all had to be made in his spare time, but in 1914, Milankovitch suddenly got a great deal of that when the First World War broke out, and he was arrested owing to his position as a reservist in the Serbian army. He spent most of the next four years under loose house arrest in Budapest, required only to report to the police once a week. The rest of his time was spent working in the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He was possibly the happiest prisoner of war in history. The eventual outcome of his diligent scribblings was the 1930 book Mathematical Climatology and the Astronomical Theory of Climatic Changes. Milankovitch was right that there was a relationship between ice ages and planetary wobble, though like most people he assumed that it was a gradual increase in harsh winters that led to these long spells of coldness. 
It was a Russian-German meteorologist, Vladimir Kirpin, father-in-law of our tectonic friend Alfred Wegener, who saw that the process was more subtle and rather more unnerving than that. The cause of ice ages, Kirpin decided, is to be found in cool summers, not brutal winters. If summers are too cool to melt all the snow that falls on a given area, more incoming sunlight is bounced back by the reflective surface, exacerbating the cooling effect and encouraging yet more snow to fall. The consequence would tend to be self-perpetuating. As snow accumulated into an ice sheet, the region would grow cooler, prompting more ice to accumulate. As the glaciologist Gwen Schultz has noted, it is not necessarily the amount of snow that causes ice sheets, but the fact that snow, however little, lasts. It is thought that an ice age could start from a single unseasonal summer. The leftover snow reflects heat and exacerbates the chilling effect. The process is self-enlarging, unstoppable, and once the ice is really growing, it moves, says McPhee. You have advancing glaciers and an ice age. In the 1950s, because of imperfect dating technology, scientists were unable to correlate Milankovitch's carefully worked out cycles with the supposed dates of ice ages as then perceived, and so Milankovitch and his calculations increasingly fell out of favor. He died in 1958, unable to prove that his cycles were correct. By this time, in the words of one history of the period, you would have been hard-pressed to find a geologist or a meteorologist who regarded the model as being anything more than an historical curiosity. Not until the 1970s and the refinement of a potassium-argon method for dating ancient seafloor sediments were his theories finally vindicated. The Milankovitch cycles alone are not enough to explain cycles of ice ages. Many other factors are involved not least the disposition of the continents, in particular the presence of land masses over the poles, but the specifics of these are imperfectly understood. It has been suggested, however, that if you hauled North America, Eurasia, and Greenland just 500 kilometers north, we would have permanent and inescapable ice ages. We are very lucky, it appears, to get any good weather at all. Even less well understood are the cycles of comparative balminess within ice ages known as interglacials. It is mildly disconcerting to reflect that the whole of meaningful human history, the development of farming, the creation of towns, the rise of mathematics and writing and science and all the rest, has taken place within an atypical patch of fair weather. Previous interglacials have lasted as little as 8,000 years, our own, has already passed its 10,000th anniversary. The fact is we are still very much in an ice age. It's just a somewhat shrunken one, though less shrunken than many people realize. At the height of the last period of glaciation, around 20,000 years ago, about 30% of the Earth's land surface was under ice. 10% still is, and a further 14% is in a state of permafrost. Three-quarters of all the fresh water on Earth is locked up in ice even now. And we have ice caps at both poles, a situation that may be unique in the Earth's history. That there are snowy winters through much of the world, and permanent glaciers even in temperate places such as New Zealand, may seem quite natural. But in fact, it is a most unusual situation for the planet. For most of its history, until fairly recent times, the general pattern for the Earth was to be hot, with no permanent ice anywhere. The current ice age, ice epoch really, started about 40 million years ago, and has ranged from murderously bad to not bad at all. We live in one of the few spells of the latter. Ice ages tend to wipe out evidence of earlier ice ages, so the further back you go, the more sketchy the picture grows, but it appears that we have had at least 17 severe glacial episodes in the last 2.5 million years or so, the period that coincides with the rise of Homo erectus in Africa, followed by modern humans. Two commonly cited culprits for the present epoch are the rise of the Himalayas and the formation of the Isthmus of Panama, the first disrupting air flows, the second ocean currents.
India, once an island, has pushed 2,000 kilometers into the Asian landmass over the past 45 million years, raising not only the Himalayas, but also the vast Tibetan plateau behind it. The hypothesis is that the higher landscape was not only cooler, but diverted winds in a way that made them flow north and towards North America, making it more susceptible to long-term chills. Then, beginning about five million years ago, Panama rose from the sea, closing the gap between North and South America, disrupting the flows of warming currents between the Pacific and the Atlantic, and changing patterns of precipitation across at least half the world. One consequence was a drying out of Africa, which caused apes to climb down out of trees and go looking for a new way of living on the emerging savannas. At all events, with the oceans and continents arranged as they are now, it appears that ice will be a long-term part of our future. According to John McPhee, about fifty more glacial episodes can be expected, each lasting one hundred thousand years or so, before we can hope for a really long thaw. Before fifty million years ago, the Earth had no regular ice ages, but when we did have them, they tended to be colossal. A massive freezing occurred about 2.2 billion years ago, followed by a billion years or so of warmth. Then there was another ice age, even larger than the first, so large that some scientists are now referring to the period in which it occurred as the cryogenian, or super ice age. The condition is more popularly known as Snowball Earth. Snowball, however, barely captures the murderousness of conditions. The theory is that because of a fall in solar radiation of about 6% and a drop-off in the production or retention of greenhouse gases, the Earth essentially lost its ability to hold on to its heat. It became a kind of all-over Antarctica. Temperatures plunged by as much as 45 degrees Celsius. The entire surface of the planet may have been frozen solid, with ocean ice up to 800 meters thick at higher latitudes and tens of meters thick even in the tropics. There is a serious problem in all this, in that the geological evidence indicates ice everywhere, including around the equator, while the biological evidence suggests just as firmly that there must have been open water somewhere. For one thing, cyanobacteria survived the experience, and they photosynthesized. For that, they needed sunlight. But as you will know, if you have ever tried to peer through it, ice very quickly becomes opaque, and after only a few yards would pass on no light at all. Two possibilities have been suggested. One is that a little ocean water did remain exposed, perhaps because of some kind of warming at a hot spot. The other is that maybe the ice formed in such a way that it remained translucent, a condition that does sometimes happen in nature. If Earth did freeze over, then there is the very difficult question of how it ever got warm again. An icy planet should reflect so much heat that it would stay frozen forever. It appears that rescue may have come from our molten interior. Once again, we may be indebted to tectonics for allowing us to be here. The idea is that we were saved by volcanoes, which pushed through the buried surface, pumping out lots of heat and gases that melted the snows and reformed the atmosphere. Interestingly, the end of this hyperfrigid episode is marked by the Cambrian outburst, the springtime event of life's history. In fact, it may not have been as tranquil as all that. As Earth warmed, it probably had the wildest weather it has ever experienced, with hurricanes powerful enough to raise waves to the heights of skyscrapers and rainfalls of indescribable intensity. Throughout all this, the tube worms and clams and other life forms adhering to deep ocean vents undoubtedly went on as if nothing were amiss. But all other life on Earth probably came as close as it ever has to checking out entirely. It was all a long time ago, and at this stage, we just don't know. Compared with a cryogenian outburst, the ice ages of more recent times seem pretty small-scale. But of course they were immensely grand by the standards of anything to be found on Earth today. 
The Wisconsin ice sheet, which covered much of Europe and North America, was over three kilometers thick in places and marched forward at a rate of about 120 meters a year. What a thing it must have been to behold. Even at the leading edge, the ice sheets could be nearly 800 meters thick. Imagine standing at the base of a wall of ice that high. Behind this edge, over an area measuring in the millions of square kilometers, would be nothing but more ice, with only a few of the tallest mountain summits poking through here and there. Whole continents sagged under the weight of so much ice. And even now, 12,000 years after the glacier's withdrawal, are still rising back into place. The ice sheets didn't just dribble out boulders and long lines of gravelly moraines, but dumped entire land masses, Long Island and Cape Cod and Nantucket, among others, as they slowly swept along. It's little wonder that geologists before Agassiz had trouble grasping their monumental capacity to rework landscapes. If ice sheets advanced again, we have nothing in our armory that could deflect them. In 1964, at Prince William Sound in Alaska, one of the largest glacial fields in North America was hit by the strongest earthquake ever recorded on the continent. It measured 9.2 on the Richter scale. Along the fault line, the land rose by as much as six meters. The quake was so violent, in fact, that it made water slosh out of pools in Texas. And what effect did this unparalleled outburst have on the glaciers of Prince William Sound? None at all. They just soaked it up and kept on moving. For a long time, it was thought that we moved into and out of ice ages gradually, over hundreds or thousands of years, but we now know that that has not been the case. Thanks to ice cores from Greenland, we have a detailed record of climate for something over a 100,000 years, and what is found there is not comforting. It shows that for most of its recent history, the earth has been nothing like the stable and tranquil place that civilization has known, but rather has lurched violently between periods of warmth and brutal chill. Towards the end of the last big glaciation, some 12,000 years ago, earth began to warm, and quite rapidly, but then abruptly plunged back into bitter cold for a thousand years or so in an event known to science as the Younger Dryas. The name comes from the Arctic plant, the Dryas, which is one of the first to recolonize land after an ice sheet withdraws. There was also an older Dryas period, but it wasn't so sharp. At the end of this thousand-year onslaught, average temperatures leaped again by as much as four degrees Celsius in twenty years, which doesn't sound terribly dramatic, but is equivalent to exchanging the climate of Scandinavia for that of the Mediterranean in just two decades. Locally, changes have been even more dramatic. Greenland ice cores show the temperatures there changing by as much as 8 degrees Celsius in 10 years, drastically altering rainfall patterns and growing conditions. This must have been unsettling enough on a thinly populated planet. Today, the consequences would be pretty well unimaginable. What is most alarming is that we have no idea, none, what natural phenomena could so swiftly rattle the Earth's thermometer? As Elizabeth Colbert, writing in The New Yorker, has observed, no known external force, or even any that has been hypothesized, seems capable of yanking the temperature back and forth as violently and as often as these cores have shown to be the case. There seems to be, she adds, some vast and terrible feedback loop probably involving the oceans and disruptions of the normal patterns of ocean circulation. But all this is a long way from being understood. One theory is that the heavy inflow of meltwater to the seas at the beginning of the Younger Dryas reduced the saltiness, and thus density, of northern oceans, causing the Gulf Stream to swerve to the south, like a driver trying to avoid a collision. Deprived of the Gulf Stream's warmth, the northern latitudes return to chilly conditions. But this doesn't begin to explain why a thousand years later, when the earth warmed once again, the Gulf Stream didn't veer as before. Instead, we were given the period of unusual tranquility known as the Holocene, the time in which we live now. There is no reason to suppose that this stretch of climatic stability should last much longer. 
In fact, some authorities believe that we are in for even worse. It is natural to suppose that global warming would act as a useful counterweight to the Earth's tendency to plunge back into glacial conditions. However, as Colbert has pointed out, when you are confronted with a fluctuating and unpredictable climate, the last thing you'd want to do is conduct a vast unsupervised experiment on it. It has even been suggested, with more plausibility than would at first seem evident, that an ice age might actually be induced by a rise in temperatures. The idea is that a slight warming would enhance evaporation rates and increase cloud cover, leading in the higher latitudes to more persistent accumulations of snow. In fact, global warming could plausibly, if paradoxically, lead to powerful localized cooling in North America and Northern Europe. Climate is the product of so many variables, rising and falling carbon dioxide levels, the shifts of continents, solar activity, the stately wobbles of the Milankovitch cycles, that it is as difficult to comprehend the events of the past as it is to predict those of the future. Much is simply beyond us. Take Antarctica. For at least 20 million years after it settled over the South Pole, Antarctica remained covered in plants and free of ice. That simply shouldn't have been possible. No less intriguing are the known ranges of some late dinosaurs. The British geologist Stephen Drury notes that forests within 10 degrees latitude of the North Pole were home to great beasts, including Tyrannosaurus rex. That is bizarre, he writes, for such a high latitude is continually dark for three months of the year. Moreover, there is now evidence that these high latitudes suffered severe winters. Oxygen isotope studies suggest that the climate around Fairbanks, Alaska, was about the same in the late Cretaceous period as it is now. So what was Tyrannosaurus doing there? Either it migrated seasonally over enormous distances, or it spent much of the year in snowdrifts in the dark. In Australia, which at that time was more polar in its orientation, a retreat to warmer climes wasn't possible. How dinosaurs managed to survive in such conditions can only be guessed. One thought to bear in mind is that if the ice sheets did start to form again, for whatever reason, there is a lot more water for them to draw on this time. The Great Lakes, Hudson Bay, the countless lakes of Canada, these weren't there to fuel the last ice age. They were created by it. On the other hand, the next phase of our history could see us melting a lot of ice rather than making it. If all the ice sheets melted, sea levels would rise by 60 meters, the height of a 20-story building, and every coastal city in the world would be inundated. More likely, at least in the short term, is the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. In the past 50 years, the waters around it have warmed by 2.5 degrees Celsius, and collapses have increased dramatically. Because of the underlying geology of the area, a large-scale collapse is all the more possible. If so, sea levels globally would rise, and pretty quickly, by between 4.5 and 6 meters on average. The extraordinary fact is that we don't know which is more likely, a future offering us eons of perishing frigidity or one giving us equal expanses of steamy heat. Only one thing is certain. We live on a knife edge. In the long run, incidentally, ice ages are by no means altogether bad news for the planet. They grind up rocks, leaving behind new soils of sumptuous richness, and gouge out freshwater lakes that provide abundant, nutritive possibilities for hundreds of species of being. They act as a spur to migration and keep the planet dynamic. As Tim Flannery has remarked, there's only one question you need to ask of a continent in order to determine the fate of its people. Did you have a good ice age? And with that in mind, it's time to look at a species of ape that truly did. Truly did. Truly did. Truly did. Truly did. Chapter 28 The Mysterious Biped Just before Christmas 1887, a young Dutch doctor with an un-Dutch name 
Marie-Eugène François-Thomas Dubois, arrived in Sumatra, in the Dutch East Indies, with the intention of finding the earliest human remains on Earth. Several things were extraordinary about this. To begin with, no one had ever gone looking for ancient human bones before. Everything that had been found to this point had been found accidentally, and nothing in Dubois's background suggested that he was the ideal candidate to make the process intentional. He was an anatomist by training, with no background in paleontology. Nor was there any special reason to suppose that the East Indies would hold early human remains. Logic dictated that if ancient people were to be found at all, it would be on a large and long-populated landmass, not in the comparative fastness of an archipelago. Dubois was driven to the East Indies on nothing stronger than a hunch. The availability of employment and the knowledge that Sumatra was full of caves, the environment in which most of the important hominid fossils had so far been found. What is most extraordinary in all this, nearly miraculous really, is that he found what he was looking for. At the time Dubois conceived his plan to search for a missing link, the human fossil record consisted of very little. Five incomplete Neanderthal skeletons, one partial jawbone of uncertain provenance, and half a dozen Ice Age humans recently found by railway workers in a cave at a cliff called Cro-Magnon near Les Aisy, France. Of Neanderthal specimens, the best preserved was sitting unremarked on a shelf in London. It had been found by workers blasting rock from a quarry in Gibraltar in 1848, so its preservation was a wonder, but unfortunately no one yet appreciated what it was. After being briefly described at a meeting of the Gibraltar Scientific Society, it had been sent to the Hunterian Museum, where it remained undisturbed, but for an occasional light dusting, for over half a century. The first formal description of it wasn't written until 1907, and then by a geologist named William Solis, with only a passing competency in anatomy. So instead, the name and credit for the discovery of the first early humans went to the Neander Valley in Germany. Not unfittingly, as it happens, for by uncanny coincidence, Neander in Greek means new man. There, in 1856, workmen at another quarry in a cliff face overlooking the Dussel River found some curious-looking bones, which they passed to a local schoolteacher, knowing he had an interest in all things natural. To his great credit, the teacher, Johann Karl Fulrot, saw that he had some new type of human, though quite what it was and how special would be matters of dispute for some time. Many people refused to accept that the Neanderthal bones were ancient at all. August Mayer, a professor at the University of Bonn and a man of influence, insisted that the bones were merely those of a Mongolian Cossack soldier who had been wounded while fighting in Germany in 1814 and had crawled into the cave to die. Hearing of this, T. H. Huxley in England dryly observed how remarkable it was that the soldier, though mortally wounded, had climbed sixty feet up a cliff, divested himself of his clothing and personal effects, sealed the cave opening, and buried himself under two feet of soil. Another anthropologist, puzzling over the Neanderthal's heavy brow ridge, suggested that it was the result of long-term frowning, arising from a poorly healed forearm fracture. In their eagerness to reject the idea of earlier humans, authorities were often willing to embrace the most singular possibilities. At about the time that Dubois was setting out for Sumatra, a skeleton found in Perigo was confidently declared to be that of an Eskimo. Quite what an ancient Eskimo was doing in southwest France was never comfortably explained. It was actually an early Cro-Magnon. It was against this background that Dubois began his search for ancient human bones. He did no digging himself, but instead used fifty convicts lent by the Dutch authorities. For a year they worked on Sumatra, then transferred to Java. And there, in 1891, Dubois, or rather his team, for Dubois himself seldom visited the sites, found a section of ancient human cranium now known as the Trinil Skullcap. Though only part of a skull, it showed that the owner had had distinctly non-human features, but a much larger brain than any ape. Dubois called it Anthropithecus erectus, 
later changed for technical reasons to Pithecanthropus erectus, and declared it the missing link between apes and humans. It quickly became popularized as Java Man. Today, we know it as Homo erectus. The next year, Dubois' workers found a virtually complete thigh bone that looked surprisingly modern. In fact, many anthropologists think it is modern and has nothing to do with Java Man. If it is an erectus bone, it is unlike any other found since. Nevertheless, Dubois used the thigh bone to deduce, correctly as it turned out, that Pithecanthropus walked upright. He also produced, with nothing but a scrap of cranium and one tooth, a model of the complete skull, which also proved uncannily accurate. In 1895, Dubois returned to Europe, expecting a triumphal reception. In fact, he met nearly the opposite reaction. Most scientists disliked both his conclusions and the arrogant manner in which he presented them. The skull cap, they said, was that of an ape probably a gibbon, and not of any early human. Hoping to bolster his case, in 1897 Dubois allowed a respected anatomist from the University of Strasbourg, Gustav Schwalbe, to make a cast of the skullcap. To Dubois' dismay, Schwalbe thereupon produced a monograph that received far more sympathetic attention than anything Dubois had written and followed it with a lecture tour in which he was celebrated nearly as warmly as if he had dug up the skull himself. Appalled and embittered, Dubois withdrew into an undistinguished position as a professor of geology at the University of Amsterdam, and for the next two decades refused to let anyone examine his precious fossils again. He died in 1940, an unhappy man. Meanwhile, and half a world away, in late 1924, Raymond Dart, the Australian-born head of anatomy at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, was sent a small but remarkably complete skull of a child, with an intact face, a lower jaw, and what is known as an endocast, a natural cast of the brain, from a limestone quarry on the edge of the Kalahari Desert at a dusty spot called Tong. Dart could see at once that the Tong skull was not of a Homo erectus like Dubois' Java Man, but from an earlier, more ape-like creature. He placed its age at two million years and dubbed it Australopithecus africanus, or Southern Ape Man of Africa. In a report to Nature, Dart called the Tong remains amazingly human and suggested the need for an entirely new family, Homo simiadi, the man-apes, to accommodate the find. The authorities were even less favorably disposed towards Dart than they had been to Dubois. Nearly everything about his theory, indeed nearly everything about Dart, it appears, annoyed them. To start with, he had proved himself lamentably presumptuous by conducting the analysis himself, rather than calling on the help of more worldly experts. Even his chosen name, Australopithecus, showed a lack of scholarly application combining as it did Greek and Latin roots. Above all, his conclusions flew in the face of accepted wisdom. Humans and apes, it was agreed, had split apart at least 15 million years ago in Asia. If humans had arisen in Africa, why, that would make us negroid, for goodness sake. It was rather as if someone working today were to announce that he had found ancestral bones of humans in, say, Missouri, it just didn't fit with what was known. Dart's sole supporter of note was Robert Broom, a Scottish-born physician and paleontologist of considerable intellect and cherishably eccentric nature. It was Broom's habit, for instance, to do his fieldwork naked when the weather was warm, which was often. He was also known for conducting dubious anatomical experiments on his poorer and more tractable patients, when the patients died, which was also often, he would sometimes bury their bodies in his back garden to dig up for study later. Broom was an accomplished paleontologist, and since he was also resident in South Africa, he was able to examine the Tong skull at first hand. He could see at once that it was as important as Dart supposed, and spoke out vigorously on Dart's behalf, but to no effect. For the next fifty years... The received wisdom was that the Tong child was an ape and nothing more. Most textbooks didn't even mention it. 
Dart spent five years working up a monograph but could find no one to publish it. Eventually he gave up the quest to publish altogether, though he did continue hunting for fossils. For years the skull, today recognized as one of the supreme treasures of anthropology, sat as a paperweight on a colleague's desk. At the time Dart made his announcement in 1924, only four categories of ancient hominid were known. Homo heidelbergensis, Homo rudisiensis, Neanderthals, and Dubois' Javaman. But that was all about to change, in a very big way. First, in China, a gifted Canadian amateur named Davidson Black began to poke around at a place called Dragon Bone Hill, which was locally famous as a hunting ground for old bones. Unfortunately, rather than preserving the bones for study, the Chinese ground them up to make medicines. We can only guess how many priceless Homo erectus bones ended up as a sort of Chinese equivalent of Beecham's powder. The site had been much denuded by the time Black arrived, but he found a single fossilized molar, and on the basis of that alone, quite brilliantly announced the discovery of Sinanthropus pekinensis, which quickly became known as Peking Man. At Black's urging, more determined excavations were undertaken, and many other bones found. Unfortunately, all were lost the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, when a contingent of U.S. Marines, trying to spirit the bones and themselves out of the country, were intercepted by the Japanese and imprisoned. Seeing that their crates held nothing but bones, the Japanese soldiers left them at the roadside. It was the last that was ever seen of them. In the meantime, back on Dubois' old turf of Java, a team led by Ralph von Königswald had found another group of early humans which became known as the Solo People, from the site of their discovery on the Solo River in Gandong. Königswald's discoveries might have been more impressive still, but for a tactical error that was realized too late. He had offered locals ten cents for every piece of hominid bone they could come up with, then discovered, to his horror, that they had been enthusiastically smashing large pieces into small ones to maximize their income. In the following years, as more bones were found and identified, there came a flood of new names. Homo erignescensis, Australopithecus transvalensis, Paranthropus crassidens, Zinjanthropus boise, and scores of others, nearly all involving a new genus type as well as a new species. By the 1950s, the number of named hominid types had risen to comfortably over a hundred. To add to the confusion, individual forms often went by a succession of different names as paleoanthropologists refined, reworked, and squabbled over classifications. The solo people were known variously as Homo soloensis, Homo primigenius asiaticus, Homo neanderthalensis soloensis, Homo sapiens soloensis, Homo erectus erectus, and finally plain Homo erectus. In an attempt to introduce some order, in 1960, F. Clark Howell of the University of Chicago, following the suggestion of Ernst Mayer and others the previous decade, proposed cutting the number of genera to just two, Australopithecus and Homo, and rationalizing many of the species. The Java and Peking men both became Homo erectus. For a time, order prevailed in the world of the hominids. It didn't last. After about a decade of comparative calm, paleoanthropology embarked on another period of swift and numerous discovery, which hasn't abated yet. The 1960s produced Homo habilis, thought by some to be the missing link between apes and humans, but thought by others not to be a separate species at all. Then came, among many others, Homo ergaster, Homo lewis leakii, Homo rudolfensis, Homo microcranus, and Homo antecessor, as well as a raft of Australopithecines. Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus pragans, Australopithecus ramidus, Australopithecus walkeri, Australopithecus anamensis, and still others. Altogether, some twenty types of hominid are recognized in the literature today. Unfortunately, Almost no two experts recognize the same twenty. Some continue to observe the two hominid genera suggested by Howell in 1960, 
But others place some of the Australopithecines in a separate genus called Paranthropus, and still others add an earlier group called Ardipithecus. Some put Pragans into Australopithecus, and some into a new classification, Homo antiquus. But most don't recognize Pragans as a separate species at all. There is no central authority that rules on these things. The only way a name becomes accepted is by consensus, and there is often very little of that. A big part of the problem, paradoxically, is a shortage of evidence. Since the dawn of time, several billion human or human-like beings have lived, each contributing a little genetic variability to the total human stock. Out of this vast number, the whole of our understanding of human prehistory is based on the remains, often exceedingly fragmentary, of perhaps 5,000 individuals. You could fit it all into the back of a pickup truck, if you didn't mind how much you jumbled everything up. Ian Tattersall, the bearded and friendly curator of anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, replied when I asked him the size of the total world archive of hominid and early human bones. The shortage wouldn't be so bad if the bones were distributed evenly through time and space, but of course they are not. They appear randomly, often in the most tantalizing fashion. Homo erectus walked the earth for well over a million years and inhabited territory from the Atlantic edge of Europe to the Pacific side of China. Yet if you brought back to life every Homo erectus individual whose existence we can vouch for, they wouldn't fill a school bus. Homo habilis consists of even less, just two partial skeletons and a number of isolated limb bones. Something as short-lived as our own civilization would almost certainly not be known from the fossil record at all. In Europe, Tattersall offers by way of illustration, you've got hominid skulls in Georgia dated to about 1.7 million years ago, but then you have a gap of almost a million years before the next remains turn up in Spain, right on the other side of the continent. And then you've got another 300,000-year gap before you get a Homo heidelbergensis in Germany, and none of them looks terribly much like any of the others. He smiled. It's from these kinds of fragmentary pieces that you're trying to work out the histories of entire species. It's quite a tall order. We really have very little idea of the relationships between many ancient species, which led to us and which were evolutionary dead ends. Some probably don't deserve to be regarded as separate species at all. It is the patchiness of the record that makes each new find look so sudden and distinct from all the others. If we had tens of thousands of skeletons distributed at regular intervals through the historical record, there would be appreciably more degrees of shading. Whole new species don't emerge instantaneously, as the fossil record implies, but gradually, out of other existing species. The closer you go back to a point of divergence, the closer the similarities are, so that it becomes exceedingly difficult, and sometimes impossible, to distinguish a late Homo erectus from an early Homo sapiens, since it is likely to be both and neither. Similar disagreements can often arise over questions of identification from fragmentary remains, Deciding, for instance, whether a particular bone represents a female Australopithecus boise or a male Homo habilis. With so little to be certain about, scientists often have to make assumptions based on other objects found nearby, and these may be little more than valiant guesses. As Alan Walker and Pat Shipman have dryly observed, if you correlate tool discovery with the species of creature most often found nearby, you would have to conclude that early hand tools were mostly made by antelopes. Perhaps nothing better typifies the confusion than the fragmentary bundle of contradictions that was Homo habilis. Simply put, habilis bones make no sense. When arranged in sequence, they show males and females evolving at different rates and in different directions, the males becoming less ape-like and more human with time, while females from the same period appear to be moving away from humanness towards greater apeness. Some authorities don't believe habilis is a valid category at all. Tattersall and his colleague Jeffrey Schwartz dismiss it as a mere wastebasket species, one into which unrelated fossils could be conveniently swept. Even those who see habilis as an independent species don't agree on whether it is of the same genus as us or is from a side branch that never came to anything. 
Finally, but perhaps above all, human nature is a factor in all this. Scientists have a natural tendency to interpret finds in the way that most flatters their stature. It is a rare paleontologist indeed who announces that he has found a cache of bones, but that they are nothing to get excited about. As John Reeder understatedly observes in the book Missing Links, it is remarkable how often the first interpretations of new evidence have confirmed the preconceptions of its discoverer. All this leaves ample room for arguments, of course, and no bunch of people likes to argue more than paleoanthropologists. And of all the disciplines in science, paleoanthropology boasts perhaps the largest share of egos. Say the authors of the recent Java Man, a book it may be noted that itself devotes long, wonderfully unselfconscious passages to attacks on the inadequacies of others, in particular the author's former close colleague Donald Johansson. So, bearing in mind that there is little you can say about human prehistory that won't be disputed by someone somewhere, other than that we most certainly had one, what we think we know about who we are and where we come from is roughly this. For the first 99.99999% of our history as organisms, we were in the same ancestral line as chimpanzees. Virtually nothing is known about the prehistory of chimpanzees, but whatever they were, we were. Then, about seven million years ago, something major happened. A group of new beings emerged from the tropical forests of Africa and began to move about on the open savanna. These were the Australopithecines, and for the next five million years they would be the world's dominant hominid species. Austral is from the Latin for southern and has no connection in this context with Australia. Australopithecines came in several varieties, some slender and gracile, like Raymond Dart's Tong Child, others more sturdy and robust, but all were capable of walking upright. Some of these species existed for well over a million years, others for a more modest few hundred thousand, but it is worth bearing in mind that even the least successful had histories many times longer than we have yet achieved. The most famous hominid remains in the world are those of a 3.18 million-year-old Australopithecine found at Hadar in Ethiopia in 1974 by a team led by Donald Johansson. Formerly known as AL for a far locality 288-1, the skeleton became more familiarly known as Lucy after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Johansson has never doubted her importance. She is our earliest ancestor, the missing link between ape and human, he has said. Lucy was tiny, just three and a half feet tall. She could walk, though how well is a matter of some dispute. She was evidently a good climber, too. Much else is unknown. Her skull was almost entirely missing, so little could be said with confidence about her brain size, though skull fragments suggest it was small. Most books describe Lucy's skeleton as being 40% complete, though some put it closer to half, and one produced by the American Museum of Natural History describes Lucy as two-thirds complete. The BBC television series Ape Man actually called it a complete skeleton, even while showing that it was anything but. A human body has 206 bones, but many of these are repeated. If you have the left femur from a specimen, you don't need the right to know its dimensions. Strip out all the redundant bones, and the total you are left with is 120, what is called a half-skeleton. Even by this fairly accommodating standard, and even counting the slightest fragment as a full bone, Lucy constituted only 28% of a half-skeleton, and only about 20% of a full one. In The Wisdom of the Bones, Alan Walker recounts how he once asked Johansson how he had come up with a figure of 40%. Johansson breezily replied that he had discounted the 106 bones of the hands and feet, more than half the body's total, and a fairly important half, too, one would have thought, since Lucy's principal defining attribute was the use of those hands and feet to deal with a changing world. At all events, rather less is known about Lucy than is generally supposed. It isn't even actually known that she was a female. Her sex is merely presumed from her diminutive size. Two years after Lucy's discovery, at Latoli in Tanzania, 
Mary Leakey found footprints left by two individuals from, it is thought, the same family of hominids. The prints had been made when two Australopithecines had walked through muddy ash following a volcanic eruption. The ash had later hardened, preserving the impressions of their feet for a distance of over 23 meters. The American Museum of Natural History in New York has an absorbing diorama that records the moment of their passing. It depicts life-sized recreations of a male and a female walking side by side across the ancient African plain. They are hairy and chimp-like in dimensions, but have a bearing and gait that suggest humanness. The most striking feature of the display is that the male holds his left arm protectively around the female shoulder. It is a tender and affecting gesture, suggestive of close bonding. The tableau is presented with such conviction that it is easy to overlook the consideration that virtually everything above the footprints is imaginary. Almost every external aspect of the two figures, degree of hairiness, facial appendages, whether they had human noses or chimp noses, expressions, skin color, size and shape of the female's breasts, is necessarily suppositional. We can't even say that they were a couple. The female figure may, in fact, have been a child. Nor can we be certain that they were Australopithecines. They are assumed to be Australopithecines because there are no other known candidates. I had been told that they were posed like that because during the building of the diorama, the female figure kept toppling over. But Ian Tattersall insists with a laugh that the story is untrue. Obviously, we don't know whether the male had his arm around the female or not, but we do know from the stride measurements that they were walking side by side and close together, close enough to be touching. It was quite an exposed area, so they were probably feeling vulnerable. That's why we tried to give them slightly worried expressions. I asked him if he was troubled about the amount of license that was taken in reconstructing the figures. It's always a problem in making recreations, he agreed readily enough, you wouldn't believe how much discussion can go into deciding details like whether Neanderthals had eyebrows or not. It was just the same for the Latoli figures. We simply can't know the details of what they look like, but we can convey their size and posture and make some reasonable assumptions about their probable appearance. If I had to do it again, I think I might have made them just slightly more ape-like and less human. These creatures weren't humans. They were bipedal apes. Until very recently, it was assumed that we were descended from Lucy and the Latoli creatures, but now many authorities aren't so sure. Although certain physical features, the teeth, for instance, suggest a possible link between us, other parts of the Australopithecine anatomy are more troubling. In their book Extinct Humans, Tattersall and Schwartz point out that the upper portion of the human femur is very like that of the apes, but not like that of the Australopithecines. So if Lucy is in a direct line between apes and modern humans, it means we must have adopted an Australopithecine femur for a million years or so, then gone back to an ape femur when we moved on to the next phase of our development. They believe, in fact, that not only was Lucy not our ancestor, she wasn't even much of a walker. Lucy and her kind did not locomote in anything like the modern human fashion, insists Tattersall. Only when these hominids had to travel between arboreal habitats would they find themselves walking bipedally, forced to do so by their own anatomies. Johansson doesn't accept this. Lucy's hips and the muscular arrangement of her pelvis, he has written, would have made it as hard for her to climb trees as it is for modern humans. Matters grew murkier still in 2001 and 2002, when four exceptional new specimens were found. One, discovered by Maeve Leakey of the famous fossil-hunting family at Lake Turkana in Kenya, and called Kenyanthropus platyops, Kenyan flatface, is from about the same time as Lucy, and raises the possibility that it was our ancestor, and Lucy merely an unsuccessful side branch. Also found in 2001 were Ardipithecus ramidus cadaba, dated at between 5.2 million and 5.8 million years old, and Auroran tugenensis, thought to be six million years old, making it the oldest hominid yet found, but only for a brief while. 
In the summer of 2002, a French team, working in the Jarab Desert of Chad, an area that had never before yielded ancient bones, found a hominid almost seven million years old, which they labeled Sahelanthropus chadensis. Some critics believe that it was not human, but an early ape, and therefore should be called Sahelpithecus. All these were early creatures, and quite primitive, but they walked upright, and they were doing it far earlier than previously thought. Bipedalism is a demanding and risky strategy. It means refashioning the pelvis into a full load-bearing instrument. To preserve the required strength, the birth canal in the female must be comparatively narrow. This has two very significant immediate consequences and one longer-term one. First, it means a lot of pain for any birthing mother and a greatly increased danger of fatality to mother and baby both. Moreover, to get the baby's head through such a tight space, it must be born while its brain is still small, and while the baby, therefore, is still helpless. This means long-term infant care, which in turn implies solid male-female bonding. All this is problematic enough when you are the intellectual master of the planet, but when you are a small, vulnerable australopithecine with a brain about the size of an orange, the risk must have been enormous. So why did Lucy and her kind come down from the trees and out of the forests? Probably they had no choice. The slow rise of the Isthmus of Panama had cut the flow of waters from the Pacific into the Atlantic, diverting warming currents away from the Arctic and leading to the onset of an exceedingly sharp ice age in northern latitudes. In Africa, this would have produced seasonal drying and cooling, gradually turning jungle into savanna, it was not so much that Lucy and her like left the forests, John Gribben has written, but that the forests left them. But stepping out onto the open savanna also clearly left the early hominids much more exposed. An upright hominid could see better, but could also be seen better. Even now, as a species, we are almost preposterously vulnerable in the wild. Nearly every large animal you care to name is stronger, faster, and toothier than us. Faced with attack, modern humans have only two advantages. We have a good brain, with which we can devise strategies, and we have hands, with which we can fling or brandish hurtful objects. We are the only creature that can harm at a distance. We can thus afford to be physically vulnerable. All the elements would appear to have been in place for the rapid evolution of a potent brain, and yet that seems not to have happened. For over three million years, Lucy and her fellow Australopithecines scarcely changed at all. Their brain didn't grow, and there is no sign that they used even the simplest tools. What is stranger still is that we now know that for about a million years they lived alongside other early hominids who did use tools. Yet the Australopithecines never took advantage of this useful technology that was all around them. At one point, between three million and two million years ago, it appears there may have been as many as six hominid types coexisting in Africa. Only one, however, was fated to last, Homo, which emerged from the mists beginning about two million years ago. No one knows quite what the relationship was between Australopithecines and Homo, but what is known is that they coexisted for something over a million years before all the Australopithecines, robust and gracile alike, vanished mysteriously and possibly abruptly over a million years ago. No one knows why they disappeared. Perhaps, suggests Matt Ridley, we ate them. Conventionally, the Homo line begins with Homo habilis, a creature about whom we know almost nothing, and concludes with us, Homo sapiens, literally man the thinker. In between, and depending on which opinions you value, there have been half a dozen other Homo species. Homo ergaster, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo erectus, and Homo antecessor. Homo habilis, handyman, was named by Louis Leakey and colleagues in 1964, and was so called because it was the first hominid to use tools, albeit very simple ones. It was a fairly primitive creature, much more chimpanzee than human, but its brain was about 50% larger than that of Lucy in gross terms, and not much less large proportionally, so it was the Einstein of its day. 
No persuasive reason has ever been adduced for why hominid brains suddenly began to grow two million years ago. For a long time it was assumed that big brains and upright walking were directly related, that the movement out of the forests necessitated cunning new strategies that fed off or promoted braininess. So it was something of a surprise, after the repeated discoveries of so many bipedal dullards, to realize that there was no apparent connection between them at all. There is simply no compelling reason we know of to explain why human brains got large, says Tarasol. Huge brains are demanding organs. They make up only 2% of the body's mass, but devour 20% of its energy. They are also comparatively picky in what they use as fuel. If you never ate another morsel of fat, your brain would not complain, because it won't touch the stuff. It wants glucose instead, and lots of it, even if it means shortchanging other organs. As Guy Brown notes, the body is in constant danger of being depleted by a greedy brain, but cannot afford to let the brain go hungry, as that would rapidly lead to death. A big brain needs more food, and more food means increased risk. Tattersall thinks the rise of a big brain may simply have been an evolutionary accident. He believes with Stephen Jay Gould that if you replayed the tape of life, even if you ran it back only a relatively short way to the dawn of hominids, the chances are quite unlikely that modern humans or anything like them would be here now. One of the hardest ideas for humans to accept, he says, is that we are not the culmination of anything. There is nothing inevitable about our being here. It is part of our vanity as humans that we tend to think of evolution as a process that, in effect, was programmed to produce us. Even anthropologists tended to think this way right up until the 1970s. Indeed, as recently as 1991, in the popular textbook The Stages of Evolution, C. Loring Brace stuck doggedly to the linear concept, acknowledging just one evolutionary dead end, the robust Australopithecines. Everything else represented a straightforward progression, each species of hominid carrying the baton of development so far, then handing it on to a younger, fresher runner. Now, however, it seems certain that many of these early forms followed side trails that didn't come to anything. Luckily for us, one did. A group of tool users who seemed to arise from out of nowhere and overlapped with a shadowy and much disputed Homo habilis. This was Homo erectus, the species discovered by Eugène Dubois in Java in 1891. Depending on which sources you consult, it existed from about 1.8 million years ago to possibly as recently as 20,000 or so years ago. According to the Java man authors, Homo erectus is the dividing line. Everything that came before him was ape-like in character. Everything that came after him was human-like. Homo erectus was the first to hunt, the first to use fire, the first to fashion complex tools, the first to leave evidence of campsites, the first to look after the weak and frail. Compared with all that had gone before, the species was extremely human in form as well as behavior. Its members long-limbed and lean, very strong, much stronger than modern humans, and with the drive and intelligence to spread successfully over huge areas. To other hominids, Homo erectus must have seemed terrifyingly large, powerful, fleet, and gifted. Their brains were vastly more sophisticated than anything the world had seen before. Erectus was the velociraptor of its day, according to Alan Walker of Penn State University, one of the world's leading authorities. If you were to look one in the eyes, it might appear superficially to be human, but you wouldn't connect, you'd be prey. According to Walker, it had the body of an adult human, but the brain of a baby. Although Erectus had been known about for almost a century, it was known only from scattered fragments, not enough to come even close to making one full skeleton. So it wasn't until an extraordinary discovery in Africa in the 1980s that its importance, or at the very least possible importance, as a precursor species for modern humans was fully appreciated. The remote valley of Lake Turkana, formerly Lake Rudolph in Kenya, is now one of the world's most productive sites for early human remains, but for a very long time 
No one had thought to look there. It was only because Richard Leakey was on a flight that was diverted over the valley that he realized it might be more promising than had been thought. A team was dispatched to investigate, but at first found nothing. Then late one afternoon, Kamoya Kimeyu, Leakey's most renowned fossil hunter, found a small piece of hominid brow on a hill well away from the lake. Such a site was unlikely to yield much, but they dug anyway out of respect for Kimeyu's instincts, and to their astonishment found a nearly complete Homo erectus skeleton. It was from a boy, aged between about nine and twelve, who had died 1.54 million years ago. The skeleton had an entirely modern body structure, says Tattersall, in a way that was without precedent. The Turkana boy was, very emphatically, one of us. Also found at Lake Turkana by Kimeu was KNM-ER-1808, a female 1.7 million years old, which gave scientists their first clue that Homo erectus was more interesting and complex than previously thought. The woman's bones were deformed and covered in coarse growths, the result of an agonizing condition called hypervitaminosis A, which can only come from eating the liver of a carnivore. This told us, first of all, that Homo erectus was eating meat. Even more surprising was that the amount of growth showed that she had lived weeks or even months with the disease. Someone had looked after her. It was the first sign of tenderness in hominid evolution. It was also discovered that Homo erectus skulls contained, or in the view of some possibly contained, a Broca's area, a region of the frontal lobe of the brain associated with speech. Chimps don't have such a feature. Alan Walker thinks the spinal canal didn't have the size and complexity to enable speech, that erectus probably would have communicated only about as well as modern chimps. Others, notably Richard Leakey, are convinced they could speak. For a time, it appears, Homo erectus was the only hominid species. They were unprecedentedly adventurous and spread across the globe with what seems to have been breathtaking rapidity. The fossil evidence, if taken literally, suggests that some members of the species reached Java at about the same time as, or even slightly before, they left Africa. This has led some hopeful scientists to suggest that perhaps modern people arose not in Africa at all, but in Asia, which would be remarkable, not to say miraculous, as no possible precursor species has ever been found anywhere outside Africa. The Asian hominids would have had to appear, as it were, spontaneously, and anyway, an Asian beginning would merely reverse the problem of their spread. You would still have to explain how the Java people then got to Africa so quickly. There are several more plausible alternative explanations for how Homo erectus managed to turn up in Asia so soon after its first appearance in Africa. First, a lot of plus or minusing goes into the dating of early human remains. If the actual age of the African bones is at the higher end of the range of estimates, or the Java ones at the lower end, or both, then there is plenty of time for African erectus to find their way to Asia. It is also entirely possible that older erectus bones await discovery in Africa. In addition, the Javan dates could be wrong altogether. What is certain is that sometime well over a million years ago, some new, comparatively modern, upright beings left Africa and boldly spread out across much of the globe. They possibly did so quite rapidly increasing their range by as much as 40 kilometers a year on average, all the while dealing with mountain ranges, rivers, deserts, and other impediments, and adapting to differences in climate and food sources. A particular mystery is how they passed along the west side of the Red Sea, an area of famously punishing aridity now, but even drier in the past. It is a curious irony that the conditions that prompted them to leave Africa would have made it much more difficult to do so. Yet somehow they managed to find their way around every barrier and to thrive in the lands beyond. And that, I'm afraid, is where all agreement ends. What happened next in the history of human development is a matter of long and rancorous debate, as we shall see in the next chapter. But it is worth remembering before we move on 
that all of these evolutionary jostlings over five million years, from distant, puzzled Australopithecine to fully modern human, produced a creature that is still 98.4% genetically indistinguishable from the modern chimpanzee. There is more difference between a zebra and a horse, or between a dolphin and a porpoise, than there is between you and the furry creatures your distant ancestors left behind when they set out to take over the world. The world. The world. The world. The world. The world. Chapter 29. The Restless Ape Sometime about a million and a half years ago, some forgotten genius of the hominid world did an unexpected thing. He, or very possibly she, took one stone and carefully used it to shape another. The result was a simple teardrop-shaped hand axe, but it was the world's first piece of advanced technology. It was so superior to existing tools that soon others were following the inventor's lead and making hand axes of their own. Eventually, whole societies existed that seemed to do little else. They made them in their thousands, says Ian Tattersall. There are some places in Africa where you literally can't move without stepping on them. It's strange, because they are quite intensive objects to make. It was as if they made them for the sheer pleasure of it. From a shelf in his sunny workroom, Tattersall took down an enormous cast, perhaps half a meter long and twenty centimeters wide at its widest point, and handed it to me. It was shaped like a spearhead, but one the size of a stepping stone. As a fiberglass cast, it weighed only a few ounces, but the original, which was found in Tanzania, weighed eleven kilograms. It was completely useless as a tool, Tattersall said. It would have taken two people to lift it adequately, and even then it would have been exhausting to try to pound anything with it. What was it used for, then? Tattersall gave a genial shrug, pleased at the mystery of it. No idea. It must have had some symbolic importance, but we can only guess what. The axes became known as Aculean tools, after St. Acule, a suburb of Amiens in northern France, where the first examples were found in the 19th century and contrast with the older, simpler tools known as Oldawan, originally found at Old Duvai Gorge in Tanzania. In fact, paleoanthropologists now tend to believe that the tool parts of Oldawan rocks were the pieces flaked off these larger stones, which could then be used for cutting. Now here's the mystery. When early modern humans, the ones who would eventually become us, started to move out of Africa something over a hundred thousand years ago, Aculean tools were the technology of choice. These early Homo sapiens loved their Aculean tools, too. They carried them vast distances. Sometimes they even took unshaped rocks with them to make into tools later on. They were, in a word, devoted to the technology. But although Aculean tools have been found throughout Africa, Europe, and Western and Central Asia, they are almost never found in the Far East. This is deeply puzzling. In the 1940s, a Harvard paleontologist named Hallam Movius drew something called the Movius line, dividing the side with Aculean tools from the one without. The line runs in a southeasterly direction across Europe and the Middle East to the vicinity of modern-day Calcutta and Bangladesh. Beyond the Movius line, across the whole of Southeast Asia and into China, only the older, simpler Old Darwin tools have been found. We know that Homo sapiens went far beyond this point, so why would they carry an advanced and treasured stone technology to the edge of the Far East and then just abandon it? That troubled me for a long time, recalls Alan Thorne of the Australian National University in Canberra. The whole of modern anthropology was built around the idea that humans came out of Africa in two waves— a first wave of Homo erectus, which became Java man and Peking man and the like, and a later more advanced wave of Homo sapiens, which displaced the first lot. Yet to accept that, you must believe that Homo sapiens got so far with their more modern technology, and then for whatever reason gave it up. It was all very puzzling, to say the least. 
As it turned out, there would be a great deal else to be puzzled about, and one of the most puzzling findings of all would come from Thorne's own part of the world, in the outback of Australia. In 1968, a geologist named Jim Bowler was poking around on a long, dried lake bed called Mungo in a parched and lonely corner of western New South Wales when something very unexpected caught his eye. Sticking out of a crescent-shaped sand ridge of a type known as a lunette were some human bones. At the time, it was believed that humans had been in Australia for no more than 8,000 years, but Mungo had been dry for 12,000 years. So what was anyone doing in such an inhospitable place? The answer, provided by carbon dating, was that the bones owner had lived there when Lake Mungo was a much more agreeable habitat, twenty kilometers long, full of water and fish, fringed by pleasant groves of casuarina trees. To everyone's astonishment, the bones turned out to be twenty-three thousand years old. Other bones found nearby proved to be as much as sixty thousand years old. This was unexpected to the point of seeming practically impossible. At no time since hominids first arose on Earth has Australia not been an island. Any human beings who arrived there must have come by sea, in large enough numbers to start a breeding population. After crossing 100 kilometers or more of open water without having any way of knowing that a convenient landfall awaited them. Having landed, the Mungo people had then found their way over 3,000 kilometers inland from Australia's north coast, the presumed point of entry, which suggests, according to a report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that people may have first arrived substantially earlier than 60,000 years ago. How they got there and why they came are questions that can't be answered. According to most anthropology texts, there's no evidence that people could even speak 60,000 years ago, much less engage in the sorts of cooperative efforts necessary to build ocean-worthy craft and colonize island continents. There's just a whole lot we don't know about the movements of people before recorded history, Alan Thorne told me when I met him in Canberra. Do you know that when 19th century anthropologists first got to Papua New Guinea, they found people in the highlands of the interior in some of the most inaccessible terrain on earth growing sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes are native to South America, so how did they get to Papua New Guinea? We don't know. We don't have the faintest idea. But what is certain is that people have been moving around with considerable assuredness for longer than traditionally thought, and almost certainly sharing genes as well as information. The problem, as ever, is the fossil record. Very few parts of the world are even vaguely amenable to the long-term preservation of human remains, says Thorne, a sharp-eyed man with a white goatee and an intent but friendly manner. If it weren't for a few productive areas like Hadar and Olduvai in East Africa, we'd know frighteningly little. And when you look elsewhere, often we do know frighteningly little. The whole of India has yielded just one ancient human fossil from about 300,000 years ago. Between Iraq and Vietnam, that's a distance of some 5,000 kilometers, there have been just two, the one in India and a Neanderthal in Uzbekistan. He grinned. That's not a whole hell of a lot to work with. You're left with a position that you've got a few productive areas for human fossils, like the Great Rift Valley in Africa and Mungo here in Australia, and very little in between. It's not surprising that paleontologists have trouble connecting the dots. The traditional theory to explain human movements, and the one still accepted by the majority of people in the field, is that humans dispersed across Eurasia in two waves. The first wave consisted of Homo erectus, who left Africa remarkably quickly, almost as soon as they emerged as a species, beginning nearly two million years ago. Over time, as they settled in different regions, these early erects further evolved into distinctive types, into Java man and Peking man in Asia, and into Homo heidelbergensis and finally Homo neanderthalensis in Europe. Then, something over a hundred thousand years ago, a smarter, lither species of creature, the ancestors of every one of us alive today, 
arose on the African plains and began radiating outwards in a second wave. Wherever they went, according to this theory, these new Homo sapiens displaced their duller, less adept predecessors. Quite how they did this has always been a matter of disputation. No signs of slaughter have ever been found, so most authorities believe the newer hominids simply outcompeted the older ones, though other factors may also have contributed. Perhaps we gave them smallpox, suggests Tattersall. There's no real way of telling. The one certainty is that we are here now and they aren't. These first modern humans are surprisingly shadowy. We know less about ourselves, curiously enough, than about almost any other line of hominids. It is odd indeed, as Tattersall notes, that the most recent major event in human evolution, the emergence of our own species, is perhaps the most obscure of all. Nobody can even quite agree where truly modern humans first appear in the fossil record. Many books place their debut at about 120,000 years ago, in the form of remains found at the Clazy's River mouth in South Africa, but not everyone accepts that these were fully modern people. Tattersall and Schwartz maintain that whether any or all of them actually represents our species still awaits definitive clarification. The first undisputed appearance of Homo sapiens is in the eastern Mediterranean, around modern-day Israel, where they begin to show up about a hundred thousand years ago, but even there they are described by Trinkhaus and Shipman as odd, difficult to classify, and poorly known. Neanderthals were already well established in the region, and had a type of toolkit known as Musterian, which the modern humans evidently found worthy enough to borrow. No Neanderthal remains have ever been found in North Africa, but their toolkits turn up all over the place. Somebody must have taken them there. Modern humans are the only candidate. It is also known that Neanderthals and modern humans coexisted in some fashion for tens of thousands of years in the Middle East. We don't know if they time-shared the same space or actually lived side by side, Tattersall says but the moderns continued happily to use Neanderthal tools, hardly convincing evidence of overwhelming superiority. No less curiously, Aculean tools are found in the Middle East well over a million years ago, but scarcely exist in Europe until just 300,000 years ago. Again, why people who had the technology didn't take the tools with them is a mystery. For a long time it was believed that the Cro-Magnons, as modern humans in Europe became known, drove the Neanderthals before them as they advanced across the continent, eventually forcing them to the western margins of the continent, where essentially they had no choice but to fall in the sea or go extinct. In fact, it is now known that Cro-Magnons were in the far west of Europe at about the same time they were also coming in from the east. Europe was a pretty empty place in those days, Tattersall says. They may not have encountered each other all that often, even with all their comings and goings. One curiosity of the Cro-Magnon's arrival is that it came at a time known to paleoclimatology as the Boutellier Interval, when Europe was plunging from a period of relative mildness into yet another long spell of punishing cold. Whatever it was that drew them to Europe, it wasn't the glorious weather. In any case, the idea that Neanderthals crumpled in the face of competition from newly arrived Cro-Magnons strains against the evidence at least a little. Neanderthals were nothing if not tough. For tens of thousands of years they lived through conditions that no modern human outside of few polar scientists and explorers has experienced. During the worst of the Ice Ages, blizzards with hurricane-force winds were common. Temperatures routinely fell to minus 45 degrees Celsius. Polar bears padded across the snowy vales of southern England. Neanderthals naturally retreated from the worst of it. But even so, they will have experienced weather that was at least as bad as a modern Siberian winter. They suffered, to be sure. A Neanderthal who lived much past 30 was lucky indeed. But as a species, they were magnificently resilient and practically indestructible. They survived for at least a hundred thousand years, and perhaps twice that, over an area stretching from Gibraltar to Uzbekistan, which is a pretty successful run for any species of being. Quite who they were and what they were like 
remained matters of disagreement and uncertainty. Right up until the middle of the 20th century, the accepted anthropological view of the Neanderthal was that he was dim, stooped, shuffling, and simian, the quintessential caveman. It was only a painful accident that prodded scientists to reconsider this view. In 1947, while doing field work in the Sahara, a Franco-Algerian paleontologist named Camille Arambourg took refuge from the midday sun under the wing of his light aircraft. As he sat there, a tire burst from the heat, and the plane tipped suddenly, striking him a painful blow on the upper body. Later, in Paris, he went for an X-ray of his neck and noticed that his own vertebrae were aligned exactly like those of the stooped and hulking Neanderthal. Either he was physiologically primitive, or the Neanderthal's posture had been misdescribed. In fact, it was the latter. Neanderthal vertebrae were not simian at all. It changed utterly how we view Neanderthals, but only some of the time, it appears. It is still commonly held that Neanderthals lacked the intelligence or fiber to compete on equal terms with the continent's slender and more cerebrally nimble newcomers, Homo sapiens. Here is a typical comment from a recent book. Modern humans neutralized this advantage, the Neanderthals' considerably heartier physique, with better clothing, better fires, and better shelter. Meanwhile, the Neanderthals were stuck with an oversized body that required more food to sustain. In other words, the very factors that had allowed them to survive successfully for a hundred thousand years suddenly became an insuperable handicap. Above all, the issue that is almost never addressed is that Neanderthals had brains that were significantly larger than those of modern people, 1.8 liters for Neanderthals versus 1.4 for modern people, according to one calculation. This is more than the difference between modern Homo sapiens and the late Homo erectus, a species we are happy to regard as barely human. The argument put forward is that although our brains were smaller, they were somehow more efficient. I believe I speak the truth when I observe that nowhere else in human evolution is such an argument made. So why then, you may well ask, if the Neanderthals were so stout and adaptable and cerebrally well endowed, are they no longer with us? One possible but much disputed answer is that perhaps they are. Alan Thorne is one of the leading proponents of an alternative theory known as the multi-regional hypothesis which holds that human evolution has been continuous. That just as Australopithecines evolved into Homo habilis, and Homo heidelbergensis became over time Homo neanderthalensis, so modern Homo sapiens simply emerged from more ancient Homo forms. Homo erectus is, on this view, not a separate species, but just a transitional phase. Thus, modern Chinese are descended from ancient Homo erectus forebears in China modern Europeans, from ancient European Homo erectus, and so on. Except that for me there are no Homo erectus, says Thorne. I think it's a term which has outlived its usefulness. For me, Homo erectus is simply an earlier part of us. I believe only one species of humans has ever left Africa, and that species is Homo sapiens. Opponents of the multi-regional theory rejected in the first instance on the grounds that it requires an improbable amount of parallel evolution by hominids throughout the old world. In Africa, China, Europe, the most distant islands of Indonesia, wherever they appeared. Some also believe that multi-regionalism encourages a racist view, of which anthropology took a very long time to rid itself. In the early 1960s, a famous anthropologist named Carlton Kuhn of the University of Pennsylvania suggested that some modern races have different sources of origin, implying that some of us come from superior stock to others. This harkened back uncomfortably to earlier beliefs that some modern races, such as the African Bushmen, properly the Kalahari San, and Australian Aborigines, were more primitive than others. Whatever Kuhn may personally have felt, the implication for many people was that some races are inherently more advanced and that some humans could essentially constitute different species. The view, so instinctively offensive now, was widely popularized in many respectable places until fairly recent times. 
I have before me a popular book published by Time Life Publications in 1961 called The Epic of Man, based on a series of articles in Life magazine. In it, you can find such comments as, Rhodesian man lived as recently as 25,000 years ago and may have been an ancestor of the African Negroes. His brain size was close to that of Homo sapiens. In other words, black Africans were recently descended from creatures that were only close to Homo sapiens. Thorne emphatically, and I believe sincerely, dismisses the idea that his theory is in any measure racist, and accounts for the uniformity of human evolution by suggesting that there was a lot of movement back and forth between cultures and regions. There's no reason to suppose that people only went in one direction, he says. People were moving all over the place, and where they met, they almost certainly shared genetic material through interbreeding. New arrivals didn't replace the indigenous populations, they joined them, they became them. He likens the situation to when explorers like Cook or Magellan encountered remote peoples for the first time. They weren't meetings of different species, but of the same species with some physical differences. What you actually see in the fossil record, Thorne insists, is a smooth, continuous transition. There's a famous skull from Petrolona in Greece, dating from about 300,000 years ago, that has been a matter of contention among traditionalists because it seems in some ways Homo erectus, but in other ways Homo sapiens. Well, what we say is that this is just what you would expect to find in species that were evolving rather than being displaced. One thing that would help to resolve matters would be evidence of interbreeding but that is not at all easy to prove or disprove from fossils. In 1999, archaeologists in Portugal found the skeleton of a child, about four years old, who had died 24,500 years ago. The skeleton was modern overall, but with certain archaic, possibly Neanderthal, characteristics. Unusually sturdy leg bones, teeth bearing a distinctive shoveling pattern, and, though not everyone agrees on it, an indentation at the back of the skull called a suprainiac fossa, a feature exclusive to Neanderthals. Eric Trinkhouse of Washington University in St. Louis, the leading authority on Neanderthals, announced the child to be a hybrid, proof that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred. Others, however, were troubled that the Neanderthal and modern features weren't more blended. As one critic put it, if you look at a mule, you don't have the front end looking like a donkey and the back end looking like a horse. Ian Tattersall declared it to be nothing more than a chunky modern child. He accepts that there may well have been some hanky-panky between Neanderthals and moderns, but doesn't believe it could have resulted in reproductively successful offspring. I don't know of any two organisms from any realm of biology that are that different and still in the same species, he says. With the fossil record so unhelpful, scientists have turned increasingly to genetic studies, in particular the part known as mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA was only discovered in 1964, but by the 1980s, some ingenious souls at the University of California at Berkeley had realized that it has two features that lend it a particular convenience as a kind of molecular clock. It is passed on only through the female line, so it doesn't become scrambled with paternal DNA with each new generation, and it mutates about 20 times faster than normal nuclear DNA, making it easier to detect and follow genetic patterns over time. By tracking the rates of mutation, they could work out the genetic histories and relationships of whole groups of people. In 1987, the Berkeley team, led by the late Alan Wilson, did an analysis of mitochondrial DNA from 147 individuals and declared that the rise of anatomically modern humans occurred in Africa within the last 140,000 years, and that all present-day humans are descended from that population. It was a serious blow to the multiregionalists. But then people began to look a little more closely at the data. One of the most extraordinary points, almost too extraordinary to credit, really, was that the Africans used in the study were actually African Americans, 
whose genes had obviously been subjected to considerable mediation in the past few hundred years. Doubts also soon emerged about the assumed rates of mutations. By 1992, the study was largely discredited, but the techniques of genetic analysis continued to be refined. In 1997, scientists from the University of Munich managed to extract and analyze some DNA from the arm bone of the original Neanderthal man, and this time the evidence stood up. The Munich study found that the Neanderthal DNA was unlike any DNA found on Earth now, strongly indicating that there was no genetic connection between Neanderthals and modern humans. Now this really was a blow to multi-regionalism. Then in late 2000, Nature and other publications reported on a Swedish study of the mitochondrial DNA of 53 people, which suggested that all modern humans emerged from Africa within the past 100,000 years and came from a breeding stock of no more than 10,000 individuals. Soon afterwards, Eric Lander, director of the Whitehead Institute Stroke Massachusetts Institute of Technology Center for Genome Research, announced that modern Europeans, and perhaps people further afield, are descended from no more than a few hundred Africans who left their homeland as recently as 25,000 years ago. As we have noted elsewhere in the book, modern human beings show remarkably little genetic variability. There's more diversity in one social group of 55 chimps than in the entire human population, as one authority has put it. And this would explain why. Because we are recently descended from a small founding population, there hasn't been time enough or people enough to provide a source of great variability. It seemed a pretty severe blow to multi-regionalism. After this, a Penn State academic told the Washington Post, people won't be too concerned about the multi-regional theory, which has very little evidence. But all of this overlooked the more or less infinite capacity for surprise offered by the ancient Mungo people of western New South Wales. In early 2001, Thorne and his colleagues at the Australian National University reported that they had recovered DNA from the oldest of the Mungo specimens, now dated at 62,000 years, and that this DNA proved to be genetically distinct. The Mungo man, according to these findings, was anatomically modern, just like you and me, but carried an extinct genetic lineage. His mitochondrial DNA is no longer found in living humans, as it should be, if, like all other modern people, he was descended from individuals who had left Africa in the recent past. It turned everything upside down again, says Thorne, with undisguised delight. Then other, even more curious, anomalies began to turn up. Rosalind Harding, a population geneticist at the Institute of Biological Anthropology in Oxford, while studying beta-globin genes in modern people, found two variants that are common among Asians and the indigenous people of Australia, but hardly exist in Africa. The variant genes, she is certain, arose more than 200,000 years ago, not in Africa, but in East Asia long before modern Homo sapiens reached the region. The only way to account for them is to say that the ancestors of people now living in Asia included archaic hominids, Java man and the like. Interestingly, this same variant gene, the Java man gene, so to speak, turns up in modern populations in Oxfordshire. Confused, I went to see Ms. Harding at the Institute, which inhabits an old brick villa on the Banbury Road in Oxford. Harding is a small and chirpy Australian from Brisbane originally, with a rare knack for being amused and earnest at the same time. Now, now, she said at once, grinning, when I asked her how people in Oxfordshire came to harbor sequences of beta globin that shouldn't be there. On the whole, she went on more somberly, the genetic record supports the out-of-Africa hypothesis, but then you find these anomalous clusters, which most geneticists prefer not to talk about. There's huge amounts of information that will be available to us if only we could understand it, but we don't yet. We've barely begun. She refused to be drawn on what the existence of Asian origin genes in Oxfordshire tells us, other than that the situation is clearly complicated. All we can say at this stage is that it is very untidy and we don't really know why.
At the time of our meeting in early 2002, another Oxford scientist named Brian Sykes had just produced a popular book called The Seven Daughters of Eve, in which, using studies of mitochondrial DNA, he had claimed to be able to trace nearly all living Europeans back to a founding population of just seven women, the Daughters of Eve of the title, who lived between 10,000 and 45,000 years ago in the time known to science as the Paleolithic. To each of these women Sykes had given a name, Ursula, Xenia, Jasmine, and so on, and even a detailed personal history. Ursula was her mother's second child. The first had been taken by a leopard when he was only two. When I asked Harding about the book, she smiled broadly, but carefully, as if not quite certain where to go with her answer. Well, I suppose you must give him some credit for helping to popularize a difficult subject, she said, and paused thoughtfully. And there remains the remote possibility that he's right. She laughed, then went on more intently. Data from any single gene cannot really tell you anything so definitive. If you follow the mitochondrial DNA backwards, it will take you to a certain place, to an Ursula or Tara or whatever. But if you take any other bit of DNA, any gene at all, and trace it back, it will take you someplace else altogether. It was a little, I gathered, like following a road randomly out of London and finding that eventually it ends up at John O'Groats, and concluding from this that anyone in London must therefore have come from the north of Scotland. They might have come from there, of course, but equally they could have arrived from any of hundreds of other places. In this sense, according to Harding, every gene is a different highway, and we have only barely begun to map the roots. No single gene is ever going to tell you the whole story, she said. So genetic studies aren't to be trusted? Oh, you can trust the studies well enough, generally speaking. What you can't trust are the sweeping conclusions that people often attach to them. She thinks out of Africa is probably 95% correct, but adds... I think both sides have done a bit of a disservice to science by insisting that it must be one thing or the other. Things are likely to turn out not to be so straightforward as either camp would have you believe. The evidence is clearly starting to suggest that there were multiple migrations and dispersals in different parts of the world going in all kinds of directions and generally mixing up the gene pool. That's never going to be easy to sort out. Just at this time, there were also a number of reports questioning the reliability of claims concerning the recovery of very ancient DNA. An academic writing in Nature had noted how a paleontologist, asked by a colleague whether he thought an old skull was varnished or not, had licked its top and announced that it was. In the process, noted the Nature article, large amounts of modern human DNA would have been transferred to the skull, rendering it useless for future study. I asked Harding about this. Oh, it would almost certainly have been contaminated already, she said. Just handling a bone will contaminate it. Breathing on it will contaminate it. Most of the water in our labs will contaminate it. We are all swimming in foreign DNA. In order to get a reliably clean specimen, you have to excavate it in sterile conditions and do the tests on it at the site. It's the trickiest thing in the world not to contaminate a specimen. So should such claims be treated dubiously, I asked? Ms. Harding nodded solemnly. Very, she said. If you wish to understand at once why we know as little as we do about human origins, I have the place for you. It is to be found a little beyond the edge of the blue Gong Hills in Kenya, to the south and west of Nairobi. Drive out of the city on the main highway to Uganda, and there comes a moment of startling glory when the ground falls away and you are presented with a hang glider's view of boundless, pale green African plain. This is the Great Rift Valley, which arcs across 3,000 miles of East Africa, marking the tectonic rupture that is setting Africa adrift from Asia. Here, perhaps 65 kilometers out of Nairobi, along the baking valley floor, is an ancient site called Olagersali, which once stood beside a large and pleasant lake. In 1919, long after the lake had vanished, a geologist named J. W. Gregory was scouting the area for mineral prospects 
when he came across a stretch of open ground littered with anomalous dark stones that had clearly been shaped by human hand. He had found one of the great sites of Aquilean tool manufacture that Ian Tattersall had told me about. Unexpectedly, in the summer of 2002, I found myself a visitor to this extraordinary site. I was in Kenya for another purpose altogether, visiting some projects run by the charity Care International. But my hosts, knowing of my interest in human origins for the present volume, had inserted a visit to Orlegaseli into the schedule. After its discovery by the geologist Gregory, Orlegaseli lay undisturbed for over two decades before the famed husband and wife team of Lewis and Mary Leakey began an excavation that isn't completed yet. What the Leakeys found was a site stretching to ten acres or so, where tools were made in incalculable numbers for roughly a million years, from about 1.2 million years ago to 200,000 years ago. Today, the tool beds are sheltered from the worst of the elements, beneath large tin lean-tos, and fenced off with chicken wire to discourage opportunistic scavenging by visitors. But otherwise, the tools are left just where their creators dropped them and where the leakies found them. Giuliani Ngali, a keen young man from the Kenyan National Museum who had been dispatched to act as a guide, told me that the quartz and obsidian rocks from which the axes were made were never found on the valley floor. They had to carry the stones from there, he said, nodding at a pair of mountains in the hazy middle distance in opposite directions from the site, Olegaseli and Olesekut. Each was about ten kilometers away, a long way to carry an armload of stone. Why the early Olegaseli people went to such trouble, we can only guess, of course. Not only did they lug hefty stones considerable distances to the lakeside, but perhaps even more remarkably, they then organized the site. The Leakey's excavations revealed that there were areas where axes were fashioned and others where blunt axes were brought to be resharpened. Orlegaseli was, in short, a kind of factory, one that stayed in business for a million years. Various replications have shown that the axes were tricky and labor-intensive objects to make. Even with practice, an axe would take hours to fashion, and yet... Curiously, they were not particularly good for cutting or chopping or scraping or any of the other tasks to which they were presumably put. So we are left with a position that for a million years, far, far longer than our own species has even been in existence, much less engaged in continuous cooperative efforts, early people came in considerable numbers to this particular site to make extravagantly large numbers of tools that appear to have been rather curiously pointless. And who were these people? We have no idea, actually. We assume they were Homo erectus, because there are no other known candidates, which means that at their peak, their peak, the Orlegaseli workers would have had the brains of a modern infant. But there is no physical evidence on which to base a conclusion. Despite over sixty years of searching, no human bone has ever been found in or around the vicinity of Orlegaseli. However much time they spent there shaping rocks, it appears they went elsewhere to die. It's all a mystery, Jilani Ngali told me, beaming happily. The Orlegaseli people disappeared from the scene about 200,000 years ago, when the lake dried up and the rift valley started to become the hot and challenging place it is today. But by this time, their days as a species were already numbered. The world was about to get its first real master race, Homo sapiens, Things would never be the same again. Chapter 30 Goodbye In the early 1680s, at just about the time that Edmund Halley and his friends Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke were settling down in a London coffee house and embarking on the casual wager that would result eventually in Isaac Newton's Principia, Henry Cavendish's Weighing of the Earth, and many of the other inspired and commendable undertakings that have occupied us so far, a rather less desirable milestone was being passed on the island of Mauritius, far out in the Indian Ocean, some 1,300 kilometers off the east coast of Madagascar. 
There, some forgotten sailor or sailor's pet was harrying to death the last of the dodos, the famously flightless bird whose dim but trusting nature and lack of leggy zip made it a rather irresistible target for bored young tars on shore leave. Millions of years of peaceful isolation had not prepared it for the erratic and deeply unnerving behavior of human beings. We don't know precisely the circumstances or even the year attending the last moments of the last dodo, so we don't know which arrived first, a world that contained a principia or one that had no dodos, but we do know that they happened at more or less the same time. You would be hard-pressed, I would submit, to find a better pairing of occurrences to illustrate the divine and felonious nature of the human being. A species of organism that is capable of unraveling the deepest secrets of the heavens, while at the same time pounding into extinction for no purpose at all a creature that never did us any harm, and wasn't even remotely capable of understanding what we were doing to it as we did it. Indeed, dodos were so spectacularly short on insight, it is reported, that if you wished to find all the dodos in a vicinity, you only had to catch one and set it to squawking and all the others would waddle along to see what was up. The indignities to the poor dodo didn't end quite there. In 1755, some seventy years after the last dodo's death, the director of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford decided that the institution's stuffed dodo was becoming unpleasantly musty and ordered it tossed on a bonfire. This was a surprising decision, as it was by this time the only dodo in existence, stuffed or otherwise. A passing employee, aghast, tried to rescue the bird, but could only save its head and part of one limb. As a result of this, and other departures from common sense, we are not now entirely sure what a living dodo was like. We possess much less information than most people suppose. A handful of crude descriptions by unscientific voyagers, three or four oil paintings, and a few scattered osseous fragments, in the somewhat aggrieved words of the nineteenth-century naturalist H. E. Strickland. As Strickland wistfully observed, we have more physical evidence of some ancient sea monsters and lumbering sauropods than we do of a bird that lived into modern times and required nothing of us to survive except our absence. So what is known of the dodo is this. It lived on Mauritius, was plump but not tasty, and was the biggest ever member of the pigeon family, though by quite what margin is unknown, as its weight was never accurately recorded. Extrapolations from Strickland's osseous fragments and the Ashmolean's modest remains show that it was a little over two and a half feet tall and about the same distance from beak tip to backside. Being flightless, it nested on the ground leaving its eggs and chicks tragically easy prey for pigs, dogs, and monkeys brought to the island by outsiders. It was probably extinct by 1683, and was most certainly gone by 1693. Beyond that, we know almost nothing, except, of course, that we will not see its like again. We know nothing of its reproductive habits and diet, where it ranged, what sounds it made in tranquility or alarm. We don't possess a single dodo egg. From beginning to end, our acquaintance with animate dodos lasted just seventy years. That is a breathtakingly scanty period, though it must be said that by this point in our history we did have thousands of years of practice behind us in the matter of irreversible eliminations. Nobody knows quite how destructive human beings are, but it is a fact that over the last fifty thousand years or so, wherever we have gone, animals have tended to vanish often in astonishingly large numbers. In America, thirty genera of large animals, some very large indeed, disappeared practically at a stroke after the arrival of modern humans on the continent between ten and twenty thousand years ago. Altogether, North and South America between them lost about three-quarters of their big animals once man the hunter arrived with his flint-headed spears and keen organizational capabilities. Europe and Asia, where the animals had had longer to evolve a useful wariness of humans, lost between a third and a half of their big creatures. Australia, for exactly the opposite reasons, lost no less than 95 percent. 
Because the early hunter populations were comparatively small, and the animal populations truly monumental, as many as ten million mammoth carcasses are thought to lie frozen in the tundra of northern Siberia alone, some authorities think there must be other explanations, possibly involving climate change or some kind of pandemic. As Ross McPhee of the American Museum of Natural History put it, there's no material benefit to hunting dangerous animals more often than you need to. There are only so many mammoth steaks you can eat. Others believe it may have been almost criminally easy to catch and clobber prey. In Australia and the Americans, says Tim Flannery, the animals probably didn't know enough to run away. Some of the creatures that were lost were singularly spectacular and would take a little managing if they were still around. Imagine ground sloths that could look into an upstairs window, tortoises nearly the size of a small fiat, monitor lizards six meters long basking beside desert highways in Western Australia. Alas, they are gone, and we live on a more diminished planet. Today, across the whole world, only four types of really hefty, a ton or more, land animals survive. Elephants, rhinos, hippos, and giraffes. Not for tens of millions of years has life on Earth been so diminutive and tame. The question that arises is whether the disappearances of the Stone Age and disappearances of more recent times are in effect part of a single extinction event. Whether, in short, humans are inherently bad news for other living things. The sad likelihood is that we may well be. According to the University of Chicago paleontologist David Raup, the background rate of extinction on Earth throughout biological history has been one species lost every four years on average. According to Richard Leakey and Roger Lewin in The Sixth Extinction, human-caused extinction may now be running at as much as 120,000 times that level. In the mid-1990s, the Australian naturalist Tim Flannery, now head of the South Australian Museum in Adelaide, became struck by how little we seem to know about many extinctions, including relatively recent ones. Wherever you look, there seem to be gaps in the records, pieces missing, as with a dodo, or not recorded at all, he told me in Melbourne in early 2002. Flannery recruited his friend, Peter Shooten, an artist and fellow Australian, and together they embarked on a slightly obsessive quest to scour the world's major collections to find out what was lost, what was left, and what had never been known at all. They spent four years picking through old skins, musty specimens, old drawings and written descriptions, whatever was available. Shooten made life-sized paintings of every animal they could reasonably recreate, and Flannery wrote the words. The result was an extraordinary book called a gap in nature, constituting the most complete and, it must be said, moving catalogue of animal extinctions from the last 300 years. For some animals, records were good, but nobody had done anything much with them, sometimes for years, sometimes forever. Stellar sea cow, a walrus-like creature related to the dugong, was one of the last really big animals to go extinct. It was truly enormous. An adult could reach lengths of nearly nine meters and weigh ten tons. But we are acquainted with it only because, in 1741, a Russian expedition happened to be shipwrecked on the sole place where the creatures still survived in any numbers, the remote and foggy Commander Islands in the Bering Sea. Happily, the expedition had a naturalist, Georg Steller, who was fascinated by the animal. He took the most copious notes, says Flannery even measured the diameter of its whiskers. The only thing he wouldn't describe was the male genitals, though for some reason he was happy enough to do the females. He even saved a piece of skin, so we had a good idea of its texture. We weren't always so lucky. The one thing Stellar couldn't do was save the sea cow itself. Already hunted to the brink of extinction, it would be gone altogether within twenty-seven years of Stellar's discovery of it. Many other animals, however, couldn't be included because too little is known about them. The Darling Downs Hopping Mouse, Chatham Island Swan, Ascension Island Flightless Crake, at least five types of large turtle, and many others are forever lost to us except as names.
A great deal of extinction, Flannery and Shooten discovered, hasn't been cruel or wanton, but just kind of majestically foolish. In 1894, when a lighthouse was built on a lonely rock called Stevens Island in the tempestuous strait between the North and South Islands of New Zealand, the lighthouse keeper's cat kept bringing him strange little birds that it had caught. The keeper dutifully sent some specimens to the museum in Wellington. There, a curator grew very excited because the bird was a relic species of flightless wrens, the only example of a flightless perching bird ever found anywhere. He set off at once for the island, but by the time he got there, the cat had killed them all. Twelve stuffed specimens of the Stevens Island flightless wren are all that now exist. At least we have those. All too often, it turns out, we are not much better at looking after species after they have gone than we were before they went. Take the case of the lovely Carolina parakeet. Emerald green with a golden head, it was arguably the most striking and beautiful bird ever to live in North America. Parrots don't usually venture so far north, as you may have noticed, and at its peak it existed in vast numbers, exceeded only by the passenger pigeon. But the Carolina parakeet was also considered a pest by farmers, and easily hunted because it flocked tightly and had a peculiar habit of flying up at the sound of gunfire, as you would expect, but then returning almost at once to check on fallen comrades. In his classic American Ornithology, written in the early 19th century, Charles Wilson Peel describes an occasion in which he repeatedly empties a shotgun into a tree in which they roost. At each successive discharge, though showers of them fell, yet the affection of the survivors seemed rather to increase. For after a few circuits around the place, they again alighted near me, looking down on their slaughtered companions with such manifest symptoms of sympathy and concern as entirely disarmed me. By the second decade of the twentieth century, the birds had been so relentlessly hunted that only a few remained alive in captivity. The last one, named Inca, died in Cincinnati Zoo in 1918, not quite four years after the last passenger pigeon died in the same zoo, and was reverently stuffed. And where would you go to see poor Inca now? Nobody knows. The zoo lost it. What is both most intriguing and puzzling about the story above is that Peel was a lover of birds, and yet did not hesitate to kill them in large numbers, for no better reason than that it interested him to do so. It is a truly astounding fact that for a very long time the people who were most intensely interested in the world's living things were the ones most likely to extinguish it. No one represented this position on a larger scale in every sense than Lionel Walter Rothschild, the second Baron Rothschild. Scion of the great banking family, Rothschild was a strange and reclusive fellow. He lived his entire life, from 1868 to 1937, in the nursery wing of his home at Tring in Buckinghamshire, using the furniture of his childhood, even sleeping in his childhood bed, though eventually he weighed 135 kilograms. His passion was natural history, and he became a devoted accumulator of objects. He sent hordes of trained men as many as four hundred at a time, to every quarter of the globe to clamber over mountains and hack their way through jungles in the pursuit of new specimens, particularly things that flew. These were crated or boxed up and sent back to Rothschild's estate at Tring, where he and a battalion of assistants exhaustively logged and analyzed everything that came before them, producing a constant stream of books, papers, and monographs, some twelve hundred in all. Altogether, Rothschild's Natural History Factory processed well over two million specimens and added 5,000 species of creature to the scientific archive. Remarkably, Rothschild's collecting efforts were neither the most extensive nor the most generously funded of the 19th century. That title almost certainly belongs to a slightly earlier but also very wealthy British collector named Hugh Cumming who became so preoccupied with accumulating objects that he built a large ocean-going ship and employed a crew to sail the world full-time, picking up whatever they could find, birds, plants, animals of all types, and especially shells. 
It was his unrivaled collection of barnacles that passed to Darwin and served as the basis for his seminal study. However, Rothschild was easily the most scientific collector of his age, though also the most regrettably lethal, for in the 1890s he became interested in Hawaii, perhaps the most temptingly vulnerable environment Earth has yet produced. Millions of years of isolation had allowed Hawaii to evolve 8,800 unique species of animals and plants. Of particular interest to Rothschild were the island's colorful and distinctive birds, often consisting of very small populations inhabiting extremely specific ranges. The tragedy for many Hawaiian birds was that they were not only distinctive, desirable, and rare, a dangerous combination in the best of circumstances, but also often heartbreakingly easy to take. The greater Koa Finch, an innocuous member of the honeycreeper family, lurked shyly in the canopies of Koa trees. But if someone imitated its song, it would abandon its cover at once and fly down in a show of welcome. The last of the species vanished in 1896, killed by Rothschild's ace collector Harry Palmer, five years after the disappearance of its cousin the lesser Koa Finch a bird so sublimely rare that only one has ever been seen, the one shot for Rothschild's collection. Altogether, during the decade or so of Rothschild's most intensive collecting, at least nine species of Hawaiian birds vanished, but it may have been more. Rothschild was by no means alone in his zeal to capture birds at more or less any cost. Others, in fact, were more ruthless, in 1907, when a well-known collector named Allenson Bryan realized that he had shot the last three specimens of black mammoths, a species of forest bird that had only been discovered the previous decade, he noted that the news filled him with joy. It was, in short, a difficult age to fathom, a time when almost any animal was persecuted if it was deemed the least bit intrusive. In 1890, New York State paid out over 100 bounties for eastern mountain lions, even though it was clear that the much-harassed creatures were on the brink of extermination. Right up until the 1940s, many states continued to pay bounties for almost any kind of predatory creature. West Virginia gave out an annual college scholarship to whoever brought in the greatest number of dead pests, and pests was liberally interpreted to mean almost anything that wasn't grown on farms or kept as pets. Perhaps nothing speaks more vividly for the strangeness of the times than the fate of the lovely little Bachman's warbler. A native of the southern United States, the warbler was famous for its unusually lovely song, but its population numbers, never robust, gradually dwindled, until by the 1930s the warbler vanished altogether and went unseen for many years. Then, in 1939, by happy coincidence, two separate birding enthusiasts in widely separated locations came across lone survivors just two days apart. They both shot the birds. The impulse to exterminate was by no means exclusively American. In Australia, bounties were paid on the Tasmanian tiger, properly the thylacine, a dog-like creature with distinctive tiger stripes across its back, until shortly before the last one died, forlorn and nameless, in a private Hobart Zoo in 1936. Go to the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery today and ask to see the last of this species, the only large carnivorous marsupial to live into modern times, and all they can show you are photographs and 61 seconds of old film footage. Upon its death... The last surviving thylacine was thrown out with a weekly trash. I mention all this to make the point that if you were designing an organism to look after life in our lonely cosmos, to monitor where it is going and keep a record of where it has been, you wouldn't choose human beings for the job. But here's an extremely salient point. We have been chosen by fate or providence or whatever you wish to call it. As far as we can tell, we are the best there is. We may be all there is. It's an unnerving thought that we may be the living universe's supreme achievement and its worst nightmare simultaneously. Because we are so remarkably careless about looking after things, both when they are alive and when they are not, we have no idea, really none at all, 
about how many things have died off permanently, or may do so soon, or may never, and what role we have played in any part of the process. In 1979, in his book, The Sinking Ark, Norman Myers suggested that human activities were causing about two extinctions a week on the planet. By the early 1990s, he had raised the figure to some 600 per week. That's extinctions of all types, plants, insects, and so on, as well as animals. Others have put the figure even higher, to well over a thousand a week. A United Nations report of 1995, on the other hand, put the total number of known extinctions in the last 400 years at slightly under 500 for animals and slightly over 650 for plants, while allowing that this was almost certainly an underestimate, particularly with regard to tropical species. A few interpreters think most extinction figures are grossly inflated. The fact is we don't know, don't have any idea. We don't know when we started doing many of the things we've done. We don't know what we are doing right now or how our present actions will affect the future. What we do know is that there is only one planet to do it on and only one species of being capable of making a considered difference. Edward O. Wilson expressed it with unimprovable brevity in the diversity of life. One planet, one experiment. If this book has a lesson... It is that we are awfully lucky to be here, and by we, I mean every living thing. To attain any kind of life at all in this universe of ours appears to be quite an achievement. As humans, we are doubly lucky, of course. We enjoy not only the privilege of existence, but also the singular ability to appreciate it, and even, in a multitude of ways, to make it better. It is a trick we have only just begun to grasp. We have arrived at this position of eminence in a stunningly short time. Behaviorally, modern humans have been around for no more than about 0.0001% of Earth's history, almost nothing really. But even existing for that little while has required a nearly endless string of good fortune. We really are at the beginning of it all. The trick, of course, is to make sure we never find the end, and that, almost certainly, will require a lot more than lucky breaks.